Hiaka territory is a lush land and the largest in the empire, hiding limitless potential and being a valuable asset that is difficult to refuse, especially for a deposed prince consort. With an uncertain future ahead, but for 15 years, she has thrived on the land called Opportunity. This girl has lived carelessly, drowning in alcohol and tears for a long time. There were times she felt desperate, she clasped her hands and prayed, Father. Let me go back to the past. My little apple pie, I will turn you into the noblest woman of this kingdom. Please, please give me another chance. Yes, the little girl hugged her beloved father tightly, so what about me, father? Father? The girl suddenly froze as before her were the dried bones of a human. Father! Father! Stop! This memory, this face, her father faded away in her consciousness as she gradually woke up. Slowly opening her eyes and looking around, this is the residence of Count Lincoln. Then the body lying right before me, this is. It's true. It's my father, who passed away 15 years ago. I really have gone back to the past. The girl pondered dreamily about the things in front of her, as if they were all true. Lost in thought, the voice of the man behind her resounded, Finally, you have regained consciousness, Rennie. You cried like a madman and even bit someone. Consort, why would you let others see you like that? Rennie Lincoln's teary eyes revealed anger. Indeed, he was Prince Michael Alish, the one who caused her such extreme misery. Many years ago, Count Lincoln, Rennie Lincoln's father, gave his daughter a gift. It was the highest position in the empire, Alan. So at the age of 12, Rennie Lincoln was engaged to the prince and was given a new title, the prince consort or wife of Michael Alish. However, any political marriage like theirs had no affection between her and the prince. Jelly Sinia Canaria, the princess held hostage from the Canaria kingdom, enchanted the prince and made him brutally impose an unreasonable tyranny. Prince, please stop importing salt from the Sarawak Desert and buy salt from our kingdom instead. She said bold words indeed, if done so, there will be riots in Sarawak. But because she has asked for it, then so be it, the prince replied gently. Some time later, indeed, there were riots in Sarawak due to dissatisfaction with recent monopoly agreements. Yet Michael just responded indifferently, so what? He was extremely shocked by the attitude of the ruler towards the future of the kingdom, that, this is the king's order, requiring the prince to directly resolve this issue. Michael coldly replied, if you want to solve such a matter, isn't it better to use an experienced general to quell the riots instead of me? Call Count Link, have him lead the troops instead. The old retired father accepted the command to go to war. However, he had a condition that the prince must rearrange his relationship with Canaria and focus entirely on the current consort. The father, for the sake of his daughter's position and his own honor, went to battle and perished far away on the battlefield. Exactly, Rennie. I must make it official. Michael bowed deeply, each word resounding with authority, I hope you will cancel the marriage. Drops of her bitter tears silently fell as she listened to the treacherous words. Your Highness, is that what you should say in front of my father's coffin? Michael only revealed a wicked smile. Fifteen years ago, Rennie Lincoln was still a pure and righteous girl. She only dared to whisper her grievances to him timidly. This time, reborn, she mocked herself, why would you say such words in front of the corpse of the deceased instead of him? This time, also in this same place, Rennie Lincoln screamed in disgust, he died because of the order issued by you, and now you dare to say such words in front of him? Michael simply responded indifferently, of course, Rennie, I will compensate for your father's death. His loyalty and dedication deserve reward. He smirked disdainfully, let's see, I am also considering giving you a stipend, a million Allen, and the Hialka territory, is that enough? Rennie Lincoln sneered silently, it's Hialka territory again. Just like 15 years ago, but this time I won't yield to your family, you wretch. Rennie Lincoln shouted fiercely, no. Blood debt must be paid with blood. Michael was surprised to see the once weak girl suddenly become furious. 
She was screaming in anger, bring out the life of Princess Canaria. My father died because of the princess's request, so at least her wrist should be cut so that I can relieve this anger. Michael yelled loudly, what? This heartless monster. Rennie Lincoln shouted loudly and rushed towards him with a crazy look. If you don't like it, then give me your neck, Michael Allen. I have to cut it up for the dogs to eat. Only then can I relieve this hatred. You despicable beast. Michael angrily shouted, Rennie Lincoln, you insolent brat. With that, he slapped her hard, causing her to stagger and fall backwards. He continued to curse, every time you open your mouth, it's nonsense. I thought you only lost your father, but it seems you've lost your mind too. With that, he left hastily and didn't forget to mention the request to annul the marriage. While the prince was distracted, Rennie Lincoln grabbed her father's sword, then rushed straight towards him, silently praying, Father, please give me a chance to tear Michael Allen's body apart. In a moment, Michael faced Rennie Lincoln's gaze filled with hatred, staring at him like an enemy, along with the piercing pain that shot through his head, he screamed in extreme agony. The Lincoln family sword reflected his terrified face and the fresh, pungent smell of the villain's blood. He cried out for help, royal guards. Quickly, seize that thing. She dares to stab me, Rennie. Rennie Lincoln was still in a furious rage, shouting loudly, Don't you dare call my name. She drew her sword and screamed madly, That is the precious name my father bestowed upon me. Swish. The sword pierced flesh, then there was silence. Just like that, Rennie Lincoln found herself back in the past, on the exact day 15 years ago, when she was abandoned by her fiancé. Two months later, at the royal palace. Rennie Delphin Lincoln, you are stripped of your title as prince consort for the attempted murder of the prince. The king's authoritative voice rang in Rennie's ears, making her realize that this was reality, not a dream. She had truly returned to the past. Instead of receiving money and the prosperous Hialka territory, she knelt here as a criminal, stripped of all rights of the Link family, including the territory and assets, all seized by the wretched Michael. Yet in this second life, Rennie Lincoln had shattered one of that wretch's legs. What a worthwhile exchange. Thinking of this, she laughed maniacally. Michael, upon seeing her demeanor, was enraged. He shouted angrily, Rennie Lincoln! Your arrogant family member is a criminal. Father! Do something about this madwoman! The king furred his brows and whispered harshly to him, Shut your mouth, you fool! Because of what your family and the little Canaria girl have done, the royal family's reputation has plummeted. Furthermore, the whole country mourns the death of Count Link, yet you still want to declare an annulment? Be thankful you're still a prince. Turning back to Rennie, the old king declared, The only remaining property of Rinlin Lincoln is the land to which you will be exiled Laden territory of the Rennie family. She smirked contemptuously, Laden was her mother's territory. Unlike Hialka, it snowed six months out of the year, a barren and impoverished land. In truth, they wanted her to freeze to death on her way there. Rennie Lincoln silently thought, fine, so be it. In the place where you exile me, I will continue to survive and curse you, Alan. In the blinding snowstorm, Rennie shivered from the cold and endured the hollow words of the supervisor accompanying her convoy. He had climbed this dangerous snowy mountain with her for a whole month to reach Laden. Despite the remote journey, he readily agreed to follow along. Ah, so it was also a plot, she realized, unsurprised. Wait a moment. I need additional funds to return, don't I? Bring out everything you have, especially the sword at your waist, he began to demand. Rennie Lincoln firmly grasped the sword in her hand and declared, This is the sword of the Link family. If your household dares to covet it, beware that even a slight touch could cost you your head. Well then, perhaps the head of a deposed prince consort will fall first, won't it? With his words, a sharp blade pressed against Rennie's neck. She had to grit her teeth and relent, survival is the number one priority now. How could I discard the life my father helped me obtain once again? 
Agreed, she said coldly, with irritation evident in her voice, here, take all my personal belongings and leave. The guard still wouldn't let go. Hold on, I told you to bring out everything you have. Saying this, he used his dirty hands to restrain her. Rennie Lincoln angrily jerked her hand away, I've given you everything, what more do you want? But he smirked deviously, saying, no, there's still one thing left. You look very valuable. If I don't get to taste you, I'll regret it. Pfft. A spit landed on the ruffian's face. Rennie Lincoln glared at him with disgust and retorted sharply, get lost. This only enraged him further, he gnashed his teeth in humiliation. Then, he delivered a painful punch to Rennie Lincoln, accompanied by curses. Rennie Lincoln screamed in agony as she was thrown to the ground, and he pulled her hair violently. I was planning to taste the prince consort, but now that's you. Even if you whine, there's only so much I'll tolerate. Despite her fear, Rennie Lincoln shouted back, You will surely regret this. She tried to scream, not wanting to die, at least not here. Suddenly, something flew at them. The guard, lightning fast, became motionless, only managing to utter, ah, before collapsing forward, his head covered in blood. Rennie Lincoln couldn't help but be stunned by the scene. What happened? Why did he suddenly fall like that? Was he hit by something? He seems to be in pain. Wait, now's not the time to think about that. I can't miss this opportunity. Thinking this, she raised her sword and yelled, Die! The last escort also fell under the blade, ending his mission in this story deservedly. Rennie Lincoln gasped for breath, exclaiming internally, I did it! I did it! I'm still alive! She sheathed her sword and sat down heavily on the snowy ground, panting heavily. Before she could compose herself, Rennie Lincoln noticed something lying next to the fallen escort. Fruit? There's blood on it. Did he get hit by this thing? Russell! Before she could think further, she heard a strange noise nearby, as if something was hiding behind the bushes. She raised her sword, ready to fight. Whoever doesn't want to die, show yourself. But there was no response until the noise came again, surprising Rennie Lincoln immensely. Behind that bush was a rather peculiar-looking boy with a sallow face. He looked emaciated, as if starved for days, with disheveled hair and a vacant expression, resembling a specter. Rennie Lincoln looked at him curiously, wondering, how can a child be here? Could he be from the savage tribes living in the northern mountains, as my father used to tell? They must be using the child as bait to capture humans for food during winter. Do they think I'll be fooled? With these thoughts, she gripped her sword tightly and yelled, Stay away! If you dare to come closer, I'll strike. The boy hesitated for a moment at her threat, but instead of running away, he charged straight towards Rennie Lincoln. She shouted, I'm serious. Stay back. If you come any closer, I'll strike you. Ignoring her threats, the boy continued to approach. Although Rennie Lincoln didn't want to harm a child who had just saved her, her instincts took over, and her sword swung instinctively. Swoosh! Drops of blood splattered onto the white snow as the sword halted midair. Rennie Lincoln looked horrified as the boy caught the blade without flinching. Despite holding the sword with both hands, she began to tremble. The boy's incredible strength left her completely immobilized. Lowering the blade, the boy moved closer to her. He's coming closer like this. Rennie Lincoln trembled in fear. Since when had the boy tightly grasped her hand and seemed about to bite it? Rennie Lincoln could only grit her teeth, imagining her fate. This is not good. I'll be eaten by this brat. Suddenly, in the cold and silent space, a very faint noise echoed. Rin slowly opened her eyes to find herself safe. The boy was nibbling on her slender fingers like a small puppy. Although somewhat uncomfortable, it seemed the boy was caring for her wounds, even in places like between her fingers. 
Rennie Lincoln was surprised because she hadn't noticed those injuries on her hand before. Why did he lick his hand to heal the wounds, she pondered. Ren calmed down and hesitantly asked, was that you who threw? The boy quickly nodded. Oh, so the boy didn't mean to harm me, Rennie Lincoln said hesitantly and thanked him. The boy just stood there, staring at her blankly. He probably doesn't understand much, huh? Rennie Lincoln speculated about this wild child. Then she knelt down and slowly said, thank you for saving me. Suddenly, she noticed blood dripping from the boy's hand onto the snow. Rennie Lincoln felt guilty and hurried to find a way to treat his wounds. Under the freezing snow, Rennie Lincoln cursed the guard, as both the map and bandages were rendered unusable by his blood. Ha! This wretch dies, but still won't let go. The boy suddenly jumped up, shouting, Ah! You, you called. Rennie Lincoln turned back to see the boy trembling, as if wanting to say something. Does he want to ask who called me, or something similar? Rennie Lincoln remembered that she had just said ha earlier, perhaps the boy misunderstood it as his name. She reached out to touch the boy, who instinctively recoiled and trembled, pleading, ah. Seeing the boy so frightened, Rennie Lincoln gently reassured, I won't hurt you. He looked pitiful with that appearance, as if he had endured a childhood of mistreatment. Rennie Lincoln slowly extended her hand. At first, he was cautious, but then he realized her goodwill, so he stood still, waiting. Rennie Lincoln gently stroked his head with a friendly and gentle expression, saying, Thank you. While the boy was staring blankly at his bandaged hand, Rennie Lincoln picked up the map and intended to continue the journey before sunset. Muttering to herself, although the direction is unclear, Laden seems to be in this direction. The boy suddenly rushed out to block her path. No, no, not this way. Rennie Lincoln expressed her language differences. What? Then she remembered the savage tribe her father used to tell her about, who often used children as bait. This deduction sent a shiver down her spine, but she reassured herself, No, don't be afraid. This child is doing this for me, so let's try to trust him and listen to what he says. Rennie Lincoln lowered her head and asked, If it's not this way, then which way should we go? The boy continued to mutter, No, not this way, and pointed in another direction before darting off, No, this way. Rennie Lincoln hurriedly called out, Let's go together. I can't run as fast as you. Thus, two more hours passed, and the sky began to darken. Rennie Lincoln scanned the distance, and there it was, a castle. Finally, after many days of hardship, she had reached Laden. Looking back at the boy standing behind her, she remarked suspiciously, well, arriving faster than the map. How does he know the way? However, they still had quite a distance to go, and tonight they had to take temporary refuge in a cave, as the snowfall was getting heavier and it was not advisable to descend the mountain. While Rennie was discussing their plans for the next day, the boy sat in a corner, quietly recording all of her actions. His dark, intelligent eyes widened with excitement and curiosity. Rennie let out a relaxed sigh as she finally managed to start a fire. When she turned back and saw the innocent look on the child's face, she exclaimed, Wow, wow, wow. It turned out that this was the first time the boy had seen someone use a stone to make fire. Still a child, he held the stone as if it were a toy and played with it enthusiastically. Rennie looked at him with no less curiosity, truly fascinated by his reaction. Not at all, the boy replied. It seemed that he only knew how to say that one phrase. Rennie Lincoln asked him again to confirm his language abilities. Meanwhile, the boy continued to play with the stone and replied, not at all. Rennie thought to herself that she would have to teach him how to speak properly after bringing him to Laden. Looking at the dirty child in front of her, she couldn't help but wonder, where did this child come from and what has he been through? It seemed that the boy was not like someone from the cannibal tribe her father had mentioned. Finally, they arrived at Laden. Laden was a desolate territory, and under the harsh weather of winter, it looked even more bleak and pitiful. While standing guard at the gate, a soldier was startled by the commotion below. Oh, oh! 
The boy hesitated, seeming reluctant to enter the city. Meanwhile, Rennie Lincoln tried to calm him down. Stay calm, I don't know who you are, but you probably don't have anyone to look after you. Come with me. In Laden, the two of us will. But the boy didn't listen and tried to escape from her. Rennie Lincoln began to feel frustrated. Actually, this kid is too strong. I can't keep up with him. How can I calm him down? Suddenly, she noticed a man carrying a baguette outside the city gate, and her plan immediately came to mind. That's right, if it's food, maybe it will lure him. Thinking quickly, Rennie Lincoln hurried to the man, bought two baguettes, and after paying, she turned back to see how the boy was doing. Sure enough, she saw that he had stopped running, his innocent face truly captivated by the food. Rennie Lincoln mimicked eating the baguette and gestured, you eat it like this. Then she tossed the baguette in front of the boy. Smelling the irresistible aroma, in the midst of hunger and cold, his eyes sparkled like a puppy's as he eagerly devoured the warm food. Rennie Lincoln chuckled with satisfaction. That's right, well done. Have another one. Blushing with happiness, the boy held the remaining baguette and looked at the girl in front of him, her kind eyes and golden hair shining like the sun. How adorable, that's what a good boy looks like. It's called bread. Rennie Lincoln happily explained to her new friend. The boy had his head stroked by the girl, his cheeks reddening even more. Bread, he repeated the new word he had learned. That's right, bread. If you come with me to my village, I'll give you even more bread. So come with me, okay? The boy shyly nodded his head, then finally took the soft hand and walked through the city gate with her. Good job, good boy, although it's hard to believe, I am the lord of this place. Rennie Lincoln happily walked and told stories to the child who didn't understand all the languages she was using. At Laden's mansion, a woman named Sarah came out to welcome Rennie. She seemed to be the steward of this mansion and had taken over managing everything on behalf of the Lord. According to Sarah, the former Lord of Laden has not visited this land for twenty years. Rennie Lincoln could only sigh inwardly, this place is truly pitiful compared to the Hialka territory that she inherited from her past life. Laden only occupies one-tenth of the land area, and even this old and dilapidated mansion is nearly three hundred years old. Moreover, snowfall persists for up to six months in a year, making food scarce. There are barely over twenty soldiers capable of defending this vast territory. Rennie Lincoln grimaced bitterly, at least there won't be any wars between territories, because no one bothers to pay attention to this barren land. She couldn't believe that the land belonging to her mother's Peden clan could be in such a position. Sarah mentioned that the former lord, Rennie's cousin, was born and raised in the bustling city of Viken, so he managed everything through delegated authority. During his lifetime, he only visited Laden three times. Rennie Lincoln thought to herself, in other words, she's hinting that a stranger like me shouldn't meddle in their affairs. But I won't let that happen, especially when that wretch Michael is still alive, and I haven't had my revenge yet. Rennie Lincoln's tone turned threatening, a deposed crown prince expelled from the capital for treason, isn't it, woman? It must be hard for your family now, with such a woman becoming the lord, isn't it? Sarah, both frightened and uncomfortable, replied, I didn't mean that. Why not? From now on, assist me in becoming the true lord of this place. Sarah hesitantly promised, I'll help you in any way I can, ma'am. Rennie Lincoln pointed to the boy beside her, the first thing I want you to do is to investigate this child. He saved my life even though he looks like an orphan. But try to find out his background first. And for now, take him to bathe. Sarah obediently followed the Lord's orders. Later, a maid tried to take the boy for a bath, but he resisted and ran away, angering the maid who shouted, You little devil! Stop right there! Not gonna happen, the boy only knew how to say that and ran off. Rennie Lincoln found this somewhat amusing and said, Look at that boy. Then, turning to the chasing servants, she teased, Hey kid, wanna come over here? No, no. Not gonna happen.
Rennie Lincoln couldn't help but smirk at the sight of the struggling servants chasing after the boy. After a while, Sarah returned and informed the Lord about the child's background. Her face showed a hint of embarrassment. Actually, that boy is a Krona. Rennie Lincoln couldn't hide her shock. The boy is from the Krona lineage, a family that was massacred during the man raids. Krona? Could he be the crazy dog of Michael Alesh from the previous life? She shivered involuntarily at the mention of that name. Well, Krona, he suddenly appeared one day and became a war hero for Alan Kess. He was known to be a hybrid with the bloodline of the man raids. But I know the truth about his lineage. He is not a hybrid with the man raids, but the illegitimate child of the emperor. Seventeen years ago, when the emperor was inspecting the northern lands, he had an affair with the daughter of the Krona clan and had a child. When the empress learned of this, she was extremely jealous and furious, wanting the heir of the emperor to be only Prince Michael. So she ordered the complete destruction of the Krona clan in a sea of flames, exterminating every member without leaving anyone alive. The Krona clan was accused of treason and had to endure a brutal massacre. From children to pregnant women, even livestock were not spared. Everyone thought Wild Krona was dead. But when Michael Alish turned 34, which was 10 years after his divorce, Michael brought him back to the palace. He fought fiercely on the battlefield and always emerged victorious. Everyone often called him the Mad Dog because of his absolute loyalty and the vast territory he brought to his master. But all these achievements were overshadowed by Michael's heavy-handedness instead of praising him as a war hero. Ignorant people only knew it was Michael Alish accomplishment. And thus, Michael sat securely on the throne, receiving the love of all the people in this kingdom. Will Krona, a cursed name. I am confident that I can incite a rebellion. Remembering the previous life's memories when Hialka was preparing for war, Wild Krona had come to her as if he had been ready beforehand, even though Hialka had a well-trained army and vast wealth. Yet, against that man, Wild Krona, she still couldn't be confident when facing him. Back to reality, the boy was being groomed after his bath, his long hair being combed. Rennie Lincoln couldn't help but laugh at his adorable appearance. Look, you're even more handsome now. The servants behind were quite confused because the boy wouldn't let anyone touch him except Rennie. Looking at the innocent and innocent face sitting there, Rennie's hands unconsciously trembled. Well, Krona, a dark thought suddenly flashed through her mind. Now that you're done bathing, why don't we go to the dining room and enjoy some bread? The boy happily ran off upon hearing there was bread. Bread, bread. Rennie Lincoln closed the door and sank into thought. If that boy is truly Will Krona, then in this life, Wild Krona will be on my side. You will become my knight, grow up in my embrace, and do everything as I say. She said to him, Thank you, Will, um, no. I mean from now on your name will be Will Hump, Will Hump sounds good. His gentle demeanor made the boy blush. She stroked his head and silently thought about the treasure in her hands, Michael Alish definitely won't lay a hand on this child. In Will Hump's study, he felt very happy as the beautiful sister tied his hair. Even more surprising was that the child, emaciated from prolonged hunger, was only 16 years old. The long-term deprivation had made his body thin and small. He was even only a few years younger than Rennie Lincoln. Today is Thanksgiving, so Sarah took on the task of distributing food rations to the refugees. The winters in Leden are harsh, and without food supplies, the villagers would starve. Rennie Lincoln reviewed the available resources in the territory, salt, flour, dried beans. Oh, flour is so expensive. Oh right, corn can be grown here. Why don't we grind it into flour and distribute it to everyone? Sarah replied, that's a good idea, but we don't have enough manpower to do that. There are very few people living in this territory, so all resources are limited. Even counting all the able-bodied youths in Leden, there are not even 100 people. Even on Thanksgiving Day, instead of having a plump turkey like in the capital, the people of Leden only receive wild geese hunted by the guards. After the steward reported the situation and left, Rennie Lincoln felt extremely helpless. 
a impoverished territory to the point of misery. It's completely different from Hialka, where she owned 3,000 soldiers each year getting new swords and shields. But now, she sighed at the records, this year the guard captain was rewarded with a bag of dried apples. If this continues, how will revenge ever be achieved? Rennie Lincoln cursed, damn it. Wilde heard this and innocently responded, thinking she was calling his name. Rennie Lincoln quickly covered her mouth, sorry, well hump, I wasn't talking to you, I promise not to swear in front of you, but it just slipped out, I'm sorry. The boy blushed in response to her sincere words, even though he didn't fully understand all the words. Wild Hump nodded and said, It's okay. Your meaning is no need to apologize? I understand you. Okay, now I will check your homework, Reddy said. When she looked at the piece of paper with scribbled words, cornmeal, soldiers, turkey, she thought, Hmm, this kid is thinking about something else now. These aren't the things Sarah and I were talking about. Should I hire him as a secretary or in a similar position? Anyway, you did well. Will blushed again as his older sister stroked his head. A day as Lord and Laden is very difficult, having to manage food for the people and enduring their curious gazes, all because they heard rumors that she was crazy for losing her father and daring to draw a sword against the crown prince. Rennie Lincoln ignored the gossip, because those petty people who only believe in rumors are of no consequence. Thus, she had no choice but to homeschool Will Hump. One day, Will Hump knocked down a soldier while practicing swordsmanship. His physical strength was indeed extraordinary. Sensing something was wrong, he dropped his sword and rushed to hug her tightly in fear, No, no, it's not true. Rennie Lincoln patted his head reassuringly, well done. In her heart, she was quite conflicted. Teaching letters and words she could handle, but swordsmanship, she couldn't, as there was no teacher for the boy. If he were with Michael, it would be different, he would easily find a teacher for Wilde. But how would Michael handle it when he knew the child was the wild son of the emperor and raised him? Seeing the ring on the boy's finger, Rennie thought, a ring? Could it be a royal ring or something? Ha! Huh. What am I thinking? A mischievous spark flickered in Rennie's eyes before she stopped herself. Will suddenly showed her the paper he had written on, proudly displaying it. Ah! You finished writing? Good job, she praised, which left the boy dumbfounded. He replied, not really. Then he shyly sniffled, pushing back closer to her neck. Rennie couldn't understand his actions, what did you just do? But the boy blushed and ran off, leaving Rennie sitting alone in the room. She chuckled to herself, wow! That kid knows how to do those cute actions. The next morning, in the city of Laden, Rennie Lincoln was overjoyed because the territory would be welcoming a very important guest to her. A firm voice of a man echoed, your highness, may I humbly request an audience? The man with striking blue eyes, named Dimitri, a close friend of Rennie Lincoln, stood before her. Oh, it's wonderful to see you here, she exclaimed with great delight. Please forgive me for the delayed notice, as soon as I heard, I rushed here. Your Highness left the capital without an escort, but... Rennie Lincoln's eyes welled up with tears as she looked at her friend. Please don't say that. Your presence here brings me so much happiness. Dimitri smiled gently. As they reunited, Wilde, who stood nearby observing, felt a tinge of jealousy brewing inside. Dimitri was a childhood friend whom I spent a lot of time playing with when I was a little girl. He was one of my father's most skilled knights and also my first love, she recounted happily to Will. Later, when Will was led away, Dimitri wiped a tear from his eye and shared, I never thought the Northern Territories rumored to be so cold. When I crossed the last mountain, I feared your highness had been buried in the snow. He said to her. Rennie Lincoln responded cheerfully, that's not interesting at all. And as I've told you before, don't call me your highness anymore. Hmm, then what should I call you? You used to call me miss before I got married, right? Dimitri began to lighten up after seeing that she was safe. 
Now that you have your authority back, should I call you lady? Oh my, do as you please. Renny teased. Yes, my lady. I mean, miss. Dimitri corrected himself with a chuckle. Shortly after their reunion, Dimitri began inquiring about the situation in Leden. I can see Miss is doing a great job. I was a bit worried because this territory seems quite barren. Rennie Lincoln replied, yes, compared to my time managing Hialka. She caught herself mid-sentence, realizing she had almost mentioned her past life. Indeed, it's quite shocking here. I was used to living in luxury as the prince's consort, she added. What does Miss plan to do now? he asked. Rennie Lincoln hesitated at the question, then looked at Dimitri. Why are you so curious about this? she asked. The knight scratched his head awkwardly. Please forgive my question, it seems a bit forward. That's okay, just speak your mind, Rennie reassured him. Dimitri looked directly at her and said frankly, I suspect Miss still harbors feelings for the crown prince. The atmosphere suddenly fell silent. If Dimitri had come just a year later, I would have assumed he came to inquire about his health, but he arrived at this castle only a few months after I was deposed. That means he sought me out shortly after my arrival in Leden. The crown prince couldn't recover from the shock of being injured, so all the nobles in the kingdom must be cautious in their dealings with the emperor. Yet, despite all that, he still came here at this sensitive time. So, Dimitri, were you kicked out of your family? Or did you leave them to come here? Rennie asked straightforwardly, causing Dimitri to stutter a bit. Well, if you want to know, perhaps another time, he replied. Surely, your older brother kicked you out after you said you would leave the family, right? The perceptive young woman continued, making the young man uncomfortable. You're correct, Mississippi Michael Alish couldn't contain his excitement when he took over the Lincoln estate. When Miss became a prisoner, he attempted to seize the wealth of the Lincoln household. He not only sought to expand control over the territory, but also the soldiers. Wasn't the strength of the Lincoln family mainly from the military? I couldn't stand seeing that ruthless scoundrel controlling the Lincoln troops. So, at this point, Dimitri blushed. Rennie laughed heartily, ha ha. The former lord wants to make me laugh with all the things he's done. Despite her teasing, Rennie was truly happy that Dimitri wanted to demonstrate his loyalty to her. However, considering that he came here for her without any hesitation, she found it difficult to see such talent wasted in this desolate land. She felt sorry for that. Nevertheless, Dimitri remained confident that he could accomplish something. I've seen the roster before coming to Leden. This territory doesn't even have 50 guards, he said. Rennie corrected him, saying it's not even 30 yet. Dimitri grimaced, are you kidding me? Well, it's the truth. You'll have to accept it. Oh, the hardship, he exclaimed in frustration, which made Rennie a bit concerned. Could Dimitri be buried in this desolate land? Suddenly, she remembered when defeating the knight on that day. Wait! Isn't that boy in need of swordsmanship lessons? She quickly changed the subject. Instead of leading rebels, how about becoming a swordsmanship teacher? Dimitri was surprised. Excuse me, Mississippi. Did you just suggest that I teach swordsmanship to children? Almost. Didn't you see the boy sitting here earlier? He's in the dining hall now. Dimitri agreed, I guess I'll have to charge more than just a bag of flour for tutoring now. Rennie teased, how about a bag of flour and a side of goose meat for dinner tonight? You're not planning to reward me with that, are you? Dimitri, accustomed to luxurious living in the capital, showed his reluctance. You can endure hunger if you don't want to accept it. I don't have luxurious meals for an uninvited guest, Rennie retorted. Their intimate conversation warmed up the cold atmosphere of this northern mountainous region. The sunset began to cast its glow over the city of Leden. The boy was about to eat when he saw two people entering the dining hall looking for him. 
Will Humpton, greetings, Rennie Lincoln and Dimitrik approached him arm in arm, and she cheerfully introduced him to the boy, this is Dimitri. The guardsman glanced at Will with a serious expression, making the boy a bit wary. Rennie ordered Dimitri, the boy saved my life. Treat him kindly and be friendly. Sit next to him. He approached Will again and greeted him warmly, contrasting his previous demeanor. The boy immediately slammed the table and stood up, then stormed out of the room angrily, shooting a fierce glance at the unfamiliar young man before leaving. Both Dimitrik and Rennie were not pleased with his behavior. However, she still tried to be as gentle as possible. Will Humpton, you must eat. Come here and join me, she said. But it seemed that this coaxing method didn't work with the boy. Dimitri was quite annoyed. Let me go after him, the high-ranking knight whispered, but she stopped him, no, Will Humpton is a child who has been mistreated. He will be afraid of unfamiliar adults, let me try this. Dimitri was dumbfounded to see the lady he had known for many years playing such a prank, what are you doing? Renny was playing with her food, teasingly tempting him like one would tease a hungry animal. MMM, delicious. Absolutely delightful. She didn't forget to review the food in front of him as a lure. Each juicy piece of meat melted in her mouth, the seasoning just right on her tongue, it was so wonderful. Dimitri was getting exasperated, whispering continuously, what are you doing? Believe me, this is a way to get the attention of a hungry child, she said confidently. It seemed she was wrong, even with this trick, Wilde still stayed behind the door, glaring at the unfamiliar man who was monopolizing his companion. Dimitri was quite amused by the lady's funny behavior, still not enough? Anyone who sees his current expression would think you're raising a child. Well, I'll help you get his attention. With that, Dimitri poured milk sauce over his steak like Rennie was doing. But as soon as he turned back, he saw the boy leaving as fast as the wind. They had to continue their dinner without him. A few days later, Rennie Lincoln appeared very annoyed, looking at Wilde, you haven't left your room for four days now. You've been fasting since then. Is something wrong? The boy just groaned, no. She lost her patience, nothing? Come out now, or else. Then she suddenly turned to Dimitri, how should we intimidate children of this age? How old is he? Sixteen? That's crazy. How could that be possible? Dimitri started to get annoyed. Rennie immediately reprimanded him, did you just curse his master? He had to kneel down and apologize, no, no, I was just surprised that this boy is only sixteen. Hmm, I thought so. He's too childish and skinny. Dimitri began to provoke, what? Kids who are sixteen are immature everywhere. There's no shortage of soldiers who look like miserable horses just because they don't eat much. A teenager who acts like a child will look smaller than a newborn foal. I have no words when I see this boy who is only 16. Will remained calm under the blanket, listening to all the derogatory remarks the stranger made about him. When I was 16, I followed Duke Lincoln to the battlefield and took care of him, Dimitri sighed. Rennie Lincoln, upon hearing this, suddenly remembered the past, yes, you used to be his squire. Dimitri sighed, yes, all thanks to Miss Rennie's pampering and protection of the boy. It seems like you intended to coddle him like a child forever. She replied weakly, no, it's not like that. All right, leave it to me, Dimitri said, reaching under the blanket and grabbing Wilde's leg, causing him to startle. He lifted the boy as if he were lifting a small cat and said sternly, Will Humpton is the name given to you by the Lord. You will never be worthy of that name if you behave like this. With that, he pushed Wilde back to his original place. Rennie appeared concerned about his violence, but Dimitri continued his attack. You're 16, aren't you? He smirked. When I was 18, I proposed to Rennie. As soon as he finished speaking, Rennie grabbed his hair and pulled it all out. Are you crazy? Why would you say such things in front of a child? He shrugged indifferently. That's the truth. 
As they teased each other, they suddenly felt a heavy atmosphere behind them. Will was sitting upright on the bed, wow, look at what you've done. You're very smart indeed. It doesn't matter how childish you look, a 16-year-old can be very arrogant. When you're 18, you'll still be sneaking around to watch Renny like that, won't you? The boy seemed a bit shaken, no, I won't. Dimitri chuckled, look at your eyes, show some respect, and go to class. In Renny's thoughts about Dimitri, he was a very caring and gentle young man, always so with her. Once she climbed a tree and accidentally slipped. Dimitri quickly rushed over and caught her. That moment Renny would never forget. The young man was always concerned for her, overlooking all her foolish actions with a smile. Clearly, those memories and emotions were real. But now, Dimitri, what are you doing? Renny exclaimed. Don't interfere with us, men have their own way of talking, Dimitri insisted firmly, showing his masculinity. Are you taking the boy away like this? Renny worriedly protested. Dimitri responded coldly, I'll let him go and return. Uh. Renny hesitated, looking at the boy struggling to break free from Dimitri. Although reluctant, she had to accept, Will Humpton, I'm sorry, but Dimitri will definitely become a good teacher for you. Listen to him and treat him with respect. With that, she gently kissed Will's forehead as if to encourage him. Will suddenly became dizzy, no longer stubborn, but obedient like a puppy. Dimitri teased, oh, that's too much, huh? What about the reward for the teacher? You've always been amazing, Rennie said teasingly, but with a grateful expression towards her friend. Although it's a bit disappointing, those compliments aren't so bad. With that, he took Rennie's hand and placed a kiss on it. I will fulfill my duty, my lord, he said. Seeing these actions, Will couldn't hide his jealousy. It seemed that Dimitri easily understood the thoughts of the boy, as he laughed, leaving her slightly puzzled. What's so funny? Why are you laughing? Dimitri asked as he carried the boy away. Nothing, I'm leaving, he replied. Under the cold snowy sky, Wild had to endure intense swordsmanship classes. His new teacher was extremely strict, not tolerating unruly children. The Lord may be lenient with you, but I am not. Do you know why I always stay by Rennie Lincoln's side? It's not to tolerate brats like you. Dimitri said sternly. The boy didn't feel scared, but instead looked directly at Dimitri, listening intently. I heard you saved the Lord's life on the way to Leden. How could a brat like you have the honor of saving the Lord's life? I will make you worthy of that honor. Because that's what he wants. Get up and move if you understand my words. As soon as he finished speaking, a wooden sword was in the boy's hand. Wilde gritted his teeth, gripping the sword tightly, and quickly took a fighting stance. Seeing the boy so determined, Dimitri felt satisfied. He thought to himself, leaving the empire to convince Rennie to come to this cold land was worth it. Anyway, the day we left the empire is long gone. Just a few weeks after arriving in Leden, the people here admired the strong and brave knight named Dimitri. It seemed that he was very friendly and well-liked by the people here. Rennie felt happy about this, but she also felt a little sad because the Lord had been in Leden for two months and was still being shunned by everyone. Rennie, Will's call from behind echoed as she turned around. There stood Wild, appearing tidier and more polished, with his hair cut short and a slightly bashful expression on his face. Rennie Lincoln chuckled, Oh my, Will Humpton, what happened to your hair? Did Mystery cut it for you? Looks like you've been nibbled by mice. Rennie's teasing expression made Will Hump blush in embarrassment. Rennie gently motioned for the boy to sit down and said, Come here, let me trim your hair for you. When Dmistry criticized Will for being 16 and still not knowing how to speak or wield a sword, he felt the need to correct and groom such a young boy carefully. She thought Dmistry just wanted an excuse to bully the kid, but now the boy's demeanor had improved significantly, and he could speak more. Rennie Lincoln felt everything had gotten much better. 
Kid, you're not weird, on the contrary, you're cute. Cute? Rennie Lincoln gently reminded, just a little trim will make you even cuter. Come on, be good and sit still. The blushing boy nodded and obeyed. Locks of hair fell slowly. Rennie seemed to be doing this job quite well, even though it was her first time cutting someone else's hair. Yet she was still confident that she was better than Dmistry. Ha ha! Dmistry, seeing the boy in this state, banged the table and laughed loudly, what's this? Just returned from military service, huh? The boy blushed and replied, no, not at all. Not at all? You've been beaten like that and still can't fix your way of speaking, he grumbled at will. Rennie Lincoln blushed in anger at the comments on her first hairdressing work. Looks weird, huh? She tried to stop him from teasing the boy. Dmistry said, I got it, and playfully slapped his forehead, Wild Humpton, it's a pleasure to meet your swollen forehead, kiddo. Will Hump pushed him aside in frustration. She kept reminding, I told you not to tease Will anymore. After a few minutes, the meal was served. The menu consisted of boiled potatoes and oatmeal porridge with corn, sounding quite dreadful in this freezing cold. Though Dmistry had anticipated this, he couldn't help but express his surprise, quite a diet there. Rennie Lincoln replied, that's already luxurious for this winter. Even the kid sitting next to you never complains about the meal. I didn't mean it that way, he pulled a hump closer and argued, if you want this kid to grow up fast and handsome like me, he needs to eat more meat. Rennie frowned, pondering. He was right, but what could she do? Suddenly, an idea flashed in her mind, ah. That's right, if I give all the amount of meat I've saved, maybe. Dimitri exclaimed, are you kidding me? If this were in the capital, you'd be better than for six months. But here, with the weather so cold, Will nodded in agreement with him. Rennie persisted stubbornly, but I don't feel cold. Dimitri raised a finger to silence her, try taking off your cloak and then talk. Don't quack like a duck. Will was somewhat stunned by his actions, then he made a stubborn face until he returned to his original position. And I'm thinking of going hunting in winter. It seemed that the women had said too much before hearing all the necessary things. Hunting? Yes, with this boy here. Will was startled by Dimitri's suggestion. Rennie objected in a raised voice, how can such a little boy go hunting? After hearing these words, Will felt melancholic. Hey little one, are you really that small? Wilde shook his head in confusion at the teasing, which made Dimitri laugh heartily. You look so sad, how can you be? He also said he's already grown up. She still worried like a mother always thinking her child is too small. Furthermore, right now, there aren't enough guards to protect the castle, but there's no other way. Rennie sighed, please don't let the elk trample you to death. At the well of the mansion, Will was staring blankly at the strange object called a toothbrush in his hand. The reason he had to use this cumbersome thing was that Dimitri had threatened that if Will didn't brush his teeth, he'd be the first on the list for the elk hunting tomorrow. Lost in thought, Will heard Rennie calling. She recounted how she used to hate brushing her teeth too. But because her father said that if her teeth were clean, even if the prince came to propose, he'd run away. At this point, she felt a little sad, suddenly thinking, I never thought I'd one day hit the prince's foot. Wilde softly asked if Rennie didn't like it either. Of course. I hate men who don't brush their teeth. Rennie replied sharply. Upon hearing this, Will immediately began vigorously brushing his teeth. She looked at the boy and thought to herself, Dimitri says I treat a 16-year-old boy like a 6-year-old child. But he's so cute like this, how can I treat him like an adult? Seeing that Will had finished brushing his teeth, Rennie approached to inspect. Her fingers glided over his white, baby teeth, making Wilde feel embarrassed and shy. Well done, all clean now, she praised gently, patting his head. You did well. That night, Rennie let him stay in her room and told him fairy tales about the elk, 
Hanzi, the goddess of vengeance who hated the elk, and Altia, the goddess of peace and prosperity. Altia would lull Hanzi to sleep on the elk's back, traveling the world to share peace and prosperity. If the winter suddenly became warm, people would say that Altia had put Hanzi to sleep. But after those warm days, there would inevitably be huge snowstorms due to Hanzi's anger. Dimitri interrupted, that's not something to tell children. It's too noisy, I only know this story, Renny snapped. Will chimed in, yes, yes. If Hanzi sleeps, the weather becomes mild, so Altia has to lull her to sleep on the elk's back and wander the world for 21 nights, sharing peace and warmth. If you think about it, without Hanzi, there wouldn't be spring. What's wrong with that? If Hanzi could give birth, what did she and Altia do while sleeping together for 21 nights? Dimitri asked, provokingly. Rennie's face suddenly turned red, she quickly covered Wilde's ears with her hand, and Dimitri mocked, too late. Rennie shouted loudly, but only heard Dimitri's laughter echoing throughout the mansion. Late one evening many years ago, when Dimitri was just a six-year-old boy, Lord Lincoln had adopted a four-year-old girl with eyes and hair as golden as the sun. Since then, she had been the little lady whom the boy always protected. Despite being the second son of a divine lord in the wealthy count's castle, Dimitri was always treated equally with his younger sister. At that time, the count used to tell fairy tales to both Dimitri and his sister before bedtime. Dimitri was not only Rennie's playmate but also a source of support for the faction of the little lady while living in the count's family. Rennie's current actions were exactly like those of the count, from embracing, holding hands, kissing the boy's forehead, to telling him fairy tales. All these actions came from the count. He involuntarily spoke slowly, I just want to ask one thing, little lady. Do you remember your father through that kid? Rennie replied sadly, our father has passed away. Dimitri spoke softly, no, little lady, if you can forget, then do so. If you can forget by loving that child, then do it. Rennie Lincoln became stunned. She admitted, well Krona is really good. When a child becomes better after following me, behaving as if I had forgotten my father is the truth. But I can't forget the reason I accepted Will Krona. Her trembling hands clutched the corner of her dress. If I could forget by stabbing that wretch's foot, then I would have done it long ago. After hearing her sincere story, Will fell into a deep sleep on her warm thigh. Dimitri got angry and approached to wake the boy. Hey, wake up, little one. You have to go back to your own room and sleep. The boy was still in a drowsy state, mumbling, DMI, stray. Dimitri crossed his arms and grumpily exclaimed, Heavens, you've said it wrong again. When will you learn to pronounce the heavy syllables properly? Rennie gently stroked the boy's head. All right, well Humpton, if your hunt goes well, I'll allow you to call me Rennie. It'll be easier to pronounce. Well Humpton didn't say much, just blushed and nodded in agreement. The next day, Dimitri and Wilde, along with six members of the guard team, carried out their mission. Within just a week, they caught a giant elk, and it was said to be due to a less skill. That winter saw two major snowstorms. Except for a few dozen who got lost and froze to death, Laden territory remained peaceful. Two months later, at the Laden mansion, Rennie Lincoln was quietly contemplating the future of this land. Despite enduring a harsh winter, Laden was still impoverished and lacking in everything, especially money. In her past life's contract, after three more years, there would be a massive fire in the northeastern region, so extensive that it would take a year to completely extinguish the flames, nearly wiping out the entire area. This region, already cold and dry, posed a high risk of forest fires. But what made the situation particularly ominous was the peat. It crystallized from the old leaves mixed with the layer of mud underneath, floating on the marsh and solidifying into easily flammable coal. No one knew that buried peat in the marsh could cause the fire to spread so extensively. Rennie Lincoln reminded herself that she must prevent the forest fire from happening. If they could sell the peat, it would provide a substantial source of income. However, the marshland didn't belong to their territory. 
how to obtain the right to exploit Slaylen Marsh, became her pondering. As she was lost in thought, she suddenly heard the voice of the boy calling her, Rennie. When she turned around, she saw a radiant young man looking at her with confident eyes. It's been a while since we met, Wild Humpton. What's the matter? Wild seemed awkward as he conversed with her. Dimitri arrived at the horse stable. He's saying there's something he wants. Wild, she interrupted, causing the boy to blush slightly, and she reminded him, when speaking to someone, you need to stand close and look into their eyes, okay? The boy hesitantly responded, yes. Rennie thought to herself that it had been two seasons already, and yet, the boy still lacked communication skills. Clearly, he needed more coaching. She continued to advise, and also, you must use formal language with Dimitri. Will Humpton reluctantly turned his face away, seemingly discontent. Here we go again, she gently tapped his cheek with her finger, speaking softly, Dimitri is your teacher. With that, she remembered that it had been a long time since she had met the boy alone. Dimitri had always been with him throughout the winter. He said that Will Humpton had to pay for the elk he had eaten, so he couldn't leave the training camp. Occasionally, on very cold days, I called the boy into my warmest room in the castle, but Dimitri was not pleased with this. He argued that it wasn't appropriate for a former princess to bring a boy into her room, fearing that malicious rumors might spread. I think he's right. However, it seems that he's particularly strict with Will Humpton. After a moment of contemplation, Rennie Lincoln came up with a plausible hypothesis. Could it be because he resembles a younger brother? After all, Dimitri only has one older brother. But regardless, the boy is growing up so fast, the scars on his chin and neck have disappeared. How did Dimitri mold him into who he is now? It's good, I also like those broad, sturdy shoulders. And, of course, that beautiful face. Rennie Lincoln reached out and lightly touched the boy's face. Now, he had grown significantly taller, and he blushed slightly at her intimate gesture. In her previous life, Rennie Lincoln had only met Wild Crona once, when she advised him to tear apart Michael for his own benefit. In a fleeting moment, she noticed the scar above his eyebrow. In the second life, the scar was in the same position. Rennie Lincoln grew more convinced of his identity. This child cannot be anyone else but Wild Crona. Her recent touch had left Will Humpton extremely embarrassed. Oh, I'm sorry for standing so close. It's okay. Will Humpton continued, blushing, we're close like this, it's fine. This action reminded her of a previous incident when Dimitri complained about the boy's behavior. She had told him that being intimate with him wasn't appropriate, and Dimitri shouldn't do it. Thinking about this, Rennie Lincoln chuckled softly, that's right, what's wrong with it? She patted Will Humpton's bottom playfully, like comforting a child. The boy immediately jumped and blushed. Hey, why are you getting so close? Wilde exclaimed. It's okay. He then took her hand, pulled her closer, and embraced Rennie Lincoln tightly. This sudden action made her blush with embarrassment. Oh my! Why did he have to do this, especially when I'm wearing this thin dress? I can feel everywhere he touches. His body is so warm, probably just returned from training at the training camp. It took a while before Will Humpton released her from the warm hug. He blushed and asked, was it okay? Rennie Lincoln smiled gently, of course. She continued to hold him close, if not you, then who else would I be close to here? At the horse stable, Dimitri had something important to discuss with the Lord. Rennie, the conscription order has been issued from the capital. What? Why here? Rennie was startled. Yes, he looked worried, I don't know why it's come here either. I guess they must hate me, she guessed, impatient, tell me quickly. Dimitri sighed, they probably hate me too. A total of 30 soldiers have been conscripted. 30? Rennie couldn't believe her ears. Didn't that number represent all the soldiers in Leden? 
Dimitri added, out of those thirty, I'm the only official knight. If all the soldiers are handed over to the conscription order, Laden will have no defenders, and it will be a serious offense if we don't provide enough troops to the emperor. What would Rennie do to save Laden and her friends now? If you enjoyed the story, please like and subscribe to the channel to follow the next developments in this series. In every winter, the starving and thirsty barbarian tribe from the northern mountains will overflow into the empire. Therefore, the kingdom of Allen will issue a decree summoning soldiers to send to each region's lords. At this time, the lords will have two options, send soldiers or send money. Most of them choose to send money because it is more convenient and less costly. However, for this impoverished and desolate land of Laden, neither option is available. Lord Rennie is troubled by this. Nevertheless, she tries to find a way to muster enough soldiers to send to the royal court. Rennie calculates that currently, there are ten people from Laden officially enlisted. Therefore, they need to mobilize three times that number, not to mention in spring, the newly born hunting beasts will aggressively attack the villages. Thus, they need enough soldiers to protect the fortress. But if they obey the imperial edict, there won't be enough people left to defend Laden. Suddenly, she looks up and asks Mystery, Does the Empire know about you being here? Of course. Everyone in the Empire knows about that, he replies. She thinks, Dmistri has been to the battlefield with his father many times. He's one of the most outstanding knights in the kingdom. Perhaps Michael has spread the rumor that Dmistri is in Laden. He wants to see his face when he dies on the road. Thinking this, Rennie angrily curses that vile prince, I wonder if we can ask for help from the nearby camps? If we can get some help with the number of soldiers. But Dmistri interrupts, we can't, because the neighboring territories are all in trouble with the royal family because of us. Rennie, frustrated, asks, what do you mean? Our neighbors, the Nadatan territory, only sent half the number of soldiers and two knights, but there were only exactly two knights there, and one of them is the second son of the lord. Moreover, their eldest son has died of illness. So if Laden asks them. After hearing this, Rennie explodes in anger, shouting, Ah! That wretched male! Does that scoundrel want to block all life from this land? Dmistry adds, My lord, sweet words can only go so far. But, I agree with that statement. He takes a breath and continues, It's not entirely hopeless. They could send knights from Laden to participate in the battle instead of Lord Nadenton's son. She asked, What do you mean? Aren't you the only official knight of Laden? Dmistry replied, I know, but I'm not a replacement. Then he turned back and looked down, What are you looking at? Rennie followed his gaze and saw Willem vigorously practicing swordsmanship in the training ground. Is that Willem? Don't tell me he's. Dmistry confirmed, yes, my lady, he has grown much older. She exclaimed, no, it can't be Willem, he's still. Dmistry cut in coldly, still what? My lady, I went to the battlefield with the Earl when I was sixteen. And someone with eyes like his isn't easy to kill, is he? The housekeeper, Sarah, nodded and recounted, a few days ago, that boy broke the guard sword. He's growing so fast that I've had to mend his clothes three times already. Dmistry continued to persuade her, you've heard it, Lady Rennie. If all Laden's soldiers are summoned, there will be riots. Appoint the child as a knight and send him to Nay Denton as a hired knight. Rennie hesitated before this decision, a silent gap stretched between them. Seeing this, Dmistry reassured her, I know you care a lot about him, but don't hold anything other than a sword in his hand until the vengeance is over. In this backward territory, don't let the child ruin your plans. As Rennie remained silent, he thought to himself, you're still too soft-hearted. I couldn't believe my ears when I heard the rumor that you stabbed the prince's foot and were imprisoned. My daughter, who bears the name Rennie, the official heir of the Lincoln family, isn't someone who can do such things. The Earl has bestowed upon her the highest position of any woman in this kingdom, so the people respect her. 
but perhaps, being overly protected, she wasn't taught how to become strong. Yet, that's the only way to protect Laden. Lost in thought, Mystery was taken aback when she asked, Willem will truly become a knight? Yes, ma'am, basically, he replied. She furrowed her brows, muttering, so exchanging 15 soldiers for him isn't enough money to hire a knight, but it's worth it, right? Mystery widened his eyes in disbelief at the change in the girl he once knew, furthermore, we're doing this to preserve the life of Lord Nadenton's second son. If we only exchange for a few soldiers, shouldn't we take another piece of land? Rennie's gaze turned sharp, like the Slayland marshes, for example? She thought to herself, the muddy bog buried with treasure in the Slayland marshes is very valuable for this exchange. Willem, oh no, win Krona, that's a worthy price for that title. The atmosphere once again became quiet, and Mystery chuckled, ha ha, indeed. He felt quite satisfied in his head, the Earl didn't bestow his title upon his daughter in vain. He knelt before her, obediently accepting the command, I understand, my lady. Everything will be as you wish. In a cave in Laden, today was the weekly deer hunting day. Willem eagerly asked Mystery about the fairy tale the lady had told him the previous night. Of course, Hani hates Altia because Sir Hani always interferes and tries to make her sleep. But Altia loves Hani, replied Mystery to the innocent questions of the 16-year-old boy. Willem murmured the name on Elak and still wanted to know more about this Hani. Then he asked, what happened after Anilak was born? Dmistry was surprised that a quiet boy like him was asking so many questions today. He slowly recounted, Hani is the goddess of vengeance, so she's very busy because there are countless people praying for revenge. But after she gave birth to the child, she took care of Anilak for 100 days before handing the baby over to Altia. Altia's stronghold is quite far, so it took her 100 days to get there. And then she left Anilak without a hint of attachment. Willem curiously asked, is it because Hani doesn't like Altia? Dmistry, with a touch of sarcasm, replied, that's right, but Hani loves the child she bore with so much difficulty. A lot. That's why she visits Altia's stronghold every year to see Anilak. And of course, Altia ignores her, because after all, Hani doesn't like men. Thinking to himself, Mystery chuckled lightly, and Hani has two more children with Altia. This part should only be known to adults, right? But didn't Altia already have Hani? So, wasn't that good enough? Willem murmured sadly. Mystery twisted the question back, good in what way? The woman he loves looks at him like he's vermin. How can anything be good in that situation? Suddenly, Mystery seemed to realize something when Willem unconsciously muttered, it doesn't matter to her. Hmm, this kid, there's no way I don't know what he's reminiscing about. When faced with that huge deer, he showed extreme fear, his eyes were blank, and his hand holding the axe was trembling. But when I told him to chop off the deer's head, saying if you're afraid, the lady will starve, the deer's head was decisively severed. Yes, at that moment, and even before, whenever I looked into his eyes, I always felt that he only had Lady Rennie in his mind. I can't let a blind, ambitious, and cruel kid like him stay by her side. Grown-ups can't always be attached to their mothers like ducklings. Before that, you need to become a proper human being. Right at the time when the Imperial Edict was issued, it's a good opportunity to separate him from Lady Rennie. Back to the present, Sarah was handing over the deed transferring ownership of the Slayland Marsh to her master, sent from Nay Denton. She herself couldn't understand why she would accept such a worthless piece of land. To arrive on time for the conscription day, Laden's soldiers had to travel for two days. The soldiers participating in the campaign also had to prepare rations for this, so Rennie gave Mystery a valuable item to exchange for money to buy provisions. Oh my, my lady, she exclaimed, that's your mother's heirloom. This exquisite necklace was the only keepsake Rennie retained after the prince confiscated the Lincoln family's assets. She replied cheerfully, it's all right, thanks to this, everything will be resolved smoothly. If only I had known, I would have treated my mother better. Sarah stood by and witnessed everything, bowing respectfully.
Thank you sincerely, my lady. I will find a merchant to sell it immediately. As Sarah left, Rennie realized that she respected her as the Lady of Laden. After everyone left the room, Rennie breathed a long sigh of relief. Everything is finally prepared, now there's just one thing left. She ordered, stop hiding there, come in. Willem entered the study. He hesitated, not daring to approach the lady. Rennie noticed his unusual expression and asked, what's wrong? Willem blushed, because I haven't had time to bathe, so I smell a bit, ma'am. She replied with a smile, it's okay, come here, I'm used to the sweat smell of nights. She remembered how her father used to, paused, then stopped herself from embracing him. His expression resembled that of her father's. But Willem misunderstood, thinking she was referring to Dmistry. She joked, hmm, yes, it could be him, or it could be Dmistry, but his sweat smell was even worse than her father's. As she stopped reminiscing, she realized Willem had been standing nearby for a while. He suddenly hugged Renny from behind, if you don't like it, I don't like it either, being familiar with Dmistry's sweat smell. Renny felt weary of Willem's single-minded ambition. She chuckled and teasingly asked him, so, is this your sweat smell? In Willem's heart, happiness bubbled up like a puppy being pampered by its owner. It's hilarious how I worried that Willem would be shocked to become a hired knight for Lord Nadenton. After all, to me, he's still just a kid. Thinking this, Rennie's heart squeezed with guilt. She felt awful for pushing a child like him into danger just for money. With a heavy heart, she softly apologized, I'm sorry, Willem. Our territory only has 30 soldiers. If you join the battle, half of them will be gone, but the villagers might be protected from the wild beasts in the spring. But if you don't want to go... She gripped Willem's arm tightly, despondent. Can you understand my position? Ultimately, she couldn't bear to be ruthless with her little pup. She held Willem's hand and said, I can't help but order you to the battlefield because I'm the lady of this land, and I must protect the lives of the people here. Instead, I will pray for you. Every night when the moon rises before I sleep, I will pray and pray. So please fight for me. Rennie presented her father's sword before Willem and said, This is my father's sword. He didn't have the chance to draw it before falling off his horse and passing away. It's very important to me, so I hope you'll return with it. The gleaming sword of the Lin family reflected a part of Willem's face, while Rennie's voice regained its composure. Because I don't just want the prince's feet, but his life, even the life of Prince Michael Alish, must be claimed by this sword. Willem's face became stunned upon hearing these words. She continued, so you must return with the sword, right? The boy replied firmly, yes, Rennie, I will return with it. Rennie smiled, contentedly, thank you. But then he said, according to tradition, before going to battle, they always receive handkerchiefs from the girls. She teased, oh my, where did you hear that old story? In a book, he mumbled. All right, for you, there's nothing I wouldn't do, she said, then decisively tore a piece of fabric from her sleeve. Willem couldn't help but be surprised, Rennie, your dress. She wrapped the fabric around the sword hilt and said, take it, I don't have any handkerchief, so it's special, and I only have a few clothes. Willem was deeply moved looking at the green fabric on the sword, like a promise that wherever he went, he could feel her presence right beside him. He smiled gently and thanked her. Two days later, under Mystery's urging, Rennie had to tear another piece of fabric from her remaining sleeve to wrap around his sword hilt. This made Willem very unhappy, but eventually, they, along with fifteen soldiers, headed north. It was also the moment of victory after she stabbed Michael Alesh in the foot. Time flew by like a bullet. After Willem and Mystery left, the third summer flooded across the entire Laden territory. Lord Nadenton happily traded the swamp for Slayland. And then, just two months later, he regretted it when the packaged mud became a hit. The Earl sent an envoy and didn't hesitate to ask Rennie how she knew about the mud in the swamp. Of course, she had prepared an answer, stating that this information was written in a book compiled by the First Empress of the Alish Empire. 
Though she didn't know why the book was in Le Den, at least it clearly noted the existence of mud in the swamp, with some mentions of obscure things like magic and dragons. But regardless, thanks to the money earned from selling the mud, Le Den had completely transformed, and the winters in this land had become slightly warmer. As a result, over the past two years, no one had died from the cold. The rapid development of Leden quickly became known to the nearby people, and they migrated to this land to live. The shortage of soldiers was also quickly resolved. When everything became more abundant, Rennie gave many gifts to Mrs. Sarah. Initially she seemed reluctant to accept them, but Rennie persuaded her, saying that without this housekeeper, she would have had a very hard time during the pastime. The eyes of the people in the territory also began to change. They became more welcoming and open-hearted towards her after her contributions to the territory. Everything was smooth except for the fact that the war had not yet ended. Typically, the war with the barbarian tribe usually started in the spring and ended before midsummer, as they needed time to plant and harvest on their land. However, the battles continued relentlessly. It was because of Willem, who had killed the son of the tribal leader. Thanks to this, the Nadenton territory also received a huge war bounty, but the northern barbarians were extremely angry. They abandoned farming to continue fighting for revenge. But it wasn't in vain, and it was also because of Willem. Not yet twenty years old, he had defeated the barbarians like a seasoned warrior. Everyone called him the Mad Dog. His deeds caught the attention of Lord Lentia. He wanted Willem to work under him at any cost. But Willem had obviously refused and bluntly stated that he wouldn't change masters, which left the Count feeling regretful. In the study, Rennie was reading the letter sent by Dmistry. Since Willem was always on the battlefield, it wasn't easy to communicate with him, so most of the situation updates came from Dmistry. Apart from being reckless on the battlefield, he is a very skilled knight. But if he were not a knight but an ordinary soldier, it would be worse because he cannot live harmoniously with others. My first disciple is like this, it's really shameful for her, all because the Lord spoiled him too much, do you know that? Rennie chuckled teasingly, blaming others again, huh? In the last letter sent in the spring of last year, Mystery said, the war seems to be nearing its end. Six out of seven tribal leaders of the barbarian tribe have died, and the tribes have been destroyed. Now they must pursue the great tribal chief to the end, so it will be even harder to communicate. I received a letter from my brother. I heard that my sister-in-law has given birth. After this dull war ends, I will take a break for a while. I have to see my nephew's face. Reading this, Rennie burst into laughter, maybe three days are enough. Suddenly, she noticed something inside the envelope, and there was something else stuffed in it. When she unfolded the piece of fabric, a message appeared every day, when I look at the sword, I think of you. The room fell silent. Rennie slowly bowed her head and shed tears of happiness. I miss both of you too. That evening, some news came through. The Lord of Leden, with a pained expression, delivered the news. Rennie couldn't help but feel dismayed. What did you just say? It can't be. It was the news of the death of someone she had long awaited. Speak, say it again, what did you just say? The messenger recounted, all forces were concentrated at the outer wall. However, the tide suddenly changed, and both sides focused their troops. Reinforcements couldn't reach the front base, where Mr. Dmistry was guarding alone. Rennie grasped the corner of her dress, trying to reassure herself, it's a lie. It's all lies. The trembling messenger continued, Upon hearing the news, Sir Willem quickly dealt with the barbarians in front of him and tried to rescue him, but he faced the great tribal chief. And so the battle lasted longer than expected. When his axe fell on his neck, the sun had risen. Fighting alone at the first base caused Mr. Dmistry to lose his life there. Rennie hugged herself and cried out, Dmistry! I mocked when reading that letter from Mystery today, while well, he had died a week ago, huh? It's all deception. I, I laughed in happiness when reading the letter of the deceased. Rennie collapsed, screaming, it can't be. 
My childhood friend, both of them lay on the same bed and listened to my father's stories. My friend! In the end, only I am left. In memory, since I behaved the way I did in my life, it's because of me that mystery died. Not long after, the people of Leden were overjoyed as their loved ones returned from the battlefield after months of separation. However, not everyone was fortunate. A coffin was brought in from outside the city walls, and everyone was stunned, especially when they saw Willem's face. Isn't that the child that the Lord favored so much? It seems so, and he looks terrifyingly different. He has been rolling on the battlefield for three years, so of course. Quiet! He's a knight now. Keep silent, he has wielded his sword vigorously on the battlefield to deal with the barbarians. Willem's footsteps suddenly halted as he widened his eyes upon seeing that girl. Rennie had descended to the square to welcome the returning soldiers. After years apart, now all he wanted was to immediately embrace her. Rennie! Mystery, she exclaimed, rushing past him like a gust of wind. This action left Willem utterly astonished. Rennie screamed and opened the coffin lid, but it was empty. There was nothing in Mystery's coffin, as his body could not be found. She fell to her knees on the ground in despair. The surrounding soldiers, seeing this, didn't know what to do, though they were also in agony. Despite her pain, Rennie tried to contain herself so others wouldn't see. She stood up and shouted loudly, Listen up, everyone! Congratulations on returning after the arduous battle! Everyone will be rewarded according to their merits. Furthermore, I will provide free farming land for ten years, and we will prepare a grand feast for everyone. Let's enjoy this happiness together! The entire village cheered and celebrated the victory, now that the war had ended. Everyone was happy, except for those two. At the cemetery, on a rainy day, Mystery's brother came to bid farewell to his younger brother. But he couldn't accept the fact that there was no body in his coffin. He died as a knight of Leden. He deserves to be buried here. Mystery chose you, and that's the consequence of that choice. The preparations for the end of war feast and the funeral made Rennie exhausted, despite the presence of Dmistry's brother. And for some reason, the heir of the Grancia family also came, making her feel even more overwhelmed. Suddenly, Rennie remembered something. After two years on the distant battlefield, he fought like a madman for me, so I can't just... I need to see Willem, but before that, I need to change, she thought to herself. There was a knock on the door. Come in, Rennie assumed it was Sarah coming to help her in the evening. But as the footsteps gradually approached, a strange hand touched her. The zipper at the back of your dress seems to be stuck, I... I guess I was too hasty. As she was about to finish that sentence, she hesitated. A deep male voice interrupted, Is it true that you're asking for my help? Her face flushed, Willem. You, you're here? She couldn't help but be surprised. Kid granted, three years ago I used to call him that, but now there's a man standing before me, no, I can simply call him a man. No, if I were to encounter a monster in the forest, would I need to guess whether it's male or female? She blushed, I didn't realize it was you. Come on. Suddenly, Rennie's foot twisted, causing her to stumble forward. In that moment, she realized how quickly the boy from before had grown up. In the past, Willem had been a scrawny little boy. He just stood there, silently observing her stunned expression. She recalled the things he had done for her, and choked up as she apologized. Willem guarded Mystery's coffin for three days straight. This was the first time he experienced a farewell. He endured so much, and I... She sobbed, I truly apologize, Willem. Despite my determination, when I looked at Dmistry's coffin, my heart felt like it was breaking into a thousand pieces. I neglected you like that, and it wasn't right. Willem simply responded quietly, I'm okay. Just please say this to me, welcome back. Rennie struggled to hold back tears. Beast? 
how could I ever think of such a good guy as a beast? She sobbed, you've returned safely. Willem, I'm glad you're back. I've missed you a lot, he said. Me too, let's continue talking, she replied. Rennie, you don't know how much I missed you. On the battlefield, every night, I only longed for you, Rennie. His earnest words left her flustered. The next day, this young man got up early to meet Rennie and offered 100,000 allens to bring Willem back under his military command. But she coldly retorted, how is that enough? This rejection left the young man completely embarrassed, not knowing what to do with her refusal of such a large sum of money. He is Farhan Grancia, the heir of the Grancia family, where the conflict with the Man Roe tribe occurred. Although the funeral had ended, he still tried to find excuses to stay here. It's definitely a plot. Rennie thought cunningly. It seems like the proposal to Willem failed, so he came to find me. Of course, I will also refuse. Rennie continued her attack. Moreover, only 100,000 allens? Do you think that amount is equivalent to a knight who beheaded the chief of the Man Ro tribe before he even turned 20? Farhan, taken aback, respectfully doubled the price. I don't like it, so I won't sell, Rennie asserted seriously. If not, then lend it? Also not. But doesn't Laden lack soldiers for Willem to command? He tried to persuade. This made Rennie begin to get angry. That's so rude. Farhan persisted, raising his voice. If it's rude, then I'll continue to be rude. Even if the population increases, there are only 42 soldiers, and how can a capable knight like Willem only command in this small piece of land in Laden every day? If he comes to Glencia, in addition to the contract fee, Willem will be paid an extra 5,000 allens per year. Oh, I'll also give my sister to him, she's a beauty, she. Rennie couldn't believe her ears. What? Hold on, does that mean the Earl of Glencia already considers Willem his son-in-law? She turned to him, Willem, you. Willem bluntly declared, I don't care. Besides Rennie, I don't care about anyone else. Watching the young man from the Grancia family walk away in anger, Rennie sighed, so those annoying people were under your command, huh? You must have had to deal with a lot of trouble. Willem responded, but he's very famous on the battlefield, sir. Is that so? Rennie discreetly glanced at the young man next to her. He seems like a different person from last night. So, she tried to ask further. What about you? You look handsome like this, you must be popular with the female soldiers, right? Willem exclaimed awe and blushed. He awkwardly replied, no, I'm not. She looked at his adorable expression and burst out laughing. You liar. Then, suddenly, she reached up to his hair, and with a playful tone said, Hmm, it seems like your bangs have grown quite long, they'll poke into your eyes if you don't do something about it. Shall I cut them? Before she could finish her sentence, Willem reached out, taking Rennie's hand. She was caught off guard, unable to react in time. He hesitated and said, I always thought about your words and fought for them. You told me to survive and come back. So I kept repeating that phrase. She withdrew her hand cheerfully. That's right, Willem, you did very well. He still held onto that hand, pulling it closer to him again, whispering, I have returned as you said. I will always, always survive and return. His eyes were filled with affection as he looked at her. Please give me a reward. Rennie, puzzled, asked, a reward? What do you want? Willem, mesmerized, just smiled gently. It's a bit difficult to say now. I'll tell you next time. But I'll definitely do it. Before it's too late. He kissed her hand. For sure. Before everything becomes too late. As the sun set, a fire ignited in the dark night along with angry curses. The young master of the Grenatia estate was outside with a close attendant named Anand Gol, setting up a tent and discussing Willem. 
It seems like he's trying to provoke our father, he said. He said he doesn't care about anyone except Rennie. I know he's a lunatic. Remembering the day Willem beheaded the son of man-eating tribes, all the soldiers celebrated except for the Earl of Glancia. Man-eating tribes was a rebellious group, only demanding food and goods for about a month. Their appearance when descending upon Glencia was an annual event in spring, causing no harm to either side. If we give them a few warehouses of food, they will disappear on their own. So our soldiers don't need to fight and shed blood. Instead, in the name of this war, we can command up to 10,000 soldiers. It's like a fair exchange. So everything is going smoothly, right? Top of form. When Farhan saw Willem, he frowned in disbelief because he was just a child. You're the one who killed the son of the chief? Willem replied coldly, yes. I heard we could have captured him, couldn't we? Glenatia was angry. Yes? Is that all you can say? Farhan pressed his finger against his temple in frustration. You must know how valuable it is to keep hostages in war, don't you? But why did you insist on killing him in the end? Willem hesitated for a moment, feeling the weight of the sword of honor at his side, then unsheathed it and calmly said, That man, he touched my sword. The young master of the Glancia estate then noticed the sword carefully. It couldn't be mistaken. It was the mirror sword of Count Lincoln. Willem continued to explain, that scoundrel tried to steal my sword of honor. Surely you understand that's an unforgivable act? His eyes became fierce. To me, letting him live would be much more shameful. Farhan recalled that there was a deposed prince who had been exiled to Leden. That's why the knight standing in front of him had been hired from that territory. And that was why he had come to Leden Castle to find a skilled warrior. Back to reality, Farhan felt disgusted. I never thought I'd be ashamed of my master. His attendant Anen asked, What are you going to do now, sir? Farhan, with his head in his hands, looked confused. Ha! I don't even know anymore. Should I bring out a picture of my sister and try again? And then sighed, Sir, do you know we'll never do that, right? Farhan exploded, then what should we do? Suddenly, they both stopped as they noticed a shadow approaching on horseback. Look! Who's that? Someone's coming, right? Farhan realized it was the person with black hair and eyes, a thin figure, and pale skin. None other than Willem. People often change after experiencing the ups and downs of the battlefield, witnessing bodies lying there several times, they gradually consider it as normal. While still fighting on the Glenna territory, Willem inadvertently heard the news that Prince Michael Alish had married someone new. A few soldiers standing nearby were chatting. They say in the capital, they're throwing a big celebration for three days straight, the atmosphere must be lively. Not like us in this chaotic place for a whole month. I bet the new princess must be beautiful, right? Of course, the prince kicked out his old wife already, didn't he? Ha ha! Just replacing one wife with another. The soldiers continued joking without noticing Willem behind them. She's the woman who crippled the prince's leg just because she heard people saying they should divorce. Their married life must have been so boring. But I heard she has a pretty face, not a virgin anymore just need to marry someone. The group behind echoed, well, I should also hurry up and find a new candidate, a woman like that must scream loudly in bed. Oops. The soldiers were stunned and couldn't say a word when they saw the scene before them a long sword thrust straight into the neck of a soldier. They were all horrified to see the wide eyes and blood flowing from his mouth. What the hell? A soldier was in extreme panic when he saw his comrade fall. The one who did the horrifying act was none other than Willem. He seemed like a mad beast, his eyes fierce as he approached his prey. Farhan s close aid, and then, witnessed the entire event. The soldiers were too shaken to speak and fell dead on the spot. The rest were terrified, shouting, What the hell are you doing, Willem? What the hell? 
Without much word, he swung his sword lethally at the long-haired soldier, then moved on to the next target amidst their frantic screams. Willem, like a madman, glared fiercely and shouted, You filthy people! They cried out in fear, Ah! Run, run! The crowd scrambled to escape, but couldn't escape the cold-blooded killer's sword. The sword swung repeatedly. Seeing Willem lose control, Dmistry quickly intervened from behind. Hey, you madman, what are you doing? Willem didn't turn his gaze away as Dmistry continued to shout, They're allies. Glenatia soldiers, you know that, don't you? What are you doing? Only the sword swung again, completing the deadline. Anzen stood frozen in horror, staring at Willem, covered in fresh blood. Willem spoke coldly, they were sentenced to death for insulting the royal family. Very persuasive. I like him. Back to reality, Anzen sat by the fire, but he still felt a chill as he remembered that moment. Seeing how deranged Willem was when speaking to his master, Anzen thought to himself that Willem's nature was already like that, not changed by the war. Suddenly, Anen saw his lord, Glenatia, jerk and then call out in horror, Anzen. What's wrong, sir? Anzen, still lost in thought, replied. Anzen didn't understand what was happening. What's going on? he asked, as Farhan quickly went to fetch the horses. No time for explanations, follow me quickly. Farhan said, leading Anzen away as the two disappeared into the dawn. At the mansion in Leden, Rennie groggily woke up after a long sleep. There was already bread on the dresser, as if someone had prepared it beforehand. Huh, bread? Why is it here? Suddenly remembering how he used to bring her bread every morning, she sighed, even though I'm grown up now, he still comes to the Lord's room. I guess I'll have to teach him how to behave with women again, rather than learning swordsmanship, mystery. Lost in her thoughts, her mood suddenly darkened. He, mystery, he's not in this world anymore. She muttered bitterly. That scoundrel Michael Alish has taken away another important person from me. She silently blamed herself, if only I had stabbed him properly. If only, if only I could go back. Suddenly, she heard a voice behind her, if only? And then what? She was surprised to see him standing there. Willem, are you here? Willem replied, I was about to leave, but then you woke up. He approached Rennie and took her hand. Did you sleep well? Rennie blushed with embarrassment as Willem came too close for comfort, given her thin dress. She quickly covered herself, feeling ashamed. Rennie, do you like land? Willem smirked and then chuckled softly, ending with, well, I'll give it to you. Huh? Rennie was puzzled, not paying attention to Willem's words as she dismissed them as typical endearments from children to their parents. She accepted it eagerly as a sign of affection within the family. All right, I'll wait for that time then, she replied happily. Say, what if we take a stroll? Willem hinted. Go for a walk? Why all of a sudden? Rennie reconsidered and realized that the weather today seemed pleasant, so she nodded in agreement. Okay, but before that, give me some time to change. This is my room, after all. Before she could even step down from the bed, a female guard burst into the room and shouted loudly, My lord, outside. Rennie hastily put on her clothes and followed the maid, feeling worried and uneasy. The guard pointed forward urgently, Please hurry, that way. Rennie widened her eyes, What is this? A group of soldiers stood ready in the courtyard of the mansion. Willem's voice rang out, I'm the one who brought them here. Rennie turned back in shock, What? All she saw was him smiling and replying, Land, didn't you say you liked it? I've negotiated with them. Remembering last night at the campsite, Willem had proposed to the two of them, Let me borrow Grenache's army. Here's the story, when Willem said that, Farhan was suspicious, is this a deal? Aren't you sneaking behind the back of the deposed crown prince, to come here? 
Willem paid no attention to those accusations and said calmly, General Mann's tribe from the north is no longer, and he must be thinking about what to do with the 10,000 soldiers mobilized for this rebellion, right? Farhan, taken aback, responded, if Duke Lincoln were still alive, the royals would use his army to oppress Glenasia, but he's dead, and Lincoln's army is disbanded. From now on, the royals will weaken Glen at all costs, and it'll be lucky if it just ends with disbanding the army. Seeing Farhan losing patience, Willem went straight to the point, in that case, wouldn't it be better to defeat the empire and turn Glenna into an independent state? And then, hearing this, intervened and shouted, are you proposing a rebellion? Don't act like a model citizen of the empire anymore, Willem smirked. Farhan couldn't believe it, is that what the mystery taught you? Willem sighed and replied, no, he's a good man and would never think of betrayal. If it were him, he'd propose negotiations with the royals instead. Farhan asked fiercely, so you intend to use Glenna's army to spark a war on this land? I will annex the entire northeastern territory for the Lord of Leden, Willem declared. Upon hearing this, Anen trembled, while Farhan felt the plan was ludicrous. How can we trust you and give away the soldiers of this land? Farhan questioned skeptically. Willem mockingly remarked, now I understand why they call you the Fox of Grancia, even in matters of courage. Farhan angrily interjected, what does that have to do with courage? It does, indeed. If successful, Glenna will become a powerful allied nation. I mean to establish control over a vast territory in the northeast through relationships with various lords. Are you still hesitant? Willem responded confidently. Farhan, still apprehensive, expressed his concerns, if we do that, we will surely be more closely monitored by the emperor. That's not an issue because when that happens, the surveillance will disappear, Willem nonchalantly replied. And then, sweating profusely, trembled, what are you saying, sir? You're talking nonsense. Willem glanced at him and reminded Farhan, Anzen just sat there, feeling dejected, while they discussed matters. He didn't pay attention to what they were saying, just feeling miserable being scolded by them. Unaware of the conversation, all he saw was his master looking extremely panicked and shouting loudly, and then, returned to Glenna immediately. As the two hurriedly rode away, Willem remained calm and composed. Those were the secrets of Willem's gift for her. Remembering it, Willem revealed a cunning smile. Hurrah! The soldiers cheered throughout Leden. Willem grinned and asked her, aren't you happy? Rennie screamed anxiously, we don't have the money to feed so many soldiers. What are you doing? Willem chuckled, because you said you liked land, didn't you? Land? They're human beings. Rennie retorted. Still composed, Willem draped his cloak over her, Rennie, he gently called her name. Inwardly, Rennie was extremely worried. She and him had crossed paths many times, yet at this moment, his gaze was strangely different. Top of form. I know you don't trust me like the mystery. Willem continued. What? No, I didn't mean that. If you had as many soldiers as this, and it was the mystery, not me, you'd probably jump for joy, wouldn't you? Willem said, feeling dejected. Rennie was somewhat puzzled, but he continued, there's nothing to worry about when mentioning my teacher. Anyway, he's not here anymore. Rennie, I can't say I understand all your sadness and frustration. But look at Michael Alish, who took the mystery's life from us. So let me be by your side, even if it means harboring hatred towards him. Rennie was touched by Willem's sincere words. Until now, she had always seen him as an innocent child, but she hadn't realized how much he had grown up. Willem continued his confession, I'm doing this to reclaim what belongs to you. It's just the beginning. Rennie withdrew her hand, feeling conflicted. I've never told you about this or about reclaiming anything. So if I want to get it back, it's something I have to do. But you wanted that through me, Willem replied. Rennie was deeply confused and stuttered in denial, you've got it wrong about that. 
Renny, he gently called her, as if wanting to calm her down, but despite the bright smile on his face, Willem's every word felt like a sharp knife aimed straight at her. From the beginning, you intended to turn me into a tool. Renny's breath felt suffocated, as if each exhale was being choked off. She could hardly believe that the boy she had raised was now confronting her with her own emotions. He continued, so no matter what I do, you'll always be the one who raised me. Your anger will be the thunder in the storm named you. The storm has its path, but the thunder only follows it. Of course, both won't depend on each other. Willem drew his sword decisively and stood before the ranks of Glenna soldiers, resolute. I'm just paving the way for you. I only hope that the path I've cleared will satisfy you. That summer, when Leden declared territorial war, everyone mocked. They thought that the deposed prince was a lunatic, using only a common knight who was just twenty years old to go to battle. May Denton was the first territory to surrender. They believed that the land only contained cowardly individuals, so they all mocked Lord Ney Denton for allegedly choosing the wrong side to stand on. But when the wealthy and vast territory of Delmarine also lost to Leden, they suddenly became silent and could no longer laugh. The Atene's empire did not intervene in territorial wars unless it affected tax revenues to the national budget. Furthermore, Leden's territorial expansion happened so quickly that the royal family could hardly perceive it in time. Therefore, before that winter ended, Leden had completely controlled six territories. The Eastern Expeditionary Force soldiers had no fear. Initially, this army had 1,000 soldiers, but now it had increased to 2,000, and rumors linking Lord Gaelmia to the war spread quickly. Some renowned lords expressed their dissatisfaction, but it was too late. From the east of Orion to Delmarine and Paula, all neighboring lords kneeled and surrendered. Leden's Knights, also known as Leden's Mad Dogs, changed their nickname to Leden's Thunder. The territories that paid the highest taxes to the empire had now become Rennies. In the palace, Prince Michael casually suggested it would be best to revoke the order to disband the army of Count Glenia and then order him to deal with Leden. That should do it, right? After this statement, the entire meeting room was stunned. The old king explained to the prince, half of Leden's army consists of volunteer soldiers from Count Glenia. What benefit do you gain by doing so? Does that mean those soldiers will obey Count Glenia's orders if summoned? The prince asked naively. The old king exclaimed, it means very likely that Count Glenia and the deposed prince are in cahoots with each other. Yes, so shouldn't we revoke the order to disband the army, seize the soldiers from that woman, and intervene in the relationship between Leden and Grancia? Michael always had such intelligence. He made the old king even more furious, how foolish to do it now. If we allow him to establish his army as he pleases, will he withdraw the soldiers currently in Leden? It will only increase the number of new soldiers and strengthen his military power. Michael looked clueless after being lectured, but he just frowned and avoided his father's anger. The old king, frustrated, exclaimed, I'm going crazy. I have only one son, and he's utterly foolish. He has no foresight in politics. Right from the start, that boy. If only we had intervened in the Sarawak Rebellion from the beginning, things wouldn't be like this. A royal council member noted that Michael had become hot-tempered since his injury and didn't care about anything except his own proposals. The old king clenched his teeth helplessly, this is the Allen Empire, the nation I rule. A close advisor later suggested, Your Majesty, as far as I know, the Lord of Leden has won many battles since acquiring an exceptional knight. Let's summon him and directly accuse him. The old king grumbled, and then what? I've heard he's an unofficial knight, pretending to be one to join the battle. Normally, such individuals wouldn't be charged if they die on the battlefield. But that doesn't mean they're innocent. The old king continued, so what? Summon him to the capital and accuse him. In Leden, a letter from the royal court had been sent, containing an order to come to the capital and have an audience with the emperor. According to the letter, the king would ensure two conditions, restoring the title of Count to the House of Lincoln and returning the body of their deceased to Rennie. 
In that year, when Rennie thrust into Prince Michael's leg, the House of Lincoln suffered greatly, their titles and properties were confiscated, and all knights were ordered back to the royal court. The body of Count Lincoln was buried at a public cemetery outside the capital. Rennie silently understood these conditions were non-negotiable, tightly gripping the crystal in her hand, silently murmuring that finally, the time had come to get closer to that name, Michael, one step further. Unlike the day she was exiled to Leden, Rennie was ordered to pass through the crystal gate to reach the capital. The crystal gate, a magical device made of glass, allows users to instantly teleport from one location to another, a technology from ancient times. Magic once existed on this continent, but gradually declined and disappeared over time. Queen Amaris Alish, the founder of the Alish Empire, created the Crystal Gate as the last sorceress of the continent. This gate was a creative product in the transportation method that brought prosperity to the continent, and only those of royal bloodline could directly pass through it. Others who wished to use the gate needed to carry a resonating crystal with them. Upon hearing this news, Rennie would carry the sword of the House of Lincoln through the gate. A guard appeared extremely stern because passing through the crystal gate meant abandoning weapons. Rennie stepped forward with determination, saying, Count Molly, they are my trusted companions. I believe they will not cause any trouble. He still replied loudly, but this is the rule for everyone who wants to pass through this gate. Rennie recalled passing through that gate when she was still the prince's wife. Upon arrival, the royal court would not appear immediately, and she was sure there would be about two soldiers waiting on the other side of the gate. Molly still seemed upset, but my lord. Rennie interrupted, Sir Moy, I have agreed to go to the capital through the crystal gate under the emperor's order. But if the process is too complicated, I would rather ride a horse there. She thought to herself, Lord Molly is right to intervene, but everything must have its limits. Molly hesitated for a moment, then pointed directly at Willem and exclaimed, But Lord Willem cannot carry a sword like that, sir. Without his majesty's permission, one cannot bring a long sword to the capital. This rule applies even to the prince. Rennie responded firmly, That is my father's sword. If you knew why I am going to the capital, you cannot take that sword away from my knight. After hearing this, Molly had nothing more to say, angrily leaving and reminding resentfully, if that's what you said, then fine. I will wait at the main gate. After you're ready, bring the crystal stone. Rennie stood there, looking at him angrily and sneering, look at that temper. Suddenly, she noticed the young man beside Willem staring at her intently. He hesitated and said, you protected my weapon, thank you. Rennie felt a bit embarrassed, deliberately avoiding and turning to instruct Sarah to take care of the territory while she was away. Everyone wanted their territory to expand, but in the past six months, Leden had grown so rapidly that an ordinary person could hardly handle everything. Willem had fought fiercely, so Sarah and Rennie had tried to manage the affairs after a series of consecutive victories. With the management system still unstable and the Lord having to leave, it was difficult for Sarah to stay and shoulder everything alone. Nevertheless, Sarah reassured her that she would return immediately after accomplishing her goal. I still remember the day I met you. I'm not lying when I say I was very happy to welcome you here. You have brought so much to Leden, and it's time for us to support you. No matter how long it takes. Just do what you need to do, and come back in glory, Sarah encouraged. Rennie felt warmed by these words, sincerely grasping the woman's hand and replying, Thank you, Sarah. Recalling the day she first set foot in Leden, she could not imagine what her life would be like. Perhaps father tried to give me this opportunity to say don't give up, and I will never return, Rennie thought. Willem, Rennie stepped towards him gently and said, Yes, my lord, he replied. She looked straight into his eyes and said, Before we leave, I have something to tell you. Remembering the day and the conversation at the fortress, Rennie had seen Willem differently. Sometimes leaning on his shoulder, she felt very reassured. But she knew Willem was no longer the child she once cherished. Although he pretended not to know anything on the surface, he was looking into her heart. Deep down, Rennie felt ashamed of his blind loyalty, which left her unable to respond. 
It was painful, ever since Leden's victory over Delmarine, Rennie had only sat and listened to news of consecutive victories. Alan's war hero had never lost a battle. Rennie didn't even have the strength to manage the territories he offered her. Although she did nothing, Rennie didn't know when the vengeance had begun. You must reward me, he demanded. If so, then there is no other way than to give you a reward, right? But with such achievements, what can I give you? Back to reality, Rennie looked him in the eyes and said, We are going to the capital of the empire. This journey is no different from venturing into a wasp's nest. But before we enter, I need to trust my knight completely. Let me trust you. Rennie reached out and placed her hand over Willem's chest, whispering, You said you would avenge me for what they did to Dimitri, right? Willem immediately blushed at her gentle attitude. I trust you, so I'll tell you a truth that I've never told anyone. You don't need the crystal stone to pass through that gate. Because the blood of the Allen royal family runs in your veins, he said. Rennie raised her head to look at Willem. That's hard to believe, isn't it? Willem, you're the son of our emperor. We trust you, so please trust me, Rennie said, grasping his arm with hope that he would believe her, then continued, I was very hesitant to reveal this. But this concerns you, so I think you should know. After a few minutes of silence, Rennie's heart became restless as Willem showed no reaction. Suddenly, she noticed something at his waist. Oh, Willem, I tied it to your sword for you. It's necessary, right? Willem startled, showing concern, it's dirty and has royal blood on it. No, it's not dirty at all. Rennie replied curiously, as it seemed she had wrapped it in thicker cloth, she thought. Willem tensed, sweating, I'm sorry, I should return it to you, but I was too greedy. Rennie hugged him to comfort him. It's okay, Willem. I'm glad you appreciate my gift. That's right, no matter how much you've grown and changed, the child from back then will never disappear, Rennie said, releasing him and saying with determination, I'm sorry for using you as a tool, but I gave you my father's sword. No matter who you become in this empire, no matter what you do or how your heart changes or leaves me, as long as you keep that sword, I will always trust you. So, Willem, she said with a bright smile, come back to me any time, okay? Willem blushed slightly, replying, yes, ma'am. I will definitely do that. In Rennie's heart, she still felt the fear of Willem's power, but she wouldn't repeat the past out of fear. Because in this life, he belonged to her. Willem blushed as she patted his head. He also had something to say to his lord. Rennie happily asked, hmm, what's the matter? Willem blushed and approached her, whispering, I already know that I am the son of the emperor. Rennie widened her eyes in disbelief. What else did Willem know and hide from her? Stay tuned for the next episode by liking and subscribing to the channel. I already knew I'm the son of the emperor. Rennie heard him say, and she was immediately stunned. What? she exclaimed, her eyes widening in disbelief. Confused, she pushed him away and shouted, What are you saying? How is that possible? Since when did you know? Since when? Willem took hold of her hand to calm her down. Rennie, he whispered, pulling her close, I can't tell you yet. Still in a state of bewilderment, Rennie heard a call from the door urging them, My lord, and then Stog has arrived. You must depart. Anson felt embarrassed at the scene and apologized for being late. Rennie blushed in embarrassment, Why now? She turned to follow them, All right. Let's go. Well, it seems difficult to continue our conversation now, doesn't it? Willem chuckled softly as he walked past her. We'll talk later when we have the chance. 
Rennie stood there, still perplexed, unable to fully comprehend what he had just revealed. In the lush green forest, the sound of the escort's horse hooves echoed, clip-clop. As they rode, Rennie thought about Willem, so that's it. All this time I've been wondering why Farhan Grancia was willing to lend so many soldiers. Turns out he wasn't lending free army troops, but Willem was offering himself in exchange, thanks to the blood running through his veins. That also means all of Laden's actions are related to the imperial family. The emperor has nothing to worry about because Michael is his only bloodline, and with his advanced age, he cannot have any more children. If that fool Michael is the only crown prince at the moment, the appearance of another contender for this position would surely delight the emperor. Willem glanced at her thoughtfully, causing Rennie to jump slightly, quickly turning away. Her embarrassed expression momentarily deflated his demeanor, but the awkward atmosphere was soon broken when the attendant loudly announced, We've arrived, my lord. The glass gate emitted a beautiful blue light. The cowboy had been waiting for them for a long time. He politely greeted, Welcome, everyone. Now that we've all gathered, let's begin the journey. Just hold the resonance stone and walk through. Follow me. Rennie and Willem led the group as they slowly approached the gate. But before stepping through, Willem called her back, Rennie. Hmm, what is it? She asked. He leaned in and whispered in her ear, I haven't told you what reward I want from you, have I? Caught off guard by his intense gaze, Rennie hesitantly responded, Oh. Gripping the corner of her dress. She hesitated, sorry, Willem, can you repeat that? Feeling anxious about the demand from the young man, Willem gently replied, I have returned as promised, and even in the future, I will survive and come back. So please reward me, he solemnly reminded her of the promise made years ago. Rennie asked again, reward for what? A guard, seeing her pause, urged, my lord. Rennie quickly replied, oh, all right then, as she hurried to catch up with Willem, quietly asking, what reward? What do you want? I have nothing to give you. Willem smiled gently, just give yourself to me. Rennie skipped a beat upon hearing that, her mind becoming blank for a moment. WH what? She stammered. Willem continued, it's what I've wanted from the beginning, and no matter when, it's always been just you, Rennie. Rennie's entire body chilled with astonishment. She retorted, you, you're talking nonsense. Let's go, everyone can hear us right now. Still feeling dazed, Rennie watched as Willem reached out and touched the surface of the glass gate. He calmly said, I don't care, Rennie. I love you. Blushing and feeling embarrassed, Willem looked at the girl and added, I only love you. Meanwhile, in the prince's private chamber in the palace, Michael called out to his new wife, Jolly Sinia, I'm not feeling too well. She hesitated, should I massage you with essential oils? I just received some jasmine orchid essence. Michael waved his hand, no need, it's too hot anyway. Just wash my feet. She obeyed and carried out his command. Jolly Sinia hailed from a small country called Canaria. When she was brought to the Atane's empire, she was only 12 years old. The final gift that her homeland bestowed upon her was odorless, tasteless poison for the emperor's prisoners. They were often held captive in some desolate palace, sometimes even forced to work by the palace staff. Similarly, Jolly Sinia endured 10 years living in this strange place, so there was no way she would easily fall into love with anyone. As Jolie Sinia wiped Michael's old wound, he suddenly snapped, Stop it! She raised her face to hear his uncomfortable words, Don't use so much force. Be gentle with your hands. Yes, sir, she replied, enduring with a gentle expression. Every time his foot hurt, the crown prince would make his new wife wash his feet. Suddenly, he announced coldly, That woman will come tonight. Jolie Sinia's hand paused. That woman. And who else, but that damned woman, Rennie. Hearing that name, Jolly Sinia briefly recalled what she had done back then. Because she intervened in the salt import affairs from Sarawark, it led to Rennie stabbing the prince's foot with a sword. 
Michael saw her with a distressed expression and felt uncomfortable. I apologize, my lord. Because of me, you were. She stuttered, avoiding his gaze. Michael patted her head and comforted her, it's not your fault. I'm just not happy thinking about that woman. He thought to himself, Jolie Sinia is indeed cautious, unlike Rennie, his ex-wife with that provocative demeanor. Michael clenched his fist and shouted, I hate that woman. I want to kill her. I thought after leaving here, she would fall prey to bandits in the mountains or freeze to death. But she's still alive out there, rescued by some unknown person. His eyes turned fierce, and now she suddenly becomes a great lord? And she's shameless enough to come to the capital. He gritted his teeth, I'll make her regret it for the rest of her life. I'll make sure her arrogant head is hung at the city gates. Then, he changed his tone and smiled at the beautiful girl beside him, right, bring that thing here and open it. A finely crafted gemstone necklace appeared, with a stone matching Jolly Sinia's eye color. She was extremely surprised. This is for you, so I prepared it. Wear it at the reception this afternoon. Jolly Sinia hesitated, but, my lord, at the lord's reception. Michael interrupted, normally, the prince's consort cannot attend such gatherings. But it's okay. First, I have to crush that woman's arrogance. He clenched his teeth, because her status should have her crawling on the street's heads. You, as a princess with noble lineage, should not allow her to compare to you. From the beginning, she stole the position of the prince's consort that rightfully belongs to you. Let her see that directly. She bowed her head without saying a word, the answer given as someone who would live a lifetime as a mere shadow, always and forever, yes, sir. She replied to her husband most sincerely. At the reception, Jelly Sinia wore a sparkling crown and the exquisitely designed gemstone necklace. But her face still showed traces of insecurity and restlessness. Michael reminded her, look up. Jelly Sinia, you're the wife I chose. Don't be so timid. She replied, full of concern, yes. The old king glanced at Sinia. He snorted and turned away disdainfully, then said, Summon Lord Laden and the Night Squadron. The servant's voice echoed, Yes, sir. The front door slowly opened. Michael focused his gaze there, reminding his new wife, Now watch carefully. See how that woman looks so pathetic after losing her husband to you. Before he could finish his sentence, what appeared before him was an extremely shocking scene. What the hell is this? What is this? Jelly Sinia thought to herself. She used to be just a little princess forgotten in this attain's country. As Sinia saw the former prince's consort for the first time in real life, she was astonished. Renny, that woman looks truly elegant and noble. Just like many other girls surrounding Renny, Sinia was drawn to her sky blue eyes, her golden hair shining like the sun, and her dignified demeanor. At that moment, Rennie noticed Sinia wearing a crown and a gemstone necklace. These items adorned her, despite her having blue eyes and hair as silver as the moon. But ultimately, it was the sunlight reflecting off her face that made her shine. Remembering the day Rennie was humiliated and went mad, stabbing Michael with a sword, Jelly Sinia involuntarily touched the necklace around her neck, silently blaming herself, it's because of me that that woman lost everything. And now I have to meet her again in this situation. Lost in thought, Sinia didn't notice Michael trembling with anger. That woman has gone crazy. As the two slowly entered the palace, he gritted his teeth, muttering each word, so arrogant. Sinia also trembled in horror when she saw that face. Rennie's eyes seemed to devour her. However, that was just Juna's imagination. Rennie calmly approached in a black morning attire, not needing any makeup to look beautiful. As they drew closer, Sinia became more anxious. She's coming. She's looking at me. While Rennie remained calm in her inner fear, she was glaring, uttering each word, I will regain everything you stole from me and my father's dignity. 
Jelly Sinia was trembling so much that Michael had to put his hand on her shoulder to reassure her. I told you to calm down. Forgive me, she could only mutter. On the golden throne, the old king looked at the two fools with disdain. This situation made him scratch his head with much deliberation. But he truly respected Rennie for what she had built in that remote and poor place, threatening even his throne. His purpose in calling her was to congratulate her on becoming a great lord, wanting her to see it as a great honor. But it seemed like things wouldn't be easy. He looked at Rennie, who came here with that appearance, unadorned and unmade up, as if humiliating the royal family. But he knew her true purpose in accepting this offer. Rennie was wearing mourning attire for her father, indicating that she wanted the royal family to return her father's remains. A courtier carefully raised his voice, Your Majesty, the esteemed and revered ruler of Allen, this is the Lord of Leden. The old king replied, Come forward, Viscal Rennie Felden. She also solemnly bowed, It's an honor to meet you, Your Majesty. Viscount Felden, please raise your head. Rennie didn't obey the king's command, maintaining her posture. This reaction made the old king somewhat uncomfortable. <laughs> I deliberately lowered her status by addressing her as a viscount, but it seems Rennie intends to imply that she's here to reclaim the title of the Lincoln Marquess. Rennie extended her hand to introduce, this is Willem, without a surname, but he has been actively serving as a temporary knight for Viscount Felden. Listening to the introduction, the old man thought to himself, she's foolish to think that the emperor will reinstate that title. However, Willem's greeting caught the old king's attention. He raised his head, radiating vigor and strength. This made the old king feel somewhat curious about this young man, it is also an honor to meet you, your majesty. A courtier standing nearby seemed eager to diminish Willem's importance, so you're Willem? I've heard of you. How old are you? His uncomfortable question was met with solemnity, I am twenty years old this year, sir. The old king paused upon receiving that answer, oh, you're young but already so skilled. Several hypotheses emerged in the old man's mind. You're too kind, your majesty, Willem calmly responded. But why don't you have a surname? The old king's next words were less discomforting. Rennie quickly replied for Willem, his external family was massacred in a raid by a barbaric tribe, and his mother passed away after giving birth to him. The old king still had one last question, but at least there must be a father, right? Is there a marriage certificate? Rennie bluntly said, this is not a matter to be discussed in this hall, sir. If overlooked, it would be a disgrace to an entire family. The room fell silent after her words. The king father wiped his sweaty forehead, and the rest didn't understand what they were talking about. The story didn't seem to align with the negotiation they needed to focus on. A few seconds later, the old king suddenly addressed her by her former prestigious title, Marquis Lincoln. This call surprised both Michael and June Sinia greatly. He turned to look at his father with a puzzled expression, but the old king continued speaking as calmly as possible. There are few who are called grand lords in the empire, especially the return of the territory of Marquis Lincoln must be delicately and quickly negotiated. An hour later, come to my garden, and we can enjoy tea and talk properly. Rennie understood the old man's intention. She replied respectfully, I understand, your majesty. The old king continued to invite her and Willem to the welcoming banquet of the new grand lord. This made Prince Michael couldn't help but ask, what exactly is going on, father? Is returning the territory just a bait? We've decided to control that woman and kill the knight. But why does everything turn out like this? He shook with anger, silently cursing Rennie. He no longer paid attention to his new wife Sinia, who was watching Willem's departing figure. In her heart, Sinia felt a bit of sweetness towards the handsome and strong-willed young man. She stood still for a moment, as if the princess who had lived like a faded shadow in the palace that day was stirred by this young man. She blushed and smiled softly, Willem, that man looked at me, and smiled. Meanwhile, Rennie stepped out of the room, secretly rejoicing, finally, we meet again, Michael Alesh. His legs are now trembling, and his life must be miserable.
My previous life was like that, and I've returned to take revenge on him. I will end your life, Alan. I will show you what hell is like. As she walked, Rennie pondered on how to please the old king in the tea party happening in an hour. Hmm, first, the king needs to recognize Willem as his new son. Lost in thought, she only realized Anzen was calling her. He wanted Rennie to show him something. Hmph, the price for lending soldiers to Glenda was for her to provide evidence of Willem's identity with a glass gemstone. But right now, Rennie needed to keep it to present to the king at the tea party. This needed to be conveyed meaningfully and avoid the scrutiny of the public eye. So she simply left Anzen with a cryptic statement, Amorous blooms in season. He was puzzled by her words, Amorous is the name of the first emperor, and that flower is also drawn on the royal crest. She says it blooms in season, meaning she will offer something even more valuable than a glass gemstone to prove Amorous's identity. It's strange, she always says incomprehensible things like that. But he nodded in agreement nonetheless. Rennie felt quite exhausted from her encounter with Michael and the court formalities. Willem stood by her side, gently asking, Rennie, there's a room prepared for the Lord, go there and rest. How did you know about that? She asked, curious. Because I've been in many battles, I've learned to pay attention, Willem chuckled sheepishly, blushing like a puppy wagging its tail. Azen, witnessing the warm scene, shuddered. It's rumored that the Lord of Leden has fallen for a young knight, so it must be true. Well, I just want to quickly receive the glass token and go home. Willem approached and opened the door courteously, saying, Rest now. Thank you, Willem, Rennie said, looking at the glass token in her hand, full of unease. This token could only be used once, and after passing through the glass gate, it would shatter into pieces. But it remained intact because of Willem. This evidence showed something certain, Willem was a member of the royal family of Allen. Rennie tightly grasped the token with the belief that with it, she would gain the emperor's trust. Lost in thought, suddenly Willem knelt before her. Rennie, can I accompany you to the tea party? You never know, someone might be trying to harm you. Right now, using force is the best way to destroy Leden. If you, as the Lord, were assassinated, Leden Castle would collapse, and we would need to be prepared in case the Emperor decides to kill us. Rennie hesitated, did mystery teach you these things? No, I realized it on the battlefield, he lightly laughed, countering his own words, but I think the likelihood of the Emperor assassinating us is very low. Rennie, it seems the old man really likes me. She was puzzled by Willem's straightforward words. I think so too, she replied, feeling a bit sorry, then asked him, Willem, do you expect that, to become the emperor's son? I don't know either, Rennie. This matter is too complicated, so I'm not sure, he became sincere. Rennie playfully pinched his cheek, pretending to be annoyed. Why are you joking now? Willem smiled faintly, I'm not joking, he confidently rested his head on her soft thigh, then softly said, Rennie, help me decide. Right now, I just want you to kiss my forehead. Rennie immediately blushed, oh. Damn it, I remember that moment again, my mind went blank and I didn't know how to react. Willem withdrew a bit and became serious. You should go outside or do something. I need to rest, Rennie was embarrassed and quite tired, needing to escape this awkward situation. Alone in the room, she lay on the bed, thinking to herself, it's difficult to think, I don't know what to do with him. In the palace's flower garden, the old king had been waiting for Rennie since morning. Come here, Countess Linlokin, he said gently. Seeing the king address her as Countess, Rennie was quite pleased, perhaps he didn't intend to behead her immediately. Willem helped her sit in the chair. The old king glanced at him, all right, your name is Willem, isn't it? I heard there's someone in Leden nicknamed Thunder, you sit too. Rennie was surprised by the king's sudden kindness to a lowly stranger. If she had known about this opportunity earlier, she would have carefully groomed Willem for the palace rituals. But contrary to her worries, Willem behaved exactly as she hoped. 
The old king placed the teacup on the table and began, Count Lenelkin, although our relationship has been strained after regrettable incidents, let's forget the past. I won't prolong this, I'll be straightforward. I will restore all the rights of Count Lenelkin, except what has been granted to Michael. Your family's land and property will also be returned to you, including your father's serfs. But before that, can you show me the birth certificate of this knight from your house? Confidently, Rennie replied, Of course, your majesty, I'll have it delivered to you directly. She had prepared for this moment. Rennie handed the birth certificate to the king. But it's just a fake. The real important thing is this glass token. Watching the scene between the king and Lord Leden, all the courtiers whispered, What's going on? She seems to be returning as the king's daughter-in-law. Ignoring the whispers, the old king smiled contentedly, Well done, you've returned to the capital. When the old king received the birth certificate and the glass token, the secret transaction was completed. With this deal, Rennie gained special trust from the emperor. In a luxurious room in the palace, the warm fire was roaring. Rennie lay on the bed, lamenting, Today has been a long day, there's so much to do, and it never ends. Willem said, I heard I'll be officially knighted at the feast. If so, I need to prepare clothes for both you and me. Rennie was puzzled, how does he know about that? Even earlier, the way he behaved ceremoniously with the emperor, I should ask him. She sat up and ordered the servant, hmm, go out for a while, I want to talk to Willem alone. Seeing this, he asked, is this okay? Rennie, if you're alone with a man at night, others will gossip about you. Rennie cheerfully replied, haven't people been gossiping that we can't be separated? Willem, unable to refute, became annoyed. Fine, but I've raised you since you couldn't even speak, so to me, you're more like a spoiled child than a woman. Willem became frustrated and angry, intending to leave the room. But before Rennie finished speaking, Willem's steps approached. He leaped onto the bed and pushed her down. Did you call me a child? His cheeks reddened momentarily from her teasing. Rennie held back a laugh. I understand, Willem. I've been embarrassed before, too, when my father called me his little apple pie. I'm sorry for teasing you in front of Michael. Willem still felt a bit annoyed, it's not about that. She cheerfully reassured her companion, it's okay, really. People often talk behind my back anyway. Willem hesitated for a moment, his cheeks still flushed, awkwardly telling her, we're only eight years apart in age. Right, she agreed with a smile, acknowledging her young suitor's concerns. Willem persisted, I'm serious. But Rennie just chuckled nervously and changed the subject, saying, There's something more important though, how did you learn about your lineage? With a serious expression, she looked at him. He suddenly covered her mouth, Willem's emotion still complex, both gentle and irritated, Do you know what, Rennie? Kids usually hate being grilled by their parents like that. He then left the room, leaving her alone. She fell silent, feeling a bit disheartened. I'm sorry, Willem. Because you're the only one who knows me as I am, it's natural that you might think I'm fond of you. But because you're my only card, I can't bind you with such fragile affection. If you knew it was ephemeral, here one moment and gone the next, then you would understand me. Outside, Willem sat grumpily on a stone bench. He loosened his collar and thought to himself, shouldn't I have confessed then? Suddenly, in the distance, someone called out, Hey! It was June Sinia, strolling with a maid. She blushed as she saw the man she liked again. Willem glanced towards her. Then suddenly, with an expression devoid of any emotion, he kneeled on the grass and respectfully greeted, I am Willem of Leden. The maid, wary, pointed her sword towards him, shouting, This is the flower garden where the princess walks every evening, leave. This is my residence, where should I go? Willem retorted calmly. The maid rebuked, how insolent. A common knight dares to. Sinia chuckled softly, restraining her maid, Gilia, this person just entered the palace today, so they may not know. Is that so? 
I apologize, Sinia said, shooting a shy glance at Willem, her admiration evident. Her cold and defiant eyes, how could such an arrogant man kneel before her? Her heart became even more chaotic, her cheeks flushed. She was indeed a very beautiful girl. Seeing Willem's annoyed expression, she continued to scold him. Sinia intervened gently for the first time, turning to Willem, this place is close to the palace where I used to stroll, so I come here occasionally. But tonight, I forgot there was an important guest, so I'll leave now. But walking here is my only pleasure, so in the future, could you leave at this time of day? The rustling of leaves echoed in the moonlit night. June Sinia's heart was now in turmoil because of this man. Willem's black eyes scanned her figure. This made her even more excited. Willem suddenly smirked, agreeing, I understand. June Sinia's eyes widened as if receiving her favorite gift, that young man has agreed to my request. With satisfaction and a sparkle never seen before on her lovely face, she turned and left with her maid, Gilia, let's go. A few steps away, she took something out of her pocket and pretended to accidentally drop it. When Willem stood up, he saw it was the handkerchief she always carried. Hmm, a handkerchief? He picked it up and looked towards the two women who were gradually leaving. But Willem could clearly feel her entire body warming up because of him. He took the handkerchief and grinned mischievously, what a quiet night it is. Two days later, at the royal palace, the organization of the welcoming feast for the new grand lord was completed. All the knights attending the banquet were dressed in beautiful and latest attire. The only one left without a new outfit was Laden's lord. But she didn't need it. What was more important was that she wanted to meet Azen. He quickly appeared with a friendly face, while Anzen looked expectant, thinking this time she would give him something from Amorous, and he could return early. However, was that she wanted to meet Azen. He quickly appeared with a friendly face, while Anzen looked expectant, thinking this time she would give him something from Amorous, and he could return early. However, before that, Rennie said she needed his help, this is personal information someone is looking for, she said. Anzen was puzzled, who is it that you're looking for? I know you didn't attend the banquet, so I asked for your help. Please rest and look for that person in the capital, she said. Anzen looked helpless, and could Rennie read his thoughts from that helpless expression? She's not giving me the water stone, but also entrusting me with a task? However, this matter was important to Rennie. The person she was looking for was the one capable of managing all the business of Hialka's territory when she lived in her previous life, and he had come to the capital. She remembered this information. She folded her arms and replied, Mrs. Sarah is old and has no business experience in Grand Lord's territory. That person is a talent we've seen in the capital before. So, if you're free, bring him here. If Laden is to become stronger, we need him. Anzen was reluctant but had no choice but to obey the orders. Um, but I have to say again, I belong to Glenna's house. So, everything I do has to be reported to the Glenatia Lord, he said. Rennie waved her hand and smiled lightly, I know, hurry up. After all, she designated him for this task to make it convenient for him to inform that old man. So the Glenatia Lord could see Rennie as a capable person. She had to let him know that Laden, even without Willem, could still be strong. Well, mentioning Willem, her heart was extremely conflicted, emotions and turmoil, it's been two days since I left the room like that, and I haven't seen him. She sat on the bed and sighed, I gave Willem time to settle his feelings. And if Willem changes his mind and leaves, I have to prepare everything to make sure nothing is disrupted, even without him, because this is my own revenge. Lost in thought, Rennie didn't notice the door to the room was opening, she was immersed in her own world, murmuring softly, Ah. At times like this, I wish there was someone I could trust by my side. Rennie remembered Mystery, a very close friend who had grown up with her since childhood, and imagined, What will he say to me? She muttered, Mystery. Willem stood outside the door, overhearing and imagining the memories that she had shared with Mystery. Images of their teenage years that Dmistry had recounted flashed through Willem's mind. 
When we were 18, I proposed to Rennie, Mystery had said. Of course, Willem imagined Mystery saying, I will fulfill my duty, my lady Rennie. These thoughts raced through Willem's mind. D mystery. Her voice echoed, sorrowful and filled with bitterness when she called his name, as if trying to drive Willem mad. Damn it, he bit down hard on his teeth, suppressing the anger rising within him. Willem pushed the door open without a word. This action left Rennie slightly confused. What's wrong with Willem? I haven't heard from him in two days, she wondered. He tersely asked her if she had met Farhan's close aide. His expression clearly showed jealousy. He dismissed both the aide and Mac from the room, leaving only him and her alone. Willem, she crossed her arms, facing him directly, her expression accusing, you truly resemble that heir, don't you? Wyndham hesitated and quickly apologized. She ordered, close the door, if you want to show your loyalty, then speak up now. I would gladly address you as your highness. Willem hesitated, no, it's not like that. But remember, a prince cannot be my husband, and from the moment I call you your highness, you can no longer be a part of my family or anything else, she clarified. Willem stood stunned, his heart wrenching as he exclaimed, Rennie, why are you like this? Do you know I didn't do it just to make you call me your highness? Rennie coldly replied, to intervene in every aspect of the sovereign lord's affairs, one must become a prince, isn't that so? Willem didn't know what else to say, feeling shaken, he hastily apologized, I'm sorry for everything. In her familiar demeanor with him, he became a pitiable dog, scolded by its master. Rennie stopped her cold words and asked, What's that in your hand? Because you need to prepare jewelry for the banquet, so. Before he could finish, Rennie snatched the box away. Give it to me, it's not the time to talk about jewelry. Willem, let's talk about something important. Today is the day of the banquet, yet you've been avoiding me. Is it because I rejected you? The sounds from her mouth left him dazed. She continued, I need you to take revenge on Michael Alesh. I've been alone for a long time, really long. He clenched his fists to control his emotions and asked, Isn't mystery by your side? He hesitated, his tone resentful, wanting to say something more. But Rennie denied, No, I've truly been alone. Do you not believe me? Willem quickly replied, No, it's not like that. I believe everything you say, Rennie. So what? She looked at him seriously. But I can't trust you. Even though you say you love me, you hide your secrets from me and don't behave honestly to win my heart. So how can you confess to me? His involvement in the capital was beyond her expectations. If Rennie had laid the groundwork more slowly and aimed at Michael after he ascended the throne, it would have been different. But because Willem had intervened in everything, the plan was ruined. Now Willem said, don't you ever think about devoting feelings to me? No matter how hard I try to help you, you still won't let me get close to you. Am I just a tool to you? What can I do for you? Rennie replied, Willem, it's not that you love me, but you desire a toy that you don't have. Rennie, he exclaimed in surprise and pain. But she continued, or let me put it more bluntly. Actually, accepting your clumsy affection is not difficult for me. Scoot, a swift and gentle movement, and Willem was suddenly pushed down onto the bed. He had never seen a Rennie whom he loved do such things. The surprise was extreme when she unbuttoned her shirt, revealing herself in front of him. Like everyone says, if necessary, I can do that with you any time. My only weapon now is you. So if you want me right now, let's do it. Instead, I can't offer you anything other than this body. Willem gripped the bed tightly, trembling with chaotic emotions, while Rennie challenged, How do you plan to do that? In Rennie's mind, she was just thinking if her pet were to show its fangs to its master, it would make the chains that bound it even stronger. And she said, Choose now. Will you accept my terms? Or will you stay with me as before? Willem's heart pounded wildly. 
He frowned, trying to control himself as she became more seductive. Suddenly, Rennie jerked as she felt something creeping under her feet. Willem spoke softly, so after the revenge is over, can you love me? He straightened his jacket and adjusted her clothes. I'll tell you something, by pushing you away like this, I'll show you a stronger trust than anything else, Rennie. Willem's quiet yet earnest voice left her dumbfounded. I love you, his eyes filled with determination and sincerity, I'll do anything to have you completely, even if it means pushing you away like this. Rennie blushed, and her heart began to flutter. It truly throbbed for Willem, unlike the firm embrace of mystery when she fell from the tree or the two nights she gave herself to Michael in the past. At this moment, with Willem, it was completely different and new. Rennie forgot all the anger and estrangement between them over the past few days. She reached out and touched his lips and his happy face as they sank into love. Willem hugged her back, as if reciprocating all those actions. Well done, Willem, his appreciation for her made Rennie sure that they couldn't go back to how they were before. In the palace, footsteps echoed into a room. The door swung open, revealing Michael sitting on the bed while June Sinia washed his feet. Ah, you're here, my queen! The woman exuded the dignity of this empire's queen, see, mother of the crown prince. When she heard that her son was unwell, she rushed here immediately. She appeared very contemptuous of her new daughter-in-law, see, who had just slithered over to her son's side. She deliberately caused June Sinia to startle and fall to the floor. Yet, Michael remained calmly conversing with his mother, paying no attention to June Sinia sitting on the floor amidst the shattered glass, listening to her speak ill of Rennie. My Michael, is it because that woman returned to the capital that you're so irritated? But don't worry, in this empire, only Michael is the seed that can become emperor. Even if that filthy thing is Lord Leden, in the end, it's Michael who will become emperor. C grasped her son's hand reassuringly. I also want to kill that woman like you do. Just wait a little longer, and when I have her in my hands, you can play with her as you please. So, endure a little longer. If our Michael becomes emperor, we'll show that wretched woman what hell is like. Her face twisted into a sinister and cruel smile as she sneered at the thing sitting on the floor. Sinia was picking up the shards of glass, aware of her gaze, but not daring to look back at the person cursing at her. Useless thing. The queen's curse made her startle. Dun Sinia looked back at the remaining shattered pieces in her trembling hands, suppressing the pain from the cut. Despite the dreadful times they were going through, the banquet proceeded as planned. Even those who mocked Rennie from afar were busy considering their allegiance to Lord Leden. And then came the formal knighthood ceremony for Willem. He reverently knelt down to receive this honor from the king. Queen C looked at Willem closely. Suddenly, she seemed suspicious because his face seemed so familiar, yet she couldn't remember where she had seen him before. The shining sword of the empire is bestowed upon Willem Kron. Hearing these words from the king, Queen C was immensely shocked. How could it be? Bits of her memory slowly surfaced. A minor noblewoman from the outskirts dared to have a child with the emperor? Burn the entire Kron family and let no one survive. Those words came from her mouth at that time. Back to reality, she looked at that young man in disbelief, Willem, the descendant of the Kron family? How? The queen completely collapsed, unable to accept this shocking truth. Meanwhile, amidst the confusion, King Michael, unaware of what was happening, asked, Mother, what's wrong? Although knowing her mother's reaction, he remained coldly detached from her distress. She cried bitterly, How could you do this to me? Betrayal! The queen moaned in agony, collapsing into her son's arms. This further confused Michael, Mother, what are you talking about? She cried through warm, resentful tears, Krona is the name of the woman who betrayed the emperor. Michael was utterly stunned. June Sinia, who was nearby, heard every word. But instead of feeling devastated like the mother and son, she was elated and excited. Willem is the emperor's son? 
The hall and the palace remained lively, enjoying this celebration feast. Meanwhile, a courtier called Rennie to another corner per the king's instructions. Both she and Willem followed. The old king stood ready outside the balcony, patiently awaiting their arrival. You call for us, your majesty, Rennie said respectfully. My son, who named Willem? The old king asked. Rennie replied, it was his late mother, your majesty. Ah, I see, the old king used, Willem is indeed the name she would have chosen for her child. Willem glanced at her confusedly, but Rennie had her own calculations. She lied because the emperor was immersed in memories of Willem's mother. He felt powerless with only one foolish son named Michael as his heir. But now, Willem had appeared as a miracle, bringing happiness and comfort to the emperor. That lie was just to polish Willem's value. He had to become closer to the emperor. Suddenly, the old king called out directly, Rennie Deflin, I know there's a special relationship between you and your foster father who raised you. His death will surely leave a deep grudge that cannot be forgotten, no matter how many years pass. So, would only Michael's leg be enough for you? Rennie widened her eyes, enough for your revenge? She asked straightforwardly. Remembering the memories of stabbing Michael's leg, she asked, is his leg enough? Outside, the wind blew along with her resolute assertion, no, your majesty, give me the life of Michael Allen, the son of your majesty, as well. The old king chuckled, there's something everyone seems to have overlooked. I don't have just one but two sons. One is the timid son of the woman who killed the girl I loved. The other is Alan, the precious son who can do anything for my empire. Even though I don't like you, as long as you bring the prince as a replacement for Michael, it's enough. So, even though it's being exploited, I'll happily step onto the stage. I'll give you everything you want. Rennie couldn't believe what she was hearing. So, the old man doesn't hesitate to bring out his son for negotiation. The old king continued, even the life of the crown prince is ready to become a puppet dancing on the stage you've built. In return, when the time comes, you'll have to wear the princess's crown. Both Rennie and Willem were extremely surprised by this offer, but their reactions afterward were completely opposite. While Willem was embarrassed and blushing, Rennie was furious and retorted, What? Back in her private room, Rennie was still angry after hearing the irrational words of the old king. She angrily exclaimed, The old man is sick. How could he use the rumor of my close relationship with Willem? Thinking about it, she understood. Although Great Land Laden was created in a short time, it was not her achievement, but Laden's thunder, created by Willem. Therefore, as an emperor, he would be curious about why Willem devoted himself to Laden. Ultimately, when the rumors of the relationship between Laden's lord and Willem reached the old king's ears, he knew what he really wanted was her. Thinking about it, her face flushed at some unknown time. With that question at the time, perhaps the emperor had confirmed the old man's hypothesis. Willem's reaction was very sincere, no different from being caught by the emperor's weakness. He thought, if I become the crown prince, then Laden will ultimately belong to the imperial family. Furthermore, I won't be the crown prince, just the prince's wife, meaning he doesn't see me as a crown prince. No way! Rennie ordered Willem, call Anjan struggle here. He pretended not to hear. Willem, she reminded. He replied, Anjan struggle hasn't returned yet, and why do you want to meet another man with that expression? You will become my wife. Willem discreetly glanced at Rennie and blushed when he uttered that. What a failed joke! You're the only one who looks at me like that, Wyndham retorted. Anyone who doesn't look at you like that is strange, just out of the bath with soaking wet clothes, it's too much for a twenty-year-old boy. Rennie angrily grabbed his collar. What did you say to a woman nearly thirty years old? Don't embarrass me anymore. Go inside quickly. Willem groaned, now you're dragging me into the bathroom again? Don't resist. Go wash your feet quickly and return to your room, she snapped. Then let me wash your feet for you, Willem suggested. 
The sound of water splashed in the room. Willem carefully held her soft feet, making Rennie a bit nervous. Suddenly he accidentally made her ticklish, and she murmured softly, Ah. But Willem gently reassured her, Don't worry, without your permission, I won't do anything. After washing her feet clean, he gently dried them with a soft towel and mischievously kissed Rennie's thigh. Blushing, she reproached, You said you wouldn't do anything without permission. Does anyone ask permission from the gods before honoring them? Willem smoothly countered, continuing to charm her with his words. Rennie tried to change the subject to something more serious, saying, Willem, what do you think of the emperor's proposal? Willem thoughtfully replied, it's very tempting. Rennie hesitated, he's not offering the crown prince position, but just the prince's, and he will pretend to be ignorant until he's sure you're a better candidate than Michael. Willem chuckled faintly. It's all right. Didn't he say he would let you be my wife? In the end, he only cared about what he wanted and nothing else. Rennie immediately blushed, silently cursing in her heart and solemnly saying to him, I told you not to believe everything the emperor says. He's a cunning old fox. He'll pay attention and check all relationships between you, me, and Glenatia. Wind made a dismissive gesture with the wash basin. I know you're a bit upset. Rennie retorted, you speak so simply because you don't understand the nature of that old man. Willem suddenly picked her up and replied, exactly. Rennie blushed even more every day, intending to stop him, but no one could resist the cute expression of this beloved dog. I don't know anymore, so Rennie, please teach me, Willem put her down on the bed and whispered, rest well. Deep down, Rennie still felt uneasy about how Willem would accept the emperor's proposal. As he strolled through the garden, he pondered the emperor's proposition. Remembering the cunning face of the old man, Willem felt disgusted and repulsed. How dare he treat Rennie as a bargaining tool? His face revealed his anger. When Rennie genuinely smiles, a small dimple appears on her left cheek. She has never shown me that smile. It only appears in front of that man, he lamented. His heart swelled with sadness. I only wish to see her innocent smile. I only want her completely, never demanding anything from others. Inside Willem, a fire ignited. How dare the old man deceive Rennie like that? Unfortunately, I can't kill him as before. Suddenly, there was a commotion nearby, turns out it was Michael. He was wildly wielding a sword and cursing, ignoring the restraint of his young wife and the servants. In his rage, he forcefully pushed June Sinia away. Growling, you ordinary wench. Why? Do you follow and obstruct me? Aren't you? Just the same kind as them? He pointed his sword at her and threatened, if you obstruct me again, I will kill you on the spot. Sinia could only whisper an apology even though she hadn't done anything. You wretched creature! Such a nuisance! He exclaimed before leaving, after humiliating her. But he quickly paused upon hearing her thanking someone behind him. Seeing Willem, his eyes showed clear hostility. You, this villain! Whose person are you touching? Willem calmly replied, because she stumbled. He shouted furiously, I'm the only one. Allowed to touch her. June Sinia quietly clung to Willem's arm. He retorted, Ah, I'm just a fool from the Northeast. Who didn't know? Michael grew even angrier, your arrogance knows no bounds. Is that your way of apologizing? Recalling what the queen had revealed. At the party, Cronin, the name of the woman. Who had been disrespectful to the emperor. Michael trembled with anger, thinking, he knows I'm the prince, yet he behaves arrogantly like this. The more he thought, the more he resented his treacherous father, unforgivable, that instigator. Thinking so, he gripped the sword of justice tightly and swung it, I must kill him here and now. Michael yelled, die. Sinia, witnessing the scene, screamed in horror. 
Willem grabbed his wrist to restrain him. Let go of me! Michael screamed madly, but Willem calmly said, If you drop your sword, I'll let go! Michael roared like a wounded beast, I'll kill you! Willem calmly replied, If you can! Then he struck hard at the back of Michael's neck, knocking him unconscious on the spot. After witnessing the whole incident, Sinia was horrified, covering her mouth to stifle a scream. Willem caught Michael as he fell and lost consciousness. The attendants hurriedly called for help and rushed to check on him. Please forgive my rudeness. It's the best way to prevent a bigger incident. He was drunk at the time, so let's just say it's a misunderstanding. Only now did Sinia regain her composure, saying, What you just did was improper, but considering the danger you were in, I'll overlook it as a misunderstanding. She glanced surreptitiously at the young man before her. Her heart pounded wildly, seeming to want to leap out, as Willem's eyes quietly reflected her flushed face. Thank you for your concern. Willem said softly, startling her. Sinia, embarrassed, touched her cheeks as she accidentally stared at him intently. Go back to your room, quickly. Sinia hurriedly ran off without saying a word. The attendant replied, Yes, your highness. Looking at Michael's pitiful state, Willem contemptuously thought, Michael Elish, how foolish can you be? Now you're no different from worthless trash. You've completely lost your dignity. Willem looked closely, and in the darkness, his silhouette seemed to be doing just that. Humph, that filthy scum. He thought angrily. That vile creature, I will tear you apart into a hundred pieces. As he left with the attendants, June Sinia suddenly stopped and glanced back at Willem one last time. He ignored her gesture, only seeing Sinia smiling brightly like a young girl in love, before quickly leaving. Watching her actions, Willem quietly thought, some things never change. He fondly caressed the hilt of his sword and left the beautiful flower garden. The next morning, in the private chamber of the Duke's steward, Rennie was receiving a very important guest. This sweating young man was named Adert, the same person she had asked Azen to find in the capital. In his past life, he managed financial matters for the Heelkas. His visit to Heelkas was purely coincidental. Many things had changed in this life, so he wouldn't recognize her. But Renny would create that coincidence herself. She began pouring out a long speech, Hey Ather, the second son of Duke Jews, you're now a lowly financial officer. I heard you're not valued there, and obviously, as a second son, you wouldn't inherit the family. You've heard about Laden, right? I've unified six territories into one great kingdom. Hafer hesitated to respond, uh, yes, congratulations. Before he could finish, his demeanor turned cold as he listened to Rennie's proposal, I want to hand over the management of finances in the great territory to your family. Hafer was extremely surprised, but Rennie calmly pointed out the shortcomings in his great territory and mentioned an acquaintance who had recommended him. Who is it? he asked curiously. If you agree to become my financial manager, then I'll answer that question, Rennie continued to bait him. Hatha remained indecisive, thank you, but this is too sudden, so. Last year, you represented your superiors in the tax evasion case in the East, didn't you? It was indeed well covered up, I reviewed the expenditure records of the Orion Territory. Of course, these were just lies from Rennie. She had heard about this from him in the past life. At that time, Hather was directly responsible for tax collection in the Orion Territory for 20 years. He worked tirelessly at the Financial Bureau, but his superiors not only failed to recognize Hather's efforts, but also abandoned him out of fear of losing their positions. And now, Hather is trying to contain his happiness as a High Lord, someone who has never had any relationship with him before, sees his true power and worth. After taking control of Orion, I found your name in the tax documents. Turns out, you are the only one who has kept the tax records so accurately. Moreover, I can also give you what you want, Rennie said coldly and cunningly as she almost completed this recruitment. Meanwhile, Hather sweated profusely out of fear, how does she know what I want? 
Rennie quietly responded, Ather, I might seem like a suspicious flatterer, but in five years, she raised her hand, implying her suggestion, work for me for the next five years, then whether you leave or not, I won't stop you. Don't you have somewhere you need to go? He was overjoyed and immediately accepted her offer. Now Rennie had the most capable financial manager in the empire in her hands. At the same time, in a corner of the garden, a couple, regardless of challenges of status and prestige, were secretly meeting. Prince Consort, did you skip breakfast again today? You didn't eat dinner last night either. Are you feeling sick? How is that possible, after so many nights like that, not even a child? Then how could it be now? Ha ha! Indeed, is it because of the prince's palace? Sinia became agitated as she recalled the gossip behind her back. The incident from the previous night, Michael dismissed it as a strange dream when he saw the night he despised. He thought of it and cursed as usual, truly a creature lurking beneath society. Sinia found it amusing, a creature lurking beneath society? He is the one who spouts such inferior insults. Suddenly, she felt dizzy from lack of moderation in eating and drinking, trying to make it to the nearby resting place, but everything seemed to be spinning, her body almost collapsing forward. Suddenly, someone deliberately stuck out a shoe, causing her to stumble. Sinia panicked, what did I just bump into? No way! As she closed her eyes waiting for a painful fall, she realized she had stumbled into a man. His arm gently caught her. Sinia looked up and saw that familiar face. Why is he here? She stuttered, this is the prince's palace, if you trespass. Willem calmly replied, I know, I came here just to stroll and try my luck. But I didn't expect to really meet you. He handed her the handkerchief dropped that night. Sinia blushed, that handkerchief, he kept it. I only threw it away carelessly, and yet. Sinia took the handkerchief and embarrassedly thanked him. It was indeed her intention to approach him in this way. Suddenly, Willem lifted her dress and checked something. Ah! What are you doing? She stood up embarrassed and moved away from his touch. Willem looked remorseful, I apologize for frightening you, causing you harm. He grabbed her ankle, stretched it, and massaged it, making her let out a small cry. Then Willem gently said, luckily, it's not swollen but it could still swell, I'll help you inside. Willem reached out, taking the initiative, let's go. Sinia felt both delighted and worried at his invitation, I want to stay with him a little longer. But she decided to maintain her dignity and refused his offer. But before she could fall again, should I call your maid to help you inside? Sinia exclaimed, I don't need that. Feeling she had said too much, she softened her tone, no. I mean, you've helped me enough. Sinia grabbed his arm, it's not that I can't walk. I'm not that weak, and sometimes if someone can talk to me cheerfully, I can easily forget this pain. Then she boldly leaned into him tenderly. Willem sternly reminded her, others might see and spread rumors, you know. Sinia replied, I don't care, people always talk badly about me. Willem's gaze widened, he remembered Rennie had said something like that before. In an instant, he felt deeply regretful. His heart felt like it was burning in flames. But then, bap, Sinia slapped him hard, it's all because of you. Some memory surfaced as she yelled in anger, because of you, everyone talks bad about me. Willem silently absorbed every image appearing in his mind. His eyes looked disdainfully at her. And even though he was touching her, he felt he couldn't bear this filth. When he helped her to the resting place, those memories kept surfacing. Disgusting and despicable. That's why you have to listen to me. What she was saying in reality, and what she was saying in those memories intertwined. I can't forget those vividly horrifying memories. Looking up at the blue sky, Willem remembered her, Rennie, a gentle but sensitive woman. She seemed like she could cry at any moment, but couldn't. She was the one who saved him. 
If this woman were kicked out of the house half-naked, Rennie would be the type to give her own cloak to cover her instead of tearing her apart. That's why he would take this fragile body so Rennie's hands wouldn't get dirty. He would endure being tainted for her. What was Willem thinking when he tried to seduce Sinia for the sake of his beloved? And that's why that night Willem urged the woman, Sinia, to speak up. Gilia, please turn away for a moment. Yes. As the lady-in-waiting departed, she hesitantly said to Willem, I truly appreciate your meeting with me, even though I called for you so abruptly. She held up the gloves he had left behind that day and timidly said, I want to return these to you, Willem. He reached out to take the item from her hand, but suddenly pulled her closer to him, mesmerized and strong. Let me go, she whispered softly. However, June Sinia had no intention of pushing Willem away. Her cheeks flushed like ripe tomatoes. Why did you really come just to return the gloves and end up in this moonless garden, adorned and sparkling with jewelry? She barely had time to think, oh, he knows everything. Jun Sinia blushed, that, intense desire welling up within her, oh, no, I can't hold back anymore. She looked up demanding, kiss me. One day, a secret meeting in the palace gardens, was held to celebrate. Here, Jun Sinia immediately whispered her love to Willem, and from then on, they secretly rendezvoused throughout the palace. But today she heard that Willem had tortured the assassins in the warehouse for attempting to murder Count Reflin. She wondered what he had done, but the servants there had been sick for days. Sinia glanced at him and thought silently, how could such an elegant man commit such cruel acts? She asked, will you attend the prayer ceremony tomorrow? Willem gently replied, my master is going, so I must attend too. She turned and without hesitation laid her head on his sturdy arm. Willem immediately frowned and abruptly sat up, why? Willem replied straightforwardly, how could a prince consort, like you lie, beside a lowly person like me? Sinia was puzzled, lowly? You're my lover. Willem chuckled faintly, can you really say that? When did we become lovers? Sinia blushed, what? When did we become lovers? Willem said seriously, it's common for noble women to toy with knights. Moreover, you're married to the prince consort, you can't have serious feelings for a bastard like me. Sinia subtly speculated, is there any truth to that? Is this man feeling inferior about himself? She replied softly, don't think like that. I truly care for you. No, I know you only find joy when Alan's blood is kneeling at your feet. Just as the emperor's bastard appears before you, even as a lowly knight, no matter how much you jest, it's not a problem. So it's easy to approach me. He didn't finish his sentence, his eyes suddenly froze, his superb acting completely different from when he was with Rennie. She had leaned away and hugged his arm at some point. Her action reminded him of old memories. His heart pounded like a drum, his breath caught as he drowned in the sight, swoosh. Jalcinia foolishly grabbed the hand he had pushed away. Seeing herself acting out of line, Willem quickly apologized with a disgusted face. It's okay, come here, she said and pulled him back but my desire for you to kneel before me is true, she indulged in infatuation, because I want you to cling to me and confess your love to me, and also. Willem interjected, you want to see me kneel before you and kiss your feet, don't you? Junsinia was shocked, how, how do you know? She hesitantly replied, yes, that's true, I really want that. Willem decisively pushed her hand away, and Junsinia screamed, no, don't, don't push me away. He snapped, saying, it seems like you have no intention of giving up that man, do you? Jun Sinia suddenly hesitated, that man? Remembering Willem's self-conscious demeanor, she thought to herself, is he talking about Michael? I am the prince consort, so you shouldn't speak like that knowing my position. I still have the principality of Canaria, and you have your own master. She thought to herself, this man risked his life to save his master, not long ago. I wonder if the rumors about him sleeping with her are true. She said, if I chose you, instead of the prince consort, would you have chosen me? Willem scorned, at my position, could I even choose you? She gripped her trembling hand tightly, I have always been the one asking you to kiss me. Willem's gentle voice rose, I am also a knight who cannot refuse that request. June Sinia, have you ever imagined us standing before the gods, you embraced by my arms, walking under the sun? She hesitantly replied, what are you saying? I can accept anything, so stop avoiding it. Although our love in this life is doomed, I hope we will meet again and love each other in the next life. 
Willem chuckled softly, you know, Jinsinia, I have lived a life before, and in that life, I was your prisoner. She laughed, that sounds cute, but it's not effective. Now I'm very jealous of Countess Reflin, because she has you, Willem. She replied coldly. You have taken many things from her too, don't deny it, he said. It's not because I want to take them, I only want you, she retorted. Willem turned back, so what? If you want it, you have to take it, just wait and see. That night, a night so secret that even the moon didn't know, Sinia didn't truly understand the significance of that statement. However, at the morning prayer ceremony the next day, as June Sinia walked and pondered about the events of the previous night, she finally understood its significance. Rennie said that the bastard would take the knight's oath, she thought. Ha! Huh. So that finally came to light, didn't it? Didn't I say it before? The throne belongs to Michael, the Queen Mother had said, and Sinia couldn't believe her ears. If you want it, then you have to take it. The true meaning of those words was that Willem would take the knight's oath. The playful laughter of the Queen Mother and her son still echoed in Sinia's ears, they were happy that finally Willem and Laden's High Lord had submitted to them. Moreover, Willem was the most skilled knight, gaining attention from the Empire, but taking the knight's oath meant that even if the master died from an unexpected accident, the knight would be responsible for the master's family. This meant that if the master's wife was left alone after the master's death, the knight would have to marry her and take responsibility for her. Sinia recalled Willem's expression when he uttered those words, If you want it, then you have to take it. June Sinia widened her eyes, gazing intensely at her husband, Michael. A cruel thought flashed through her mind. After removing the bandages and looking at herself in the mirror, Rennie couldn't help but feel anxious as the wound still looked frightening. She touched the face-covering veil and wondered if she should leave it off for today's prayer session. After thinking for a while, Rennie decided to leave the veil on the dressing table and left the room. In the hallway, Willem was guiding her while kindly asking, You don't look well, my lady. Are you feeling unwell? Rennie replied that she was tired and couldn't sleep. So? But you still look beautiful, Willem joked. Rennie responded indifferently, Are you kidding me? Can't you see this long scar? Willem replied cheerfully, How can such a small scar diminish your beauty? He smiled. Okay, but you're about to take the oath. If you don't swear, you can't return the body. But Willem, what if the queen doesn't return the body after you take the oath? It sounds like I'll lose my beloved knight. Rennie suddenly stopped when she heard herself speak, noticing that Willem's face was now as red as a tomato. Rennie also realized that her previous words were somewhat embarrassing, so she blushed along with Willem. He took her hand, pleading, Ha, huh, say it again, please. What? What phrase? My beloved knight? Rennie reached up to touch his flushed cheek, gently tapped his forehead, and whispered, My beloved knight, Willem. Suddenly, Rennie was startled as the two of them seemed too close. She hesitated, but Willem suddenly embraced her tightly. Rennie appeared worried. This is the hallway, many people could see, she said, as his flushed face pressed against her bare shoulder. Hmm, just for a moment, just for a moment, I just want this moment, I'm so happy, Rennie rejoiced inwardly and also returned the hug, gently saying, all right, let me know when you feel better. At the grand religious assembly, Farhan Grancia remarked, it's been a long time since Laden's lord has been seen, and he warmly welcomed her. Seeing the friendliness between the two, the surrounding guests, couldn't help but whisper, looks quite intimate. But who knows these two are subtly plotting against each other. Farhan furrowed his brows, why is it so difficult to receive military aid from years ago? Rennie also didn't hold back, if the person you lend money to dies, can you get the money back? Suddenly, among the nobles, someone exclaimed, but how is Laden's Lord Reflin's wound? Rennie and Farhan remained silent to avoid public scrutiny. Willem stepped forward and called her into the shrine. Watching them enter, Farhan sighed, no matter how many battles he wins, what good is it? He still let his beloved's face end up like that. This time, Rennie was guided to her seat with more courtesy. She silently wondered why she was seated on the outermost seat. This way, the other nobles will notice my wound more. Moreover, the queen will sit right in front of me, making it inconvenient for other nobles to approach. She slumped into her chair and sighed, indeed. Willem approached and asked, do you want to change seats? Your complexion doesn't look good. Oh, I'm fine, Rennie thought to herself, on the contrary, I should feel grateful. 
Perhaps the queen thought I would hide the wound and feel embarrassed with the bandage on my face and body smelling of ointment. But she was wrong. I have no reason to hide it. Even if I don't want to look, I'll let everyone see. Despite this wound, I am still alive. No matter what I have to go through, I will survive. I will come back at all costs and appear in front of everyone. I have to say that. With a determined spirit, Rennie still felt a bit sorry for herself because the wound looked so ugly. Suddenly, there was a call from behind that made her slightly startled. Your Majesty, Your Majesty? That's a title only used for members of the royal family. Rennie replied cautiously, that's been the title for a long time, but when she turned around, she saw a woman crying and looking shocked. Your Majesty? Rennie murmured. They recognized each other and were overjoyed. This woman named Johanna was a servant who had been with Rennie since she was very young and even when she became the prince consort. She had been by her side until being exiled to Leden, and after so many years apart, they embraced each other tightly and were overjoyed. Suddenly, Rennie noticed that there was someone accompanying her. He introduced himself as Frieder Snyder, Johanna's husband. Rennie happily remarked, Oh, so you must be Johanna Snyder now, huh? Since when? Johanna replied, Yes, Your Majesty, not long after Your Majesty arrived in Leden. So that's it, because Rennie had become a deposed prince consort exiled to Leden, Johanna's mother had hurriedly married off her daughter before her reputation was tarnished. Without much conversation, Rennie had to remind Johanna to return to her original place. She didn't want her to be implicated and get into trouble. Johanna's husband also seemed to dislike Rennie. When Rennie returned to her original seat, Willem asked about that girl, Johanna. From what she said, it seemed like she wasn't the person who would always be by her side. That was the face Rennie had never seen when she was in trouble in Leden. Rennie was taken aback, so he thought that way. She called him over and gently explained, sometimes we should be gentle. Human relationships are like water, they cannot be easily cut off. In her thoughts, a lost and abandoned child needed to be shown our compassion. Rennie leaned on him and whispered, after I left for Leden, it was clear that Johanna had also suffered, greatly. I was once very happy to have Johanna. Between us, no matter what misunderstanding arises, that time will not disappear. So, I understand her. Willem became silent. Shortly after, when they heard someone loudly announce, the emperor and empress are entering, Rennie urged, come on, let's go greet them. Willem remained seated and asked, are you also like that? What do you mean? His face was a bit restless, even if I make a big mistake against you, will you try to understand my anguish? It was the first time Rennie saw this side of him, but the urging voice had interrupted the conversation, just like you were gentle with others, I hope you will be gentle with me too. After saying that, Willem became melancholic. All right, let's leave this for later, Rennie, and he stood waiting for their turn to greet the royal family. After Farhan had greeted the royal family, it was their turn, starting with bowing to the emperor. He seemed very pleased as the two father and son were conversing. Rennie caught sight of that woman, Queen Ki, staring at her as if her eyes were about to pop out. Rennie whispered to herself, she must be very resentful for missing two opportunities to deal with Willem. After greeting the emperor, it was the queen's turn. Rennie had mentally prepared herself. The Lord Reflin of Leden seeks an audience with the queen, but before Rennie could finish her sentence, the queen didn't bother to greet her back and immediately walked away. Rennie only left with a cold expression for being ignored. Suddenly, a contemptuous voice rang out, that wound is quite large, isn't it? It was Michael Elesh, he looked at her with disdain, then smirked mockingly at Willem. Leden's thunder turned out to be just a passing shower, causing his master to be injured like this, what's more? Willem remained silent as he heard him speak like that. Rennie stepped forward and spoke each word sharply, Your Royal Highness, although the position of the royal family is very high, don't forget just a few moments ago, His Majesty and Leden just formed a good relationship. So, in front of me, even if it is Your Royal Highness, you must maintain decorum, isn't that right, Willem? Seeing her stand up to speak up for him, Willem was extremely happy. Michael only left with two words, get lost, then moved on to the next place. It was Princess Consort Junsinia Canaria's turn. Rennie remembered how she had once asked Michael to hand over her life to her. Although she had lost her composure at that moment, upon reflection, that woman was just a victim. Reinhard bowed respectfully and said, Reinhard Reflin of Leden. 
Suddenly, she noticed an unusual gesture from Sinia. Sinia was reaching her hand out in front of Willem, hinting at wanting him to kiss it. Her expression seemed very eager and expectant. Rennie couldn't understand why June Sinia would extend her hand in front of Willem. He silently looked at her hand. Then, he smirked and smiled, Willem Corona, seeking an audience with the princess consort, and then he placed a kiss on her hand in greeting. Sinia's hand trembled slightly with a surprised awe. She blushed and felt fluttery inside, that kiss was so intense. I'm very pleased to meet you, blushing, she held the hand that had just been kissed, her heart feeling like it was about to burst. Then Jun Sinia glanced at the woman next to her and whispered to herself, Rennie Reflin, I have one. Looking at her triumphant expression, Rennie didn't understand what had just happened. As the dignitaries were performing the prayer ritual, Rennie couldn't help but be preoccupied with what had just happened earlier. It's so strange, why do I feel so uncomfortable? The next morning, Laden's new financial manager arrived at the chamber of Lord Reflin to meet her. He brought a gift for the lady, a bouquet of roses. Willem carefully inspected the gift and confirmed that it wasn't poisoned. Hather also understood the Lord's safety concerns and felt sorry for Rennie's appearance. Hearing those elegant words, she couldn't help but praise, hmm, you really know how to speak like that, you're quite sophisticated, Hather replied, oh, no, I just took some advice, he said. While they were chatting, he suddenly felt a terrifying aura and looked to the side, hmm, the gaze of Willem Corona, he was trying to observe that night, black hair, sharp facial features and angles, black attire, and the gloves he was wearing. No matter how he looked at it, it seemed like they had met somewhere before. Suddenly, he caught Willem's irritated expression and threatening gaze. What are you looking at? he exclaimed. Oh, I'm sorry, I was lost in thought, so I... Willem became annoyed, thinking that he should think when he's alone. Rennie hurriedly tried to ease the tension. Willem, we will have to meet each other often in the future and reconcile. Hather, come here, he could only tremble. Yes, sir, sitting and chatting at the tea table, Rennie was very happy that they had finished preparing everything to leave the capital and work together. However, the Grand Tongue sect was a seven-day event to pray for the seven gods of the empire. The important thing was on the last day of the event, the Grand Dignitaries would pour holy water over the head of the celebrant. This meant that any bloodstained sins would be washed away, meaning Willem, being a bastard, would be recognized as officially part of the royal family. But then, Willem would have to fulfill the oath of the Chevalier, and she would have to see how the old king would react. Because of some things, I plan to stay after the event ends, Rennie replied. Hather wiped the sweat off his forehead. Could it be true that the knight is actually the emperor's illegitimate son? He pondered silently, but he only muttered to himself and then dismissed the thought. Rennie then pulled out a large bill and said to him, My mother, Countess Reflin, has a variety of jewelry. Initially, it was sold to Johanna, the daughter of Count Miller. But his wife sold it back to raise dowry money. It was urgent at the time of the sale, but now we might face some difficulty recovering it, and I want to remind you of this. Hather frowned. I am a financial manager, not a hired soldier, madam, he retorted. Rennie replied, I don't trust hired soldiers. Anyway, it's getting late. You should stay here for dinner. Oh, well then. Before he could agree, Willem intervened. It's already late, he said. Rennie looked at him with a questioning look. Do I have any other appointments, Willem? Altia's high official wants to visit Laden's grand lord and congratulate you, he responded. But didn't you say my lord could come any time? The only available time is tonight, Willem explained. Upon hearing this, Rennie didn't inquire further, she just made plans to have dinner next time. Hather also bid farewell respectfully, kissing Rennie's hand. Hather stole a glance at the knight nearby, noticing Willem emanating an intimidating aura as if he wanted to devour him alive. Let go quickly, he seemed to imply. Hather understood and hastily made his way out of the room, calling out loudly, Oh! This matter is too difficult. Farewell, Sir Corona. Despite his fear, Hather felt a surge of anger. Walking down the corridor, he thought to himself, I can't stand him. Why does he control the Grand Lord and pay so much attention to me? He may be a knight, but he treats his master like a lover. I've heard rumors between them. But it seems that knight is unilaterally in love with the Grand Lord. Thinking this, Hather stopped in his tracks. Wait, something's odd here. If Willem Corona is unilaterally in love with his master, then what about that day? 
On a calm, cool evening, while Hathor was enjoying the pleasures of life in a drunken stupor, he witnessed an unforgettable scene, two figures lurking behind a tree. He recognized them as the crown prince and another man. Why was he holding the crown prince? Hathor stood dumbfounded, pondering what to do. It was none other than the crown prince. Should he report this to the Grand Lord? But when he thought of Willem's fierce expression, Hathor shuddered and prioritized his own safety. Besides, one couldn't be certain of anything when intoxicated. The best course of action for now was to pack up and leave the capital. Hathor took out a letter from his pocket, inside was a note from a girl advising him to meet the Grand Lord with flowers. He secretly rejoiced and resolved to start anew in Leden's Grand Domain. Back in their private chamber, Willem was expressing his intention to brush the hair of his lady. He had seen her do this several times, and was confident he could help. With each soft strand of hair lifted in his hand, the room suddenly echoed with Rennie's voice. Oh, where did you learn that, Willem? I heard that noble ladies have servants, to massage them. You're not a servant to massage, Reinhard retorted. If you want, I'll definitely do my best, Willem replied. Rennie looked amused. So now I have another servant? Anyway, you do like to joke around. Suddenly, Willem reached his arm around her waist, pulling her closer, and kissed her on the lips. This caught Rennie off guard. Willem teased, is this different? Don't ignore the man pursuing you. After a meticulous while, he finished braiding her hair. Despite still being annoyed by his teasing, his sweet words warmed Rennie's heart. Outside the town, they rode horses together and chatted. Rennie initiated, you did that on purpose, didn't you? The dinner with Hather? Willem playfully replied, you noticed? You think I don't know your temper? She gently reminded, stop doing that in the future. I don't know why you've been so grumpy lately, Willem. Willem repeated, grumpy? I can't be close to other men, instead of Mark, you're the one who often comes to braid my hair, isn't that nagging? Suddenly, Willem's arm wrapped around her waist and pulled her closer. Blushing, he asked, am I cute like this? Speechless, Rennie looked at him. Are you kidding? Willem continued, oh, I'm sorry. You've been so affectionate with me lately, so I got a bit ambitious. But if you don't like it, I'll stop. I always listen to you. Rennie couldn't believe the extent of his embrace, and his warm breath touching her wound, causing the skin around it to redden and ache. No, her answer left Willem puzzled, why not? At this point, her ears were completely red. Stammering, Rennie replied, I. I don't hate it. They continued to swiftly ride through the beautiful cityscape. Willem happily exclaimed, I'm so happy that you've been so affectionate with me lately, so I'm really happy. Hearing him whisper behind her, Rennie felt herself growing warmer. He gently touched her wound. Actually, on the day you were injured, I planned to kill those assassins. And I also thought about whether I should hang myself and die. Should I give you this whole world and sacrifice myself for you? That day when you woke up and called me, I felt like I was walking on the flames of hell, burning my heart. But strangely, Willem lightly ran his finger over the wound and continued, since this scar appeared, you've treated me more affectionately. Even if you hate me for not being able to protect you, even if you resent me for letting you scarred, you didn't abandon me. If the owner didn't discard me, then how could any tool kill itself? Rennie couldn't say a word. Willem continued to confess, I'm sorry, Rennie. Every time I look at the wound that makes you suffer, I realize that you love me more. I love you. Compared to the first meeting, compared to when you told me stories, compared to when you gave me the sword, compared to yesterday, today I love you even more. I only love you. Deep down, Rennie knew that love was useless and would eventually leave her in one way or another. She knew that this man would ultimately swallow her in the depths of darkness. But even so, when Rennie realized that she couldn't resist, she immersed herself in this darkness. So Rennie had expanded her heart and accepted Willem's feelings. What awaits them on the final day of the Grand Sect Festival? Stay tuned for the next developments of the story. Cynia closed her eyes in anticipation of something, but in return, she found only a moment of quiet unease. When she opened her eyes, Willem was hesitantly looking elsewhere. I apologize, he said, pushing her aside and quickly turning to leave. This is the prince's flower garden, so you can find your own way back, right? His courteous instructions were delivered in the gentlest manner possible. 
As Willem strode away, Jean Sinia couldn't bear to leave the light she had lived in the darkness of the royal court for decades without seeing. She hurried after him, calling out. Suddenly, she noticed something fall to the ground, a glove that Willem had left behind. His trick was effective, the same way Sinia had used dropping her handkerchief as a signal to Willem. She picked up the object belonging to the prince, glancing at his fading figure. I never thought he wouldn't kiss me. Turns out he's so shy, Jin Sinia muttered, cradling the glove. Next time, well, I guess I'll have to come find him. Yes, the poor girl had truly fallen for Willem. Meanwhile, in another corner, servants were carrying a coffin through the crystal gate. As promised, the emperor returned the body of Count Lilnkin's servant and restored the title of Count to Rennie. She regretted not being able to bid farewell directly to her beloved father's coffin. On the other hand, the Lilnkin territory and mansion had been taken to compensate for the prince's sprained ankle and weren't returned. Speaking of land, lords in neighboring regions near the Liden Grand Land were wondering whether Rennie would annex their land as well. Therefore, they sent gifts to her at the royal court. In the reception room, these lords constantly praised Rennie to the skies. Perhaps you're the fastest person in history to rise to the position of Grand Lord, they exclaimed. Thanks to your excellent knights, right, Willem? After a moment of silence, he spoke up. I'm just doing my best as a close attendant. Even if I were to offer you any precious gem, you would remain indifferent. Rennie was slightly taken aback, remembering the banquet celebrating the Grand Lord. Willem had given her a jewelry box, but Rennie had set it aside. Why was he still holding on to that? When the lords left the room, she looked up at him and asked, Willem, I refused your jewelry at that time, so are you angry? He denied it, of course not. How dare I be angry? But looking at Willem's expression, Rennie thought to herself, liar, clearly he's upset. At times like this, he acts like a child. At that moment, she decided to decisively reject Willem's feelings, not because she didn't feel guilty, but because she intentionally wanted to hurt him. She thought that maybe when he no longer had feelings for her, she would happily accept the jewelry and his heartfelt intentions. A week later, the emperor summoned them to speak, but unlike before, this time it was in a more secretive and private manner. First, accept this, after the emperor's words, a servant presented a box to Willem, this is the Maris badge only given to members of the royal family. Willem casually slipped it into his pocket without examining it closely. His entire action left the emperor disappointed, who sighed softly and ordered the two to follow him. As they entered the hall, Rennie noticed a beautiful painting, depicting the first emperor of the Amorous Empire, Dana Alesh. The painting, a gift from one of the queen's lovers, had no official portrait because she was too busy and couldn't stand the constraints. If she were too busy, she would jokingly say, I've lived nine lifetimes already. As Rennie scrutinized the portrait further, she wondered if such a busy woman had time to write a history book. The book had been forgotten in the cold and harsh land. Was it really written by the first emperor? Suddenly, she noticed something strange. A ring? Didn't she see it somewhere before? While pondering this, she heard his call, Rennie. She hurriedly followed, Oh, I apologize, your majesty. I'm deeply grateful to witness the portrait of the first emperor. I understand, the emperor replied cheerfully, patting Willem on the back, destroying the barbarian tribes was the great queen's wish, and I'm delighted to have accomplished that during my reign. Willem glared at the old man, but he continued cheerfully, besides that, the queen still has other wishes. It's said that the ice dragon sleeps peacefully on the prime mountain range, covered in snow and ice, making it inaccessible to humans. The queen desires to cross the Bram Mountains more than finding out if the dragon truly exists, because nobody knows what lies beyond the Bram Mountains. So, before closing her eyes, she jokingly said she would end her tenth life in the Bram Mountains. Willem eagerly asked, where are the portraits in the royal family tree? The king chuckled, ha ha, you seem very interested. Right when I was about to show you. Over here. On a wall hung portraits of the emperor, the empress, and Michael. The empty space next to them used to belong to Rennie, but it had been taken down and burnt to ashes. The current prince consort was Jun Sinia, yet her portrait was not displayed. Rennie silently thought that indeed she wasn't recognized by the royal family. The king continued with a cryptic remark, the royal painters are very busy now, and they will be even busier later, as they have to paint one more portrait. Rennie looked at the king and wondered if he planned to hang Willem's portrait before Jun Sinia's. Why? There was no reason to refuse this. 
She glanced at him, reminding him, Willem, what are you doing? Quickly thank him, but noticed a strange expression on his face. He hesitantly asked, where is it? Where is Rennie's portrait? The king suddenly stopped, what did you just say? Rennie quickly intervened, Laden is a remote place, so there hasn't been any portrait made yet. Therefore, if there is one, I intend to take it there. The king smiled again, ah, I see. Since you are also a grand lord now, you should have a portrait. I will introduce you to a good painter. Rennie beamed, thank you, your majesty. The king didn't pay much attention and continued to show them other things. Back in their private room, Rennie pulled him aside to question, why were you suddenly like that? How could the portrait of a rebel criminal like me still be? Willem quietly apologized, I'm sorry. She frowned irritably, be careful from now on, because the emperor is suspecting whether his son's mind is sound or not. The current prince consort is a man distracted by beauty and makes foolish decisions. Willem, you have to show that you won't be like that, because one of the reasons the emperor welcomes you is this. Rennie changed the subject, all right, how long until the great sect festival? Three weeks, ma'am, he replied. The great sect festival was a prayer event held every three years over several days, organized at various temples across the capital, attracting nobles and commoners from all over the empire. The emperor's direct invitation to such a major event clearly aimed to confirm Willem as his son. Rennie declared boldly, I intend to use you to challenge Michael, to tell him that if he wants the throne, he must seize it himself. She continued, three weeks from now, the battle for the throne will begin at the festival, and we will snatch the golden throne from Michael Alesh. Are you prepared to witness Michael Elish struggle with pain and humiliation? Willem fell silent. The gentle and kind girl he once knew had always struggled with hatred and had used him as a tool for that purpose. Willem's eyes glazed over. He silently resolved to fulfill this revenge. He knelt down and kissed her hand, it's done. I'm prepared. After leaving the room, Willem remained immersed in his thoughts. If you ask me if I can do it or not, I can only do as much as I can. If you say prepare, I'll prepare. If you say win, I'll win. Everything I do is for you. Because. As Willem approached a building, he was stopped by a soldier. The soldier hurriedly explained, Sir Willem, this is the royal warehouse, even if you're a knight appointed by the emperor. Willem reached into his pocket and pulled out an object. If there's any issue, I'll take responsibility. The soldier panicked, amorous, card. Willem boldly walked into the warehouse, where there was an object he desperately wanted to find. Pulling aside the curtain, he beheld Rennie's portrait, radiating beauty and purity. Willem gazed at it and whispered, because she is my salvation. He lifted the portrait tenderly, because she is my redemption. In the imagination of a worshipper, Rennie appeared as a benevolent goddess, bestowing blessings upon him. Willem trembled as he reached out to receive that grace, each drop of sweat falling to the ground. His cheeks flushed slightly red after those sweet imaginings, then he trembled, with regret for the fleeting moment. Willem remained kneeling, gazing at the beauty of Rennie. Because she is my son. The next morning, he escorted Rennie, for a walk in the palace gardens. Suddenly, from a distance, came a call, Oh, Grand Lord! Rennie cheerfully greeted back, Oh, unexpectedly meeting you like this, Hather! As Willem glanced at the unfamiliar figure, he was greatly surprised by their appearance. Seeing Rennie there, Hather appeared very friendly and respectful. My lord, are you kidding me? As he watched Hather warmly interacting with her, Willem's face darkened. Brown hair, green eyes? That appearance seemed to remind him of someone else. Oh, I forgot to introduce. Come here and meet each other. Hather, this is Willem Krona, you must have heard of his name. Willem, this is Hather, the new financial manager of Laden Grand Territory. After exchanging greetings and conversing, Hather and the others left. Willem eagerly asked, how did you manage to pull that person in? I asked him. He's a good asset. An asset, he asked. Well, there was someone available. Now let's go meet that person. A few minutes later, the personnel Rennie had just mentioned were sitting trembling sweat pouring from their foreheads as they stared at the amorous card. Anzen, holding the card, muttered, I've confirmed it, sir. It's not counterfeit, it's indeed the amorous card. Rennie casually replied, counterfeit? What nonsense. As agreed, the lineage has been proven. Since the objective has been achieved, you'll return to Glenatia, won't you? 
Anson hesitated slightly, that was the plan, but. He placed a letter on the table. I received this from Glenasia, Mr. Farhan said. I'll be heading to the capital. I'll attend the Grand Congregation and take the opportunity to examine the amorous card. After the conversation with Anzan concluded, Rennie sank deep into thought. The Count of Glenia was curious about our plans. Among the two princes, Glenna would undoubtedly stand with Willem, as not just one or two lords harbored resentment towards Michael. Glenna would gather those lords and oppose Michael in the upcoming struggle for the throne. Rennie pondered, the stage for all these events being the Grand Congregation. In a private chamber, Rennie discussed with Willem about the Grand Congregation. Lords with significant military power would flock to the Grand Congregation, and the Emperor intended to draw them into the upcoming power struggle. My lord, I will kick off the battle and position you at the forefront. Even if you die, the Emperor won't consider it significant. Do you know why? Willem casually responded, because we still have the crown prince even in death. Exactly, on the contrary, if Michael dies, only you remain, and you'll be the heir, a scenario unprecedented in history with the backing of both grand lords, Rennie cursed the tyrannical emperor silently. Despite sitting on the golden throne, he's directly pushing his children into a deadly battle. Rennie asked in confusion, I just can't understand, don't you feel anything? Willem nonchalantly replied, feel what? I should even be thankful to him. Puzzled, Rennie asked, thankful? What do you mean? Suddenly, she blushed as Willem unexpectedly peeled a grape and fed it to her. As his finger left, the sweet taste lingered, surprising her. He calmly licked the residue off his finger. She quickly covered her mouth and stammered, What are you doing? Willem evaded the question and focused on the main topic, Of course, I'm grateful for the opportunity that old man has given me. Still perplexed, Rennie asked, What do you mean? It's an opportunity, an opportunity to decapitate Michael Alash and present his head to the public, Willem explained. Rennie widened her eyes, yes, surely Michael will die in the Emperor's struggle for the throne, but. She coldly interrupted herself, sorry, Willem, the one to decapitate Michael won't be you, it'll be me. Even if you kneel and kiss my feet, you should only do what's necessary, don't say meaningless things. Willem teased, if you want, I can do that right now. Rennie hastily cut him off, stop it, blushing, she gestured elsewhere, it's late, you should go to rest. Willem chuckled softly at the adorable sight of the girl as she left the room. He recalled the day he went hunting with Dmistry, who had said, love isn't as simple as you think, it's much more complex and difficult than you imagine, surely, when you grow up, you'll understand. Dmistry's image lingered in his mind, Willem muttered to himself, I know more, I understand much better. The feeling of that love. One day, Rennie was extremely shocked when she heard some shocking news, Lady Sarah had sent her a message from Leden. As soon as they lowered your father's coffin from the carriage, I heard a strange noise. If there had been a body in the coffin, it couldn't have made such a noise. To be cautious, I opened it, but there was nothing inside. Upon hearing this, Rennie felt dizzy and collapsed onto the floor. The servants exclaimed, My lady! In her daze, she recalled the moment the coffin was wheeled through the glass gate. Rennie believed the thief acted immediately afterward. Despite being bedridden due to illness, she struggled to instruct Mark, search thoroughly from the glass gate to the Leden territory. Whatever it is, we must retrieve my father's remains. Outside the room, Willem's voice sounded, Rennie, it's me. As he entered the room, Rennie noticed something in his hand. Willem handed her a letter, which had been left at the door. Rennie opened it and read each word, To the esteemed Lord of Leden, I wish to return the body of Count Lilken early tomorrow morning. Let us meet at the cemetery, where Count Lilken is buried, but be sure to bring along an escort night. At the cemetery, before dawn, the two arrived as requested. The wind held, adding an eerie atmosphere to the dark night. Rennie was wrapped in a cloak, provided by Willem, who knew she was still unwell and helped her avoid the cold wind. Willem, I'm dressed adequately, it's okay, she reassured. But he insisted, I feel uneasy. Suddenly, a voice from ahead interrupted, a beautiful relationship. Just as rumored. Reflexively, Willem drew his sword defensively as a figure approached. Long time no see, Miss Reinhard. Despite the darkness, she recognized the voice instantly. It's me, Eric. I don't know if you remember. Eric Mayer, he was the son of our family's distant relatives. Rennie recalled him immediately and felt a sense of dread. 
When you stabbed Michael and were imprisoned, he stole valuable things and fled. She replied coldly, I didn't expect to see you here. Eric hesitated, What do you mean, Queen Castri? I'm simply here to welcome my father. Your father? Rennie was surprised. Yes, that's right, Eric revealed. You've become the queen consort, so the true heir of the Lilkin family is me, Eric. Rennie sneered, You? Eric felt a chill down his spine, sensing the deathly aura emanating from her, causing him to tremble. Despite his threatening words, his voice sounded like he was about to cry, Yes, compared to an adopted child like you, I have more rights to inherit the Lilkin family. Rennie retorted, All right, so even if you kill me, people won't think it's the queen's scheme, but a power struggle within the family, right? Eric exclaimed, Kill? I never said that. Rennie affirmed, Will the queen spare me? No, she won't. He blurted out his thoughts, Stop pretending to be oblivious. The queen mother ordered me to call you out here. Never did she mention killing you. He shouted, but failed to notice the knight behind him preparing to strike. Rennie noticed the anomaly and shouted, Wait, Eric. He continued boasting about his future as the Lord of Lilkin, unaware of the impending doom. Only the sound of a swift sword cut through the air, followed by splattering blood, echoed in the deserted cemetery. The knight pushed him away from his sword. Eric fell to the ground without a chance to utter a word of protest. This decisive action of the group left Rennie extremely bewildered, but immediately, Willem embraced her and fled from them. It was then that Rennie realized the atmosphere had been strange from the start. She exclaimed, Willem, those weren't Eric's people, they were the queen's. He simply replied, yes, then focused on running to find safety. She thought to herself, from the beginning, the queen never intended to hand Lilkin family over to Eric. The queen, the woman always seeking to thwart us. When Willem found what seemed like a safe spot, he urged her to sit in a corner, while he drew his sword to confront their pursuers. Just stay quiet and endure for a moment, he instructed. In the cemetery's darkness, blood seeped into the ground, and the sounds of swords continuously echoed as Willem faced the assassins. Rennie watched Willem's figure under the moonlight, the metallic scent of blood lingering in the air, reminiscent of Willem's demeanor on the thunderous battlefield of Leden. Suddenly, he noticed something approaching her rapidly. His eyes widened in terror, Rennie, just as he shouted her name, an assassin closed in on her, leaping straight at her with a sword drawn. A drop of blood splattered across her horrified face. Despite his attempts to deflect the sword, the enemy still managed to land a blow on Rennie's neck. It grazed her. The assassin attempted another strike, but before he could, a sword thrust into him, all of which Rennie witnessed. Willem had swiftly dealt with the assassin. Surveying the blood-soaked scene, she only sensed one thing before collapsing, the overwhelming smell of blood. Willem caught her and called out loudly, Rennie, Rain. He gently sat her down and anxiously asked, Are you all right? Her blood loss-induced dizziness left her with a blank mind, her face pallid as she called out his name. Willem, holding her hand tightly, his face tense with anger, gritted his teeth, how dare they? Rennie, sensing his primal fury rising, quickly tried to calm him. Willem, I'm okay. Are you injured? His voice softened. I'm fine, he said. His rage subsided slightly as he whispered, you can't walk. Can you? Willem regained his composure and fulfilled her request. Suddenly, soldiers approached from a distance, causing a commotion. Lord Lilkin, are you all right? Please hand this place over to us. Riding back home, Rennie was held in his arms. She recalled a conversation with Wynne Crona from her past life, when they discussed providing soldiers with shelter and provisions. He had said, I hope you'll provide the soldiers with a place to sleep and food. At that time, Wynne was returning from defeating the barbaric tribes in the Great Northern Territories. Rennie initially thought Michael had sent him suspecting she was preparing for war. Yet, despite that, she allowed him into the territories, feeling him to be much larger and rougher than the Willem of now. Rennie had heightened vigilance, but Willem remained cold and cautious. She couldn't recall exactly how she talked about Michael, but she knew she had made a mistake that day. Facing him, she said, So, will your loyalty be rewarded? Even if the Knight's Oath doesn't exist, why has the Emperor sent you beyond the borders for over a year? Willem replied, His Majesty is just using the right tool for the job. She retorted, Do you truly believe that? Why, then, do you think about the tool called the Deposed Prince Consort? Do you think it's being used appropriately? 
A soldier, sensing her disrespect towards the king, interjected, watch your words, but a hand stopped him, the feast ends here. It seems the lord has drunk too much. As the two left, Rennie held the wine bottle, secretly mocking the fool. If I were you, I'd tear Michael apart and kill him. That crown might not be Michael's but yours. She finished the wine and grew even more furious, a fool, enduring despite being manipulated. If I were him, things would be different. If it weren't him but me, then. Rennie woke up from her long past dream, a gentle voice in her ear, you're awake, Lord. The guard replied. After recounting the incident, Willem's face showed deep concern. Rennie lay on the sickbed, unable to hide her shock. What's wrong? As her body recovered, Rennie sat alone on the bed and blamed herself for nurturing Willem like this. Recalling what Mark had said, earlier Willem had tortured the captured assassins. That night, Dmistry had advised her to view people as chess pieces. Now she understood the meaning behind those words, that emotions shouldn't be given to pawns. If seeking revenge, one must be resolute. Yet, in her heart, Rennie still felt conflicted, though I deeply love Willem, I've coldly used him and demanded his maturity for my affection. If watering plants based on mood can cause them to wither, let alone humans. Even if lucky enough not to wither, one might not develop well, Willem, she buried her face in her knees, silently calling his name, it's not too late. If it's my fault, then I must take responsibility. She commanded sharply, Mark, quickly summon Willem to me immediately. Willem's steps gradually advanced into the Lord's chamber. As he reached for the door handle, he seemed hesitant, but ultimately gathered the courage to enter the room. Did you call for me? Rennie silently watched him for a few seconds before patting the seat beside her, signaling, come here, sit, Willem. He promptly responded, I'll stand and listen. Sensing his stubbornness, Rennie softened her tone, all right, if you won't come here, then I'll come over there. With that, she stood up and walked towards him. Willem exclaimed, wait, hold on, you still can't stand up. Despite his resistance, she pulled him back, to which he earnestly said, I'm sorry, I'll come over, just be careful. Rennie gently remarked, come here, sit, I have to do this, for you to listen, right? Willem felt remorseful towards her, I'm sorry I couldn't protect you. Seeing his sadness, Rennie reassured him, it's okay, I didn't call you here to talk about that. Then what is it? She looked up into the empty space, imagining, Willem, what if I raised you in my arms gently, kindly, obediently? Winter nights wrapped in blankets, eating oatmeal while telling stories, spring admiring seedlings together, summer soaking in the water. If I raised you like that, what would happen? Willem looked at her lost in that scene, appearing melancholic, do you regret raising me like this? Rennie hesitated slightly, well, it used to be like that until recently, but not anymore. I don't regret anything, Willem, she said and reached out to touch his face. So, you shouldn't regret either. Willem was extremely surprised when the woman he loved took the initiative to kiss him, his eyes widened to confirm this reality. Don't regret anything. And don't blame yourself. I've decided not to keep a distance from you anymore, because your world is too small. It has always been just me in that world, Willem, and you've become a part of it. What I desire is only your affection. If you can do anything for me, then you shouldn't hesitate, it's right for you to do so. After that passionate kiss, Willem was immersed in love, so, Rennie, will I be forgiven no matter what I do? He intended to continue his sentence, but she stopped him. Rennie proactively called, come here. Willem immediately blushed as he understood her intention, he uttered a sound of agreement, then shyly turned his face away, but his heart was loudly expressing emotions, his body no longer obeying. Yes, Willem agreed softly. On the bed, they embraced and exchanged passionate kisses. Rennie could feel her mind emptying, her body heating up at the gentle touch of the man. Willem, he listened gently as she called him, then softly said, Come here, how can I touch someone who's injured like this? Rennie's eyes widened with appreciation, she looked at him with sympathy and joy. Willem, don't be angry, she said, then stopped laughing, he slowly spoke seriously, I mean it. Besides, I figured out how to retrieve your father's body, she turned to him, asking eagerly, how? Willem suggested implementing the vow of a chevalier. The vow was a way for a knight to directly change their master and it required three oaths, first, always follow behind the master, second, obey every command of the master, and third, not touch a single hair of the master. If he broke that vow and killed Michael, he would be severely criticized. 
Rennie replied, if so, then he won't be able to ascend to the emperor's position. Willem firmly stated, so I'll fulfill that vow in front of Michael at the Grand Assembly. Instead, I'll negotiate to have your late count's body returned. This is no different from giving up the right to inherit the Golden Throne. The Queen will find it difficult to refuse this deal. Rennie hesitated to speak, but Willem put her back on the bed and kissed her forehead, reassuring her, it's okay. Don't dodge the issue, she said. I've loved you for a long time, even when you sent me to the battlefield, or even if it wasn't a battlefield but hell. I'll still love you. I promise to present Michael's head to you. So, please love me. Seeing his demeanor, Rennie felt deeply sorry. Initially, he was just a tool, then became someone she feared, and later, trust and compassion began to form. Now, I have redeemed, I have received, I have nurtured my guilt, Rennie whispered gently, do it, I'm loving you. She looked straight into his eyes, and said each word clearly, I love you. Willem's heart felt like thousands of flowers blooming, the goddess he always worshipped, had accepted his prayer. Rennie said, I am very happy, for me and you have an unfilled gap, the sense of guilt I have towards you and your obsession with me have reconnected through that gap. Until today, we have finally connected with each other. In the corridor, the queen's long strides moved forward, that appearance is quite something. In front of so many, yet you still reveal a face with such a dreadful scar. For a woman, there's nothing more humiliating, truly shameful. The old crone recalled William's demeanor when he bowed to the king, and the old man was very pleased with that attitude. And in her mind, the queen cursed her wretched bastard son. As planned, during the entire prayer session, no one came to Rennie's side, as in front of the queen, no one dared to approach her, whom she openly despised. However, the old woman was afraid of the rumors that William was the emperor's illegitimate child, which had spread throughout the knightly order, and everyone looked at him with curious and expectant eyes. The more she thought about that bastard son, the tighter, Key's old lady squeezed her trembling hands, due to anger. That vile offspring can never become Emperor Alan again, she exclaimed, flinging open the door and barging into her son's room. Junsinia was surprised and hastily greeted, Your Majesty. But all she heard was the Queen's furious shout, This scent. This scent of censor again. With that, she swept the censor onto the floor. I suffer headaches every day because of this dreadful scent. Junsinia murmured softly, her heart pounding with fear. The queen continued to shout, speak. Just now. Why did your household do that? She hadn't understood what was going on and quickly asked, yes. Why? Don't play dumb. Didn't you just offer your hand for him to kiss? Jin Sinia, hearing this, was extremely frightened, remembering how happy she had been when that young man had reciprocated. She stammered, th that. In her heart, she was extremely anxious. What should she do? If she said anything, she would be investigated if the scandal was discovered, and she would be punished. Or should she keep her mouth shut under the floor? Jun Sinia still looked very bewildered, unable to utter a word. Suddenly, the seductive image of William appeared in her mind, and a thought flickered. Yes, it's better to just apologize and ask for forgiveness. Sinia replied, I'm afraid that the high-ranking nobles would think poorly if a member of the royal family behaved improperly towards you just because he dislikes them. I apologize if I overstepped, your majesty. The more she spoke, the more she infuriated the queen. Of course, you overstepped. What nonsense are you spouting? With that, she kicked the hand holding the perfume bottle. Sinia winced as she touched her hand, still listening to the queen's curses. Do you think our dignity can be damaged by that? It's ridiculous that you're only thinking of yourself when you're just a servant. Didn't you fire my son's butler? For the honor of the royal family, you shouldn't become the lover of the crown prince. Her face twisted like a demon, growling angrily, in the end, Michael's foot became like this, isn't it because of you? Michael, upon hearing mother mention his twisted foot, felt his pride being humiliated. As for Jun Sinia, she blushed and felt extremely embarrassed. She was about to continue humiliating her, 
But Michael shouted, Stop it, my body is already weak, and you're making me dizzy like this? She hesitantly replied to Michael, I did it for you. He turned purple, yelling loudly, That wretched bastard. Anyway, on the last day of the Grand Divine Festival, he will make a vow with me in front of everyone. Feeling that the queen had listened to him, his voice softened. You yourself said, wait until I become emperor, when I ascend, I will kill that wretched Rennie. Before that, I will strengthen your protection, so don't worry. Queen Ki gently embraced him, oh Michael, my beloved son. His lips murmured softly, I always feel very grateful to you. Then he turned to instruct his new wife, Jun Sinia, this afternoon you will meet with the abbots of the Hungsi Shrine, right? You must be tired, so you should go down first. Sinia bowed respectfully, yes, your highness, your majesty. Then, Michael whispered again to his mother, as always, he only thought of himself when his wife was humiliated. Sinia quietly walked down the long, dark corridor. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. No matter what, I know that actually, because Michael is the crown prince, that's why I seduced him. Sinia smiled through tears when she saw her beloved standing there in the garden full of flowers and warm sunshine, the name Willem rising like the only hope and solace for her. Sinia hugged him tightly, feeling pain when thinking of her wretched husband. If he weren't the crown prince, I would never have slept with someone like Michael. Willem asked with a raised voice, why suddenly? She, jealous, replied, don't act as if you belong to another woman in front of everyone, you belong to me. Sinia continued to whisper, will you really make the vow of chivalry? Willem, hesitating, replied yes, confirming the queen's words. He opened his arms behind him and silently resolved, I have already taken something from Rennie. The first time is difficult. From the second time onwards, it will be easy. Sinia looked up and whispered, I will do that so you won't cling to other women anymore. On the third day of the Grand Divine Festival, the nobles gathered at the shrine of the goddess prophet Hunsi. But men couldn't enter the shrine of the goddess, because Hunsi hated men. Therefore, only priestesses, women, could enter the prayer hall. Is what Johanna heard true? Rennie turned back and asked. Her friend replied, you're still pretending. This time, not only do you have the title of Grand Sovereign, but you also have love. Don't sugarcoat it, Johanna. This made Rennie bristle and flush with embarrassment. What are you talking about? Come on, let's go. Look at my former mistress running away in shame. Johanna became even more amused, I heard he's a very young and brave knight, isn't he? Then she deliberately whispered in Rennie's ear, he still looked very handsome just now. The more she angered, the faster she walked, if you keep talking nonsense like that, I'll leave you behind. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm coming with you, Johanna confessed, I'm glad to see you seem to be getting along well with that night. Rennie embarrassedly replied, I'm not sure how things are between us anymore. Johanna was surprised, what? Why? She hesitated to explain, because I've always seen him as my little brother. I always felt like I raised him like my own son. He hasn't even found a good master. Johanna was speechless, it seems like you're not being honest. Do you think so? Well, let's not talk about this anymore. But he's a brave knight, Rennie blushed. Brave, huh? What do you mean? Yeah, yeah, just, um, just that he's quite cute. Johanna sighed and shook her head, my dear, you're really falling for him, Rennie exclaimed softly, what? Her friend continued, men as handsome as him are great, but we can still leave a guy like that. However, if you find a mature and charming man, it means you're completely in love with him. Johanna took her hand and seemed very excited, congratulations, your highness. Remember to invite me to the wedding. Rennie blushed and exclaimed, stop talking nonsense. Johanna just laughed mischievously at her embarrassment. The prayer session quickly ended because Johanna had slipped a large sum of money to the high priest to avoid being detained and subjected to flattery. Rennie paid no attention to her friend's words, but pondered the goddess of vengeance Hani on the antler the lady always carried. There were fruits on it, and this type of fruit symbolized true revenge, because true revenge was as sweet and tempting as fruit. 
Rennie folded her hands in prayer, Oh, goddess of vengeance Hani, please hear my prayer, please grant revenge upon those who led my father to his untimely demise. Whether you accept this prayer or not, I want them to receive the sweet fruit of your vengeance. In the mythology of the empire, there are four gods representing the four seasons. All are known as the children of Hani, except Ant, the god of winter, who is the only one not born of Hani. On the way back after leaving the child to Altia, Hani encountered a boy, who turned out to be Ant, the son of the man who betrayed Hunxi. Despite being the son of an enemy, Hunxi felt pity for the abandoned child and took him back to her castle, to raise him. This deprived Ant of all his wealth, and he even took on the form of Ant, the god of winter, in mythology. Hani gave birth to Tsin, the god of summer. Strangely, when remembering this story, Rennie thought of Willem. That's the painting I didn't bother to look at when I was still the crown prince. I miss you, Winum. After the prayer session ended, Johanna said goodbye to her former mistress and went home. Seeing that Willem seemed unhappy with her, Rennie stood beside him, arms crossed, scolding, but his expression clearly indicated opposition. As they walked along the corridor, Rennie reproached Willem, aren't you going to say anything? You've been silent for so long. Willem hesitantly spoke up, she that maid, knows about Rennie's past that I don't know about. I envy her a lot. Rennie turned back to look at him, only to see Willem frowning and blushing, looking away, as if he could still faintly hear the sound of his pounding heart. Willem, maybe think like this, we can stay together like this, because there's a part of my life that you don't know about. I married Michael, but he completely betrayed me. Even the escort Johanna introduced threatened my life at that time. Who was there for me? Willem looked pensively at the girl in front of him as she implied about him. Rennie took his hand, when I desperately needed someone, who was there for me? Willem blushed, replying, it was me. That's right, Willem. Later, I'll be the Rennie you know. My face now is still the Rennie you know. Come on, are you still jealous of Johanna? Unable to contain his happiness, Willem trembled, asking her, can I kiss you? Before he could finish his sentence, Willem's heart seemed to want to leap out of his chest as Rennie suddenly kissed his lips. It was the first time she saw Willem's agitated appearance. He blushed, asking nervously, is your wound fully healed? Suspiciously, Rennie asked, what are you talking about, what about my wound? Willem blushed even more, you really don't know, that's why you asked. Looking at her robust figure and foolish expression. Willem struggled to reply, I hope you're not in pain anymore. Really? Of course. I wouldn't lie about your safety, would I? He gently kissed her cheek and whispered, I like you, Rennie, I really like you. Just a little more, as his hand slipped onto her thigh, Rennie quickly hugged his face, Willem, don't say that. Otherwise, she blushed, hesitated, I, I feel very embarrassed. I feel like I'm relying too much on you. Willem felt like he was on cloud nine. Rennie, you don't know how happy I am when you lean on me. He hugged her tightly and whispered, if it's for you, I can do anything, even if it means lying or doing disgusting things. Seeing the deeply enamored guy, she couldn't bring herself to tell him not to do disgusting things as all her thoughts at the moment were blown away by him. I love you, Rennie, only you forever. On the last day of the Grand Festival, people would share food of the gods. Many nobles from the Empire attended this feast on the first floor. Blonde hair like sunlight fluttered in the wind. Rennie observed everything from above while recalling the embarrassing scene from yesterday. They were about to do it if it weren't for her behaving like an innocent girl. Suddenly, Farhan approached with a glass of wine, seeming like today the emperor would declare Willem as his own blood. Just now they were here together, but they had gone to a private room. Sipping his wine, Farhan sighed, what a pity. If I had known he was a prince, I would have had him marry my sister. Rennie was speechless, say those things in front of the emperor. Farhan chuckled, oh, I'm just kidding. Anyway, you know that Corona used his lineage to negotiate with us, right? Usually, such deals lead to arranged marriages, but Corona refused outright, for obvious reasons. Do you know what he said? 
Farhan deliberately mimicked Willem's cold expression, there's a woman I want to be with. Hearing this, Rennie startled, blushed, turned away, and wondered, did Willem really say that? Farhan continued, I'm the son of Count Glencia's steward, so I have a clear way of evaluating people. At first, I thought he was just a young man struggling with his first love, but it's not that simple. Rennie tacitly understood his intention, the young master of Glenna was now trying to drive a wedge, between her and Willem. Farhan persisted, Your Majesty, we are all friends with Mr. Dmistry. Would he do this? If Mr. Dmistry were offering you a vast territory, he would have discussed borrowing soldiers with you beforehand. He wouldn't leave you indebted like this. Mentioning Dmistry made her heart beat incessantly, with longing. Yes, I also know that. If it were Dmistry. The emperor entered after the herald's loud call, followed by a handsome, impeccably dressed young man, Willem Corona. As he walked in, the nobles around immediately buzzed with discussions. Oh my, is the rumor true? How can this be, will the crown prince's status be affected? Jun Sinia Canaria noticed her and glanced at Rennie provocatively. On this side, Rennie still didn't understand the significance of that action, while Farhan remained composed. Reminding her, I hope you'll be careful. A servant who always keeps secrets from his master is not a good servant. The emperor announced enthusiastically, Behold, Willem Corona, my second son. All his sins shall be forgiven. The old king raised his hand high and shouted, Henceforth, his name shall be Willem Allen. Amidst the cheers of the old king, Farhan continued to turn to remind her, Remember, a man who keeps secrets from his lover cannot be a good man. Be cautious with him. She fully understood, I know. The fact that I am the son of the emperor, I still can't say, leave it for later. A man who keeps secrets from his lover cannot be a good man, every word of Farhan's and the memories with Willem rushed back and intertwined with each other. She widened her eyes, denying, no, Farhan, Glenna was wrong, Willem is just a bit clumsy. He's like an untamed wild animal. If I didn't know that face, I might have misunderstood him. I'm the only one who can embrace a child like him. I'm the only one who can indulge Willem like this, and that's the only way I can take responsibility for what I've done to him. She said to herself firmly. But now her whole body was trembling so much, while the Grand Hall continued to echo the king's words. Within Rennie's heart, she quietly wondered, am I shaking? At this moment, the old king looked at Willem and appeared very pleased. He exuded the demeanor of a proper prince, and the old king could let go of all worries about his successor. Suddenly, Michael stepped forward with his cane and boldly spoke, Well, your majesty, I request that my younger brother take the oath of knighthood right here. The old king was taken aback, What? I will accept that request, Willem said, then turned to a man and urged, Kindly, prepare it. Willem Allen, the old king's veins bulged, as he roared, I've just declared you a prince. If you take the oath of knighthood, you will have to renounce your right to the throne immediately. Michael retorted nonchalantly, that's what he wants, isn't it? The old king yelled in anger, Michael Allen. This shocking incident caused a stir among the nobles in the hall. Willem Allen will be loyal to the crown prince? Then will the position of the crown prince ultimately not change? Watching him kneel to take the oath of knighthood, Rennie felt very satisfied. Willem, now you'll avenge me against Michael. I've given up direct revenge with these hands, and let you do it for me. Seeing her beloved young man drifting away, Rennie felt extremely uneasy, though she couldn't bear this, she still tried to convince herself to trust him. I have to witness him complete this, my revenge with this very sword. As the oath was concluded, Michael reached out his hand in front of him to pledge absolute loyalty. Later that evening, Rennie finally got to return her father's remains. She collapsed onto the coffin. This saddened Willem deeply. Rennie, seeing him right beside her, she quickly asked, Willem, when did you arrive? Just now. The old king didn't let him leave, because he was very angry. He said the body was found by him, and scolded me for doing wrong, Rennie grumbled. Deceptive, he even pretended to ignore the fact that I was attacked, then she suddenly changed the subject, 
Willem, I'm planning to temporarily return to Leden. You'll have to work hard as a knight under Michael, so our time together will be limited. Willem appeared anxious. Rennie, can you give me a month? Hmm, fine. But you have a lot to do. Embracing education as a prince, and learning to govern a new territory, Willem insisted. Just one month is enough. Surprising, isn't it? Just one month? Our Willem is quite talented, isn't he? I can rest assured and return now, Rennie expressed. Willem, he turned away, reluctant, but yielding to her wishes. If you're really tired, you can return to Leden first. But Willem didn't let her go, holding her tighter. Rennie comforted, even if I wanted to leave, I couldn't, because the prince needs an advisor. And thinking about you not knowing what to do amidst those arrogant nobles, I feel like you're a child abandoned in the street. Playfully, do you still see me as a child, Rennie? Willem reacted, embarrassed, turning away. I've told you before. If you're tired, go back first. Seeing Willem's sulking face, she teased him even more. All right then, I'll go, Willem, blushing, Rennie called out. Only hearing her joyful laughter echoing throughout the room, I've considered Willem my lover, but the one who has given me love. Both have left me one after the other. His son has stabbed a dagger into my heart. Willem, within him, Rennie whispered softly, Will you still love me until you kill Michael? Willem became solemn, Rennie, don't you trust me? She hastily nestled into his chest. Oh, nothing. I was just rambling. But still, I have to return to Leden because this time I want to bid farewell to my father myself, she teased, don't tell me you're jealous of my father too. As she finished her sentence, Rennie was surprised by his subsequent action, blushing as he slipped something into her delicate hand. Willem, when she opened it, she was surprised to find it was the amorous card. If you're worried that my love will grow cold, I'll dispel that thought immediately, Rennie widened her eyes in surprise. The amorous card? Take this, he chuckled softly, who knows when it might come in handy. At that moment, Rennie didn't realize that the anxiety she carried within her was so small that she thought it was just a minor scratch and could heal on its own. But if that anxiety were too great, it could even cause damage to her heart. If she had known that, she wouldn't have overlooked such a big wound. On a cool evening, June Sinia and Willem met again in the palace garden. I apologize for being late. I had to sneak out, so there was no other way. Now I'm quite famous in the palace, Willem looked so cheerful that June Sinia felt very annoyed that he had to endure the torment of that old man until dawn, while the one she loved knew nothing at all. Sinia gritted her teeth in frustration, apologizing doesn't do anything. You made me wait, didn't you? But a second after she regained her composure, she noticed a red mark on Willem's cheek, from the pain. Sinia whimpered, I'm sorry for this, her face showing regret. However, within her, a sense of excitement swirled. That hand had moved on its own, and Willem smirked faintly. Sinia, are you eager for it? Her heartbeat intensified as Willem hit the mark. Want to put a leash around my rigid neck and turn me into a dog who only listens and begs for you? June Sinia broke into a sweat, that's not it. Willem continued to whisper into her ear, Ah, aren't you thrilled to see my cheek turn red from being hit? And do you feel regret too, for not being able to use those nails to scratch your face and leave some beautiful scars? Isn't that right? Willem indifferently replied, that's right. Hurry up, as he bent down and obeyed, without hesitation. Sinia's heart pounded with a mixture of excitement and horror. What do you think? Very obedient, but contrary to her expectations, Willem covered his hand and refused to kiss her directly on the lips. Why? Why are you doing this again? Willem spat out chilling words, selfish woman, don't you really know? If you want me to kiss your foot, you'll have to go to hell. Only then, will these lips touch you. Even if it's just a minor scratch, if it keeps accumulating and accumulating, then one day it will. At the Palace of the Leden Grand Territory. Meanwhile, Rennie was struggling with a pile of paperwork upon her return. Mrs. Sarah, by her side, was eager to know if Willem had received his title and returned to Leden. 
But another question from her made her extremely embarrassed, so, are you going to get married? Rennie immediately blushed and found herself in an awkward situation. Sarah intentionally teased her, but she could only cover her mouth and then hastily leave the room. Meanwhile, another servant came to report, and the lady chancellor breathed heavily, her face extremely panicked, and she said, I need to return to the capital immediately. Meanwhile, behind the curtain, a pale and shrunken hand appeared in the cold coffin. Michael lay motionless, in eternal sleep. The one who discovered his body was a servant. As usual, he came to knock on the door and brace himself to hear Michael's grumpy words in the early morning, but received no response. Upon entering the room, he realized there was a body lying on the bed. Back to Willem, after being suspected of the prince's death, he was detained. However, he was later released and taken to the palace. The queen, after losing her son, became frantic and released him. Willem only left behind a remark, the prince must be very happy, right? The queen asked, huh? What? Willem wondered if his mother who gave birth to him loved him so much. Upon hearing that, Mrs. Key became even more furious, you disrespectful brat. The soldiers exclaimed, oh. Your Majesty, please take her back to the palace, quickly. This incident caused a stir in public opinion. They heard that the servants and chefs in the prince's palace were tortured to the point of being unable to move. And the queen not only killed the Corona family, but also the families whose daughters had one night stands with the emperor. It was also believed that the Leden Grand Lord was attacked because of her actions. Therefore, her son's death was also the retribution she had to bear. The truth was that just a few weeks ago, Willem had knelt before Michael and sworn never to covet the Golden Throne. But how contradictory it was, he had now become the new crown prince. At the capital palace, Rennie had traveled a long way to get here and was stopped by the guards. No one is allowed in here, please turn back. Rennie took something out of her pocket and said, but if you know what I'm carrying, you'll have to step aside. Once inside, Rennie hurriedly searched for him, hurry up, where are you? When she saw him, Rennie couldn't help but be stunned. It had only been a few weeks, and Willem had changed so much. Willem, she exclaimed as she rushed into his arms. Oh, Willem, what's going on? Did you fulfill that oath for me in vain? Willem was overjoyed to be embraced by her. He gently comforted her, it's not your fault. I miss you so much, Rennie. And of course, it was wrong for you to leave me behind and return to Leden. Rennie angrily shouted, what time is it now that you can still joke around? Michael is dead. She had already heard the news, and he had been imprisoned in the dungeon. The queen had come to find him. All the news came pouring in at once. I rushed here as fast as I could through the glass gate without bringing any luggage. If it weren't for Mark, I don't know what I would have become. Quickly explain. Willem just hugged her tightly and kissed her silky hair, then looked at her with affection, blushing with happiness. What are you doing? Rennie hadn't finished her sentence when Willem locked her lips and enjoyed this sweet happiness. The onlookers behind them could only stand silently. Ahem. Mark's voice made Willem come to his senses. I think you should leave. A trembling soldier replied, my duty is to protect this palace. Another interjected, it's useless. The Grand Lord has the amorous card. How do you think she got in when the entire palace is sealed? As they left, Willem held on to her even tighter. Rennie pleaded urgently, stop it, but Willem continued to advance. Stop, huh? I'm not in the mood for that now, Rennie pushed him away. I want to talk to you. Aren't you happy? About what? He's dead. Rennie's voice was gloomy. It's not like I killed him, what's there to be happy about? Besides, he died in his sleep without knowing anything. She thought to herself, that bastard is gone peacefully. The goddess of revenge, Hani, didn't even give me the chance to taste the sweet taste of revenge. Why? Seeing her daughter so downcast, Willem smiled gently, Rennie, wait for me a moment. What? Follow me, I want to show you something. 
With that, he reached out his hand to lead her. In a moment, time seemed to repeat itself. The Rennie of that moment trusted him, so she followed without refusal. They walked down a passage in the palace, called the Redwood Passage, with a few guards following to escort them. Seeing her being cautious, Willem reassured her, This is my servant, you don't need to worry. Rennie asked incredulously, Aren't they royal knights? They have served in the royal court for years, and they're just guards? Willem chuckled, Ah, I mimicked you a bit, like the financial manager you hired. I did the same. At that moment, Rennie couldn't immediately understand the meaning behind his words. But soon after, the truth began to unfold as they walked towards a prison cell, and his lover, Canaria, behind the iron bars, joyfully exclaimed, Finally, you're here, my love. Rennie's expression was one of shock, and June Sinia felt the same. Ah, wait, is it you, Rennie? Sinia became anxious, Willem, my love. Why are you here with that woman? I've been so worried here, I should have killed that bitch sooner. Willem coldly retorted, don't misunderstand. I'm here because you wanted to talk directly to my master. Rennie felt a chill down her spine, her hand tightly held by Willem's grip, making her unable to move. Why hadn't she considered it? The incident in Leden wasn't the only time Willem schemed behind her back. Rennie directly questioned Willem, explain, why is the prince consort in prison? Sinia interjected, ah, right, you don't know about it, do you? During your time in Leden, Willem kept the truth hidden. Willem, my adorable coward, if you're afraid, let me speak for you. She continued speaking arrogantly, even in prison. Rennie Deflin, I've always felt guilty towards you. I stole your position and caused you unintentional pain. Rennie felt nauseous and disgusted hearing this. She continued, but I also suffered greatly by wearing the prince consort's crown, something I never wanted, and faced ridicule and humiliation. I've lived in shame all this time. As Sinia spoke, her body trembled with jealousy. In those days of hell, the thing I wanted most was only one person. And even that person belonged to you. Her face contorted with jealousy as she looked at Rennie like an enemy. Rennie seemed to understand, June Sinia, so you. Yes, I killed Michael Alash. All the pieces of the puzzle had now been put together. Willem had used her, knowing June Sinia loved him, so she willingly took the oath of the Chevalier. Rennie couldn't help but feel astonished. That's because, Rennie looked at the guy and whispered to herself, because he's also reincarnated like me. Willem remained silent until now, then he spoke, Rennie, let me tell you an interesting story. In my past life, I was that woman's prisoner. She strangled me and ordered me to kneel under her feet, then beat me until I passed out. As he spoke, June Sinia seemed to go mad, calling Willem's name as if wanting to satisfy the savage urge rising within her. In their past lives, Rennie had used it to hire Ather as Leden's financial manager, and he had done the same, using past life memories to manipulate June Sinia as a tool for revenge. Sinia was horrified as he crushed her hand. Rennie, too, couldn't help but be horrified by that cruelty. But Willem remained indifferent, then unleashed a cruel smile like never before. June Sinia's scream echoed throughout the dark dungeon. Ah. Right after that, Rennie was furious. Willem, so you've been deceiving me all along. Rennie pushed him away and shouted, I trusted you. Why did you do such a terrible thing without discussing it with me? Why? Willem simply reminded her of her own words in their past life, people are not tools. That scoundrel didn't know that. You said that, you taught me that. He smirked and looked straight into her eyes. Do you remember? Those words changed my life ever since. Rennie felt all prickly. She couldn't digest all of this yet, trembling as she asked, So, what are you saying? Is this like an act of revenge for your past life? We thought you did it for our future, Willem, or should I say, Lord Win Corona. He widened his eyes as she mentioned his past life's name. I can't understand how your own mouth could promise loyalty to Michael. Willem quickly pulled her back and yelled, Stop it, please. Don't treat me like a stranger like that. 
I only have you, Rennie. I'm only loyal to you, Rennie. This is revenge for you. He held her tightly and whispered softly, This is revenge, for you, for those who betrayed your love. I want to make them feel the same betrayal, pain, and suffering from the person they love. He hugged her tightly and whispered, Because you took my soul with you, because you took my soul, so give me yours, because I love you. She stood there and listened to everything he said, her mind swirling with one thought. Why is it that whenever you say, I love you, my first feeling is always fear? But at this moment, I suddenly have a thought, the one who has been trembling with fear all this time isn't me, it's you, you've replaced me in everything. Is that right, Willem? Seeing them cuddling, Cynthia felt like falling into a pit of despair. Seeing the man she loved holding another woman in his arms, compared to the disgusting touch he laid on her, June Cynthia felt strangely. The man she bitterly hated turned out to be the lifeline that helped her survive while the man she longed for day and night turned out to be the deadly trap set up. Oh, don't misunderstand, I never loved you. I just used you, the guy said to June Cynthia, as if telling her with his whole body, die alone in that cold prison. After a long delusion, she caught sight of the spear standing in the corner. Willem, all right, look over here, she continued, coldly. Because you don't understand, that's why. True love is hard to recognize, so I'll teach you how to recognize it, even when you yourself don't know. Hearing her words, Willem jolted and turned around, only to see June Cynthia holding the spear, aiming it at his heart. Her mouth remained cold, her eyes wild, it's losing the one you love, and I hope you'll suffer to the extreme. Rennie quickly shouted, wait, princess consort. Don't. She yelled, I don't mean to harm myself with my death. I will kill the man who doesn't know that you love me, the man who doesn't know my sincere heart. Rennie kept trying to stop her, Princess Consort, stop. Cynthia laughed madly, tears streaming down her face, Willem, remember me for the rest of your life. Cynthia Canaria is your destiny. Seeing the gruesome scene before him, a soldier left a surprising comment, is she going to end her own life like this? Willem replied, so much the better. Prepare the antidote. I understand now. Both of you, please go back first. Willem spoke, turning back to see her sitting slumped on the floor. As Rennie's voice rang out, she flinched slightly. Sorry, I'll come back, he said softly, lifting her into his arms, and gently comforting her, this filthy place isn't suitable for you. His voice made her feel like she was being mesmerized by a demon. Exiting the secret dungeon, Willem brought out a basin of water to wash her feet. As he tenderly cared for her feet, he whispered, I know you want to rest, but we can't yet. There's one more thing left to do. Rennie repeated, trembling, one more thing left to do? The cold sweat made her already chilled body even more frozen with horror. Although I wanted the servant girl to boil some hot water, the situation doesn't allow for it because I think using warm water right now would only make things worse. Rennie thought of June Cynthia's horrifying scene earlier and felt scared of the man in front of her. She wondered what even more dreadful thing he intended to show her. But Willem just left with an innocent smile, heading towards the soldiers discussing something. Good. Have you brought that thing? A soldier replied obediently, everything is ready as you requested. Willem simply said, all right, prepare to go. Hearing this, Rennie's face turned pale. Wait, Willem. What do you mean by prepare? What is it? She shouted in anger, are you planning something behind my back again? Speak up, I have limits too, I can't take it anymore. Willem calmly replied, we have to finish your revenge. Rennie puzzled, revenge? You mean Michael Allen? He's already dead. Willem still maintained his cheerful demeanor in the face of her twisted questions. I just learned that the princess consort killed him. What are you planning to do now? As he spoke, the footsteps of the soldiers blocked her throat. As soon as she saw the coffin, Rennie recognized it. Before her mind could comprehend, Willem apologized, I'm sorry. I was planning to let him beg for mercy in front of you. I was planning to prolong his life. I was planning to show you his trembling and screaming like that woman, 
but there isn't much time. He hugged her tightly and whispered, look, imagine the queen's reaction when she sees her stolen son's body. She softly called Willem's name as she saw the villain resting peacefully before her. Yes, Rennie, Willem helped her grasp the Reflin family sword and aimed it straight at the man, even if it's revenge like this, I hope you'll be satisfied. Michael may be dead, but he looks as if he's in a deep sleep. After a moment of silence, Rennie smirked and looked at him excitedly, Rennie Reflin, you impertinent brat. If you don't like that, then hand over the neck of his, Michael Allen. I have to feed it to the dogs to relieve this resentment. How dare you? Rennie Reflin. Every fragment of memory about Michael, when he was being stabbed by her, rushed back. He had gone mad, but how calm his face was now. Ah. Royal physician, quickly grab her. Do you dare to stab me? Rennie Reflin pointed the sword at him and laughed lightly, her laughter echoing throughout the room as she looked at the wretch, Willem, for the first time in my life, I find it amusing. How? Michael Allen, the vile fool. After all his arrogance, in the end, this is his fate. How sudden the situation has changed. You fool, you broke off our engagement just to die like this? Why? You pushed my father into the war, drove me to a cold snowy mountain, didn't you? Rennie continued to laugh wildly, Queen, you played with my father's pawn, and now your son's body is in my hands. I'm wondering what to do to retaliate. Should I behead him or dismember him? Should I send his head to that woman so she spends her life searching for the rest of his body? No, maybe I should send the headless body so she remembers her son's beautiful face forever. Rennie choked back tears, suddenly remembering the beautiful memories with Michael. From now on, you are my wife, so hold my hand and come with me. Give me your hand. Michael used to be such a gentle child. Thinking of this, she couldn't bring herself to harm him anymore, to dip her hands into this dirty blood. Willem exclaimed, you are truly compassionate. She turned away, I know, Willem, please bury that coffin somewhere unknown. Rennie, hold on, he pulled her hand back, I heard that Duke Reflin passed away after falling from his horse, didn't he? So what, she asked, surprised. He was an invincible general. Do you think he really died from falling off his horse? Rennie suddenly hesitated, what do you mean? Willem revealed, in my previous life as Michael Allen's aide, one day when he was drunk, he boasted about all his accomplishments. It's true. When Allen's blood always urged me to move forward, so I took care of that old man. I'm the prince of this kingdom. How dare he interfere in my affairs? You're wondering how I got rid of Duke Reflin, aren't you? Willem held her tightly and recounted the details of what he had said. Rennie's madness began to flare up. Do it, fulfill your long-awaited wish. If stabbing that wretch's leg could make you forget, then I've done it long ago. Do it, seek true revenge. Rennie rushed forward and plunged the cold blade straight into the prince's body. She screamed his name in a frenzy. Michael Allen. Revenge has been sought so many times, the revenge I've always longed for has helped me live, helped me endure. Revenge. Outside, the sun had risen, and Rennie's body was covered in the filth and grime of her enemies. Willem gently handed her a handkerchief and urged her to rest, but Rennie suddenly rushed to him and left the sword behind. Rennie passionately kissed him. Rennie, I'm very happy, but first, let's deal with the wound on your hand. Before he could finish his sentence, she kissed him again passionately. Despite Rennie's filthy appearance, he didn't hesitate to reciprocate her fervor. Suddenly, Rennie let him go, and then bit his lip. Don't resist anymore, just hold me, quickly. If you hesitate, I won't forgive you. Willem blushed and furrowed his brow, then pushed her onto the bed. Rennie, you can't escape anymore. Michael, my enemy. I will use my torn hands to embrace my love, Rennie thought to herself. The coffin lying there had completely disappeared from her mind. Come on, choose. Will you accept my deal or stay with me as you have always been? I will show you greater trust in anything I do, Rennie. He took back control, and thus, the agreement was fulfilled. 
they spent the whole afternoon wrapped in each other's arms. In his heart, Rennie knew that the queen had openly arrested June Sinia for the crime of killing her son without evidence. So, she also had to take responsibility for his death. I think about the queen, she really paid too much for revenge. I'm sorry, Willem suddenly blushed, for that, because I spoke of love with another woman. Rennie sighed, it's okay, thanks to that, I was able to kill Michael, as I desired. But Willem still cared about it, I apologize for letting him die at someone else's hands. She turned to Willem, if you feel sorry for that, then tell me about your past life. Tell me things I don't know. Willem happily looked at his daughter. Really? It's a long story, you won't get bored, promise. I began to recount memories. And that's why that night Willem urged the woman, Sinia, to speak up. Gilia, please turn away for a moment. Yes. As the lady-in-waiting departed, she hesitantly said to Willem, I truly appreciate your meeting with me, even though I called for you so abruptly. She held up the gloves he had left behind that day and timidly said, I want to return these to you, Willem. He reached out to take the item from her hand, but suddenly pulled her closer to him, mesmerized and strong. Let me go, she whispered softly. However, June Sinia had no intention of pushing Willem away. Her cheeks flushed like ripe tomatoes. Why did you really come just to return the gloves and end up in this moonless garden, adorned and sparkling with jewelry? She barely had time to think, oh, he knows everything. Jun Sinia blushed, that, intense desire welling up within her, oh, no, I can't hold back anymore. She looked up demanding, kiss me. One day, a secret meeting in the palace gardens, was held to celebrate. Here, Jun Sinia immediately whispered her love to Willem, and from then on, they secretly rendezvoused throughout the palace. But today she heard that Willem had tortured the assassins in the warehouse, for attempting to murder Count Reflin. She wondered what he had done, but the servants there had been sick for days. Sinia glanced at him and thought silently, how could such an elegant man commit such cruel acts? She asked, will you attend the prayer ceremony tomorrow? Willem gently replied, my master is going, so I must attend too. She turned and without hesitation, laid her head on his sturdy arm. Willem immediately frowned and abruptly sat up, why? Willem replied straightforwardly, how could a prince consort, like you lie, beside a lowly person like me? Sinia was puzzled, lowly? You're my lover. Willem chuckled faintly, can you really say that? When did we become lovers? Sinia blushed, what? When did we become lovers? Willem said seriously, it's common for noble women, to toy with knights. Moreover, you're married to the prince consort, you can't have serious feelings, for a bastard like me. Sinia subtly speculated, is there any truth to that? Is this man feeling inferior about himself? She replied softly, don't think like that. I truly care for you. No, I know you only find joy when Alan's blood is kneeling at your feet. Just as the Emperor's bastard appears before you, even as a lowly knight, no matter how much you jest, it's not a problem. So it's easy to approach me. He didn't finish his sentence, his eyes suddenly froze, his superb acting completely different from when he was with Rennie. She had leaned away and hugged his arm at some point. Her action reminded him of old memories. His heart pounded like a drum, his breath caught as he drowned in the sight, swoosh. Jalcinia foolishly grabbed the hand he had pushed away. Seeing herself acting out of line, Willem quickly apologized with a disgusted face. It's okay, come here, she said and pulled him back but my desire for you to kneel before me is true, she indulged in infatuation, because I want you to cling to me, and confess your love to me, and also. Willem interjected, you want to see me kneel before you and kiss your feet, don't you? June Sinia was shocked, how, how do you know? She hesitantly replied, yes, that's true, I really want that. Willem decisively pushed her hand away, and June Sinia screamed, no, don't, don't push me away. He snapped, saying, it seems like you have no intention of giving up that man, do you? June Sinia suddenly hesitated, that man? Remembering Willem's self-conscious demeanor, she thought to herself, is he talking about Michael? I am the prince consort, so you shouldn't speak like that knowing my position. I still have the principality of Canaria, and you have your own master. She thought to herself, this man risked his life to save his master, not long ago. I wonder if the rumors about him sleeping with her are true. She said, if I chose you, instead of the prince consort, would you have chosen me? 
Willem scorned, at my position, could I even choose you? She gripped her trembling hand tightly, I have always been the one asking you to kiss me. Willem's gentle voice rose, I am also a knight who cannot refuse that request. Junsinia, have you ever imagined us standing before the gods, you embraced by my arms, walking under the sun? She hesitantly replied, what are you saying? I can accept anything, so stop avoiding it. Although our love in this life is doomed, I hope we will meet again and love each other in the next life. Willem chuckled softly, you know, Junsinia, I have lived a life before, and in that life, I was your prisoner. She laughed, that sounds cute, but it's not effective. Now I'm very jealous of Countess Reflin, because she has you, Willem. She replied coldly. You have taken many things from her too, don't deny it, he said. It's not because I want to take them, I only want you, she retorted. Willem turned back, so what? If you want it, you have to take it, just wait and see. That night, a night so secret that even the moon didn't know, Sinia didn't truly understand the significance of that statement. However, at the morning prayer ceremony the next day, as June Sinia walked and pondered about the events of the previous night, she finally understood its significance. Rennie said that the bastard would take the knight's oath, she thought. Ha! Huh. So that finally came to light, didn't it? Didn't I say it before? The throne belongs to Michael, the queen mother had said, and Sinia couldn't believe her ears. If you want it, then you have to take it. The true meaning of those words was that Willem would take the knight's oath. The playful laughter of the queen mother and her son still echoed in Sinia's ears, they were happy that finally Willem and Laden's high lord had submitted to them. Moreover, Willem was the most skilled knight, gaining attention from the empire, but taking the knight's oath meant that even if the master died from an unexpected accident, the knight would be responsible for the master's family. This meant that if the master's wife was left alone after the master's death, the knight would have to marry her and take responsibility for her. Sinia recalled Willem's expression when he uttered those words, if you want it, then you have to take it. June Sinia widened her eyes, gazing intensely at her husband, Michael. A cruel thought flashed through her mind. After removing the bandages and looking at herself in the mirror, Rennie couldn't help but feel anxious as the wound still looked frightening. She touched the face-covering veil and wondered if she should leave it off for today's prayer session. After thinking for a while, Rennie decided to leave the veil on the dressing table and left the room. In the hallway, Willem was guiding her while kindly asking, You don't look well, my lady. Are you feeling unwell? Rennie replied that she was tired and couldn't sleep. So? But you still look beautiful, Willem joked. Rennie responded indifferently, Are you kidding me? Can't you see this long scar? Willem replied cheerfully, How can such a small scar diminish your beauty? He smiled. Okay, but you're about to take the oath. If you don't swear, you can't return the body. But Willem, what if the queen doesn't return the body after you take the oath? It sounds like I'll lose my beloved knight, Rennie suddenly stopped when she heard herself speak, noticing that Willem's face was now as red as a tomato. Rennie also realized that her previous words were somewhat embarrassing, so she blushed along with Willem. He took her hand, pleading, Ha, huh, say it again, please. What? What phrase? My beloved knight? Rennie reached up to touch his flushed cheek, gently tapped his forehead, and whispered, My beloved knight, Willem. Suddenly, Rennie was startled as the two of them seemed too close. She hesitated, but Willem suddenly embraced her tightly. Rennie appeared worried. This is the hallway, many people could see, she said, as his flushed face pressed against her bare shoulder. Hmm, just for a moment, just for a moment, I just want this moment, I'm so happy, Rennie rejoiced inwardly and also returned the hug, gently saying, all right, let me know when you feel better. At the grand religious assembly, Farhan Grancia remarked, it's been a long time since Laden's lord has been seen, and he warmly welcomed her. Seeing the friendliness between the two, the surrounding guests, couldn't help but whisper, looks quite intimate. But who knows these two are subtly plotting against each other. Reinhard Deflin. Suddenly, I remembered having heard that name from Michael's own mouth before. Don't mention that woman's name again. He had spat at me like that, with no information to find you, curiosity had only spurred me on more. I had secretly inquired about where you were, what you were doing, and what had happened to you. I tried to learn about you in every possible way. Withdraw troops? Do we really need to go to Hialka? The camp still has enough provisions, right? Wynne asserted firmly, no. My soldiers need rest. 
The knight replied, well, there's no other way, but doesn't the emperor hate the Hialka territory? Win reassured, it's fine, our army has already won. Until I met you face to face, I was very curious, you looked emaciated and hollow, unlike that painting. I wondered who had taken away your exquisite beauty, who had extinguished the sparkling stars in your eyes. So, does your loyalty deserve worthy recompense? How can a dog understand a command it receives, for the first time? So, I couldn't answer your question. The emperor was just using the right tool. So, what do you think about the discarded consort being used appropriately for the purpose? No. Humans are not tools. Wing Krona was despondent after that statement. It seemed like she was no longer an innocent girl with rosy cheeks, but a woman full of resentment and hatred. That wretch Michael didn't know that. She blushed embarrassedly. When, she's. He replied, I know she probably just wanted to vent all her anger on me. Because I'm Michael's dog. Rain felt extremely guilty, but he still spoke gently to her. Your words haunted my mind all night. I thought about you and didn't want to see anything else. Look up, hey, look at me. That voice sounded like you were talking to me. I see Michael nearby, avoiding me. I have to get revenge on that Michael. What will you do with a frail body like that? Unless you can regenerate to do that. Regenerate? Listen carefully, now if I could regenerate, I would stab that worthless Michael with the sword of justice. Wynne stood quietly outside the door and listened to the entire conversation. It was the first time, even though I had foolishly taken the lives of many enemies on the battlefield, that I had such thoughts. All right, well done, and I imagined little rain praising and patting the head of that dog. You understand everything now, let me see those sharp fangs. Now run over there, to where they are, quickly, obey my command. Wynne startled after that dream. Even after returning to the palace, he was haunted by Rennie's words. In my heart, there is a desire to become yours, but I am Michael's dog, it's too late to leave that master. One day, when went to find Michael to demand something, he was very surprised when I went to him and made a request. But Michael thought he was coveting his throne and shouted, I'll tear you apart until you die. That threat made Wynne flinch. He closed his book and continued, all property has its rightful owner. If you go against this truth, all you will see is bloodshed. One is to kill the rightful owner, two is to kill the one desiring that property. I couldn't understand the meaning of that statement and wanted to ask again, but there was no chance for me to do so. Emperor Michael Alesh forever. A knight pierced his tongue with a sword and uttered that. He went with Wynne on orders to punish the monsters at the northern border of the empire. Michael promised him Wynne's title, and Wynne was betrayed by him. And that's it, I had that premonition, but Rennie, do you know what I thought before I died? Rain was curious. What did you think? Is it that you wanted to kill Michael? Wynne hesitated, half right, half wrong. Rain's face became puzzled. So, what did you think? At this moment, the twilight faintly shone through the window, seemingly as warm as Willem's voice now, I remember you. And just one more time, if I could, I wanted to meet you again. If I were to be reborn, my greatest wish would be to become yours. And then, as if by magic, when I opened my eyes again, I didn't know I had just reincarnated. I had no memory. All I received from my past life was the scar on this eyebrow. Once again, I returned to the snowy-covered mountains and was a boy with a dirty and beastly appearance. And then, I met you, and my body automatically moved. Thank you for saving my life. Follow me to Laden. Rennie buried herself in his chest and cried uncontrollably, that's how it is, you've become my world. Rennie felt both sorrowful and touched, for me, Willem was like a sudden tsunami that swept me away. So, I felt terrified of a man like that. Rennie, he hugged her and comforted, I gathered all my courage to tell you this story, and yet you cry like this, I feel so sad. Rennie hesitated, but I can't bear it when your life is just being exploited like that. Not only that, in this life, I do things similar to what Michael does. Willem interrupted her, no, Rain, you are completely different from him, don't blame yourself. It's me who didn't spare any effort to come to you. Cheer up, Rennie, just like I feel happy to become your dog. Enjoy having me with you. In Rain's thoughts, she had a selfish thought that if Willem had memories of his past life, then mystery back, then might not have left like this. Rain, he looked straight into her eyes and asked hesitantly, did you just think about mystery? 
Resting against his chest, she replied, I'm sorry, Willem, I was thinking maybe my important friend might still be alive. Even now, I can't be completely happy. Willem gently responded, actually, I also often think about him. Really? Of course, he continued, sometimes, no, actually, almost every day, I question myself. If I could help Dmistry, if I knew in advance that he would be attacked unexpectedly, I could quickly run to support him. But, Rain, unfortunately, I regained all my past life memories after Dmistry's death. At that time, I felt very guilty. I apologize for everything I did wrong. In fact, Willem did not lie about often thinking about Dmistry, but his true emotions toward his mentor were different. Dmistry, the man Rain loved the most. I hate him, that man has everything I want, no matter how hostile he appears, he always stretches out his arms and pushes me away. Thinking of this, Willem shed tears and apologized for neglecting him to die like that. If I could go back, I would definitely not do that. Please forgive me. Rain hugged him tightly and exclaimed, Willem, she sealed his lips to prevent him from saying more hurtful words. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank you for telling me that story, but... Rain showed determination, no, Willem, it's not your fault, don't apologize. It's okay, I'm the one at fault for not knowing about it. Dmistry must have been a strong man, I don't think he would die like that. Remembering Farhan Granesha's admonition during the prayer ceremony, that a man who keeps secrets from his lover cannot be a good man, she felt that was not true. Willem didn't know anything. Willem, in my miserable life, there has been no such thing as love. But in this moment, how can I express it if it's not love? After two lifetimes, thank you for loving me, and I love you too. According to the announcement from the palace, the state funeral for the crown prince and crown princess would be held together, spanning three days and three nights. It was an unprecedented event in the history of the empire. At the funeral of her son, old Mrs. Key constantly muttered and cursed under her breath. She still couldn't believe that her son had died like that. Oh, the great lord of Leden is truly humorous. Seeing Rennie smiling so casually made her even more furious, as Rennie could dress up and make up to socialize with the nobles on her son's funeral day. That smile was like an insult to her son. He became furious, you, you mad woman. After uttering those words, she collapsed and fainted on the spot. Some time later, the great lord of Leden organized a fireworks display for Countess Johanna Snyder. On the surface, this performance was a congratulatory message for her giving birth to a child, but everyone knew it was a special occasion to commemorate Michael Alesh's death. Oh, what beautiful fireworks! Hey, Felix, why are you standing there dumbfounded? If you keep doing this, how can we finish repairing the wall quickly? Felix said, oh, I understand now. He stretched his shoulders and restarted his body, feeling down, old friend? Well, the stylish repairman is back. One day in the palace, Willem was clinging to Rennie because she was about to return to her territory and leave him in the capital. I've become the crown prince as you wanted. So, why don't you leave Leden and live here with me forever? Rennie exclaimed, Heavens, do you want me to be the subject of gossip? Willem retorted, I'll eliminate all the gossips about you. She sighed wearily, Your Royal Highness, are you talking nonsense now? Mark had appeared at some point. She hadn't expected herself to end up here under their orders, only to be treated like a pawn by these two. She heard that Mark was going to get married and hold the wedding ceremony in Leden, which made Willem feel a bit melancholic. To celebrate the wedding of the female guard who had always been by her side, Rennie sent her a gift from the Lord's Treasury, a white fox, fur. How can I accept such an expensive gift? Rain modestly replied, just accept it, you should also consider my reputation. So, what about the reputation of His Royal Highness? Willem interjected abruptly from behind, some Lord Reflin has been rejecting gifts from the Lord's estate for months now. Rain pushed him away and exclaimed, the gifts you gave have filled the warehouse, what more do you want? Please stop interfering. Willem felt extremely embarrassed to be pushed aside like that. Suddenly, he paused upon hearing Rain's words, Mark, if we go back to Leden, could you help me take care of Mystery's grave? Ah, Lord Mystery's grave? Mark responded with enthusiasm, leave it to me. Lord Mystery also saved my life, so it's my honor to take on this task. Rennie felt reassured upon hearing this. The two women continued to speak highly of Mystery, oblivious to Willem's jealous glances towards the Reflin family's greatsword mounted on the wall. 
Rain sighed, such a good person left without leaving anything behind, not even a tomb or any relics. Mark found it puzzling, really? Why is that? She was about to say something more but suddenly startled when she noticed Willem's expression, it was a chilling gaze that made her break into a cold sweat. She quickly bid farewell to her two masters, and hurriedly left with many questions swirling in her mind about the prince's attitude. When she returned to Laden's territory, it was already dark. It turned out that Mrs. Sarah was Mark's biological mother. Due to the remaining workload in the territory, she would have to quickly go to Orient to assist the financial manager, Hather, who was stationed there. Mrs. Sarah couldn't help but sigh, with so much work left in the territory, I wonder when the Lord will return here. She could only think to herself, perhaps he'll never return in this lifetime. Suddenly, she remembered something and asked her mother, Oh right, mother, were there no artifacts buried alongside Lord Mystery in his tomb? That's correct, his remains couldn't be found, and the entire camp collapsed, without any of his belongings recovered, replied Mrs. Sarah. Mark was surprised, how is that possible? As his direct subordinate, it's clear that his artifacts should have been transferred. Mrs. Sarah was equally surprised, what? How could that be? Mark recalled that due to her busy schedule, she had entrusted those items to someone else, give them to me. Mark said, ah, then I was just about to find you, thank you for taking on this task. She then handed the artifacts to that person, none other than Willem. She began to feel a sense of unease, she hadn't made a mistake. Clearly, she had found Mystery's artifacts, but they hadn't been buried alongside his coffin. Willem had taken them away, but why? Why hide them? Mark, her mother's voice snapped her back to reality, nothing's wrong. You must be mistaken. Mrs. Sarah sighed, it's been a long time, perhaps that's how it is. The conversation ended as her mother led her away, to attend to other tasks, but Mark still felt unsettled. That's right, I shouldn't speak out of turn. Willem loves the Lord, he would want to give those items to him as soon as possible, rather than anyone else. Mark closed her eyes, calming herself, yes, I should wait until everything is certain. Meanwhile, in the palace, Rennie was holding the Reflin greatsword and thinking about mystery. When we talked about him earlier, it made me remember that day. Now looking at it, this piece of fabric is quite old. I wonder if embroidering over the worn-out parts would help. Willem took back the greatsword and replied, there's no need to do that, it's not old. It holds my memories. He placed the greatsword next to the bed and continued, it's not yet morning, you should get more rest. You're tired. For Rennie, these current days were peaceful and lacking nothing, clearly a state of utmost happiness. But why did she feel this unease? Early that morning, in the city of Leden, Hather rushed back, visibly exhausted. Mark couldn't help but be alarmed, what happened? Before he could finish, Hather gasped, I found him, in a small village called De Marine. I found Lord Mystery. Mark offered him a hot cup of tea to calm him down and recount the situation. I got lost in the snow-covered mountains and ended up in a small village called De Marine. The village chief took care of me for three days and was very friendly. He invited me to join them in the cellar for some rabbit meat, and we enjoyed it with the villagers. I was surprised to learn that the rabbit hunter was a girl named Rioni. It said she even bravely fought off the barbarians. In fact, her current husband was rescued by her from the barbarians and brought back home. Ah. Village chief. A hearty call from a young man caught Hather's attention. Ah, Felix. The village chief responded cheerfully. When he appeared, Hather admired, wow, who is that big guy? Seeing Felix standing there dumbfounded, the village chief nudged him and loudly exclaimed, do something, Felix. Quickly greet him, the Lord has sent this person to our village of De Marine. Ah, I see, he replied politely, bowing. I am Felix. Seeing the imposing figure of the man standing so close, Hather nervously returned the greeting. Suddenly, a petite and cheerful girl ran up and embraced Felix. Why did you just come back now? she exclaimed, then turned to greet the village chief and the guest. Hather was greatly surprised, he had imagined Rioni to be a strong and powerful woman, not a tiny girl like a squirrel, yet she had rescued such a big guy from the barbarians. Thinking about it, he felt something very strange. How could a wealthy lord let such an outstanding soldier roam freely in a village like this? Hather voiced his suspicion, Felix, where do you come from? Hather's direct question prompted Felix's response, actually, I don't know anymore. Rioni added, Felix has amnesia, 
he suffered a head injury and lost all his memories before meeting me. Upon hearing this, Hather felt as if divine providence had intervened. He sternly replied, such blatant lies are hard to accept. I must record that he's a new conscript. Rioni exclaimed, what? He's not like that at all. She quickly pulled out an item from Felix's person. Look at this, he had this on him since I rescued him. It was a necklace that I had seen my father pick up. A necklace like this, made of silver, was only worn by members of noble families. Despite being unconscious and being taken away by the barbarians, he still kept it. Is he really a conscript? That doesn't make any sense. As Hathor examined the necklace closely, his whole body trembled. The name on it wasn't Felix, it was Dmistry, the second son of a noble family, also the first knight of Lady Rennie Reflin. Hearing this, Mark was utterly shocked. Unbelievable. Lord Dmistry is still alive. It's certainly good news, but I'm worried because I fear that Lord Willem will find out. Rain dressed extravagantly and adorned herself with lavish makeup to attend the New Year's party hosted by Willem, but today he seemed a bit different. Rennie nudged him, asking, Is something bothering you? You look unusually quiet, it's making me pay attention. Willem blushed and replied, I hate those noble lords, taking this opportunity, to kiss your hand. So, I got jealous, seeing you so beautiful makes my heart race. I feel annoyed by those who covet your beauty, so. Rain playfully patted his buttocks, Oh, come on, your highness, are you jealous again? Willem blushed even more, embarrassed, by her teasing. At the party hall, Rennie welcomed many noble guests, while he only had eyes for her. In the hallway outside, Rennie sighed as Cicero's lord deliberately implied to her that being with a handsome young man like Willem wouldn't be as good as being with a mature and steady man like him. Upon hearing her sigh, Willem firmly declared that he would erase that lordship from the kingdom's map, then passionately kissed her. Under the moonlight, he softly spoke, Rennie, today you look so beautiful and radiant. Do you still think our love will fade one day? In past lives, I felt despair every day, not knowing when this hardship would end, but now I am too happy. Every time I close my eyes, I look forward to tomorrow, and every time I open them, I am overwhelmed with joy when I touch you. Please believe me, Rennie. When the New Year's party ends, you will return to Leden, right? But, Rennie, you are the only presence that brings color to my life. If you leave me, I will return to those days of despair. So, Rennie, if you leave me, it will undoubtedly be, because one of us has parted from this life. Please stay by my side and become my eternal happiness. I will love you forever. Amidst the fireworks bursting with colors, his voice rang out, Will you agree to marry me? Rain noticed the ring, it was the one Willem had been wearing, since the day he first met her, the pain of past lives, and the hope of this one. That ring has reminded me that all of this is not deception. I hope you will accept this ring, and you, my dear, have given me hope and a second chance at life. But Rain had made up her mind long ago. Willem, I cannot do this, she said firmly. She closed the ring box. If I marry you, I will become Reinhard Delphina Alesh, and my territory will belong to the Alesh royal family. So, will everything we've worked hard for be taken away from us again? Willem stammered, Rennie, the Alesh royal family, will soon become mine. That means Alan will belong to you. Rain retorted, and what if you abandon me? He exclaimed, I will never do that. She bluntly stated, no, I will not marry anyone. Our revenge is over, now you have to live your life. But suddenly, Rennie leaned forward and kissed him. Stop feeling uneasy, Willem. Even if we don't marry, you know my heart will always belong to you. I truly love you. Hearing these sweet words, Willem felt immensely happy. All right, Rennie, I understand now. Suddenly, there was a cry in the palace hall, you say you understand, Willem? He carried her in his arms all the way from the corridor, to here. How many people had seen this scene already? Calm down, Rain, look over there. Hmm, a portrait of a beautiful woman appeared on the wall, the first emperor's portrait, right? She immediately called out the name Amaris Allen. I just noticed how similar his ring is to yours, Willem. Rain was shocked, could that be your ring? Willem confirmed that it was Amaris Allen's ring. She asked how he got it, as even the royal family didn't have it. If I tell you how I got it, will you agree to marry me? Willem pushed Rennie against the wall and held her hands tightly. His expression seemed to say, when I was gentle, you refused. 
Now, with force like this, will you accept me? No. Rain's calm response rendered him three parts helpless and seven parts lost. Then there's no other way. He threw the ring away without hesitation. Willem, what are you doing? He gently kissed her forehead and replied, if you won't accept it, then it's just a useless piece of metal. This is also something that cannot shine again. Everything he did was for her, even if it meant becoming a jester wearing a crown on the golden throne. He accepted it all. If there's anything I can't do, it's following an order to leave you. So you must never say such things, he said as he gently lifted her again. Rennie felt ashamed knowing his intentions, especially in such an easily discovered and chilly place, like this hallway. But Willem didn't hesitate to embrace her. I'm not cold at all. I've climbed Brain Mountain before, he reassured her. As the New Year's party came to an end, rain poured outside. Willem lay on the bed, reminiscing about the beautiful memories with her. There was amorous Alesh's ring. If I tell you the reason I have it, will you agree to marry me? This is also something that cannot shine again. I've climbed Prime Mountain before. Suddenly, thunder roared, accompanied by bright lightning that made Rennie's face look even colder. Willem realized someone was nearby. Rennie, he called softly when he saw her holding the Reflin family sword, and then suddenly Rennie dropped the piece of fabric where Willem was standing. It wasn't just one, but two separate pieces. Despite the heavy rain outside, Rain's voice was as icy as an iceberg. Explain why there's only one piece of fabric that I tore for you. Willem, terrified, exclaimed, Rennie, please, wait. She interrupted, thinking of mystery, but why does your sword have two pieces of fabric? Returning to that day, Willem had said, give it to me. No. Well, then I was just about to go find you. Thank you for taking care of this, Sir Willem, Mark recounted, this is your mystery's relic. I searched the battlefield up and down to find it. I thought I should return it to you, because Dmistry is your mentor. Willem just stood there quietly, reminiscing about his memories with that man. This fool eats too much. With such eating habits, how could he grow as tall as me? Get up quickly, you're so weak, how could you protect our lord? When will you finally defeat me? Willem turned away and left, but not without leaving a remark, so I'll go to our lord. He whisked past Mark like a gust of wind, so she couldn't see his smile. Willem clenched his mouth shut, to suppress the urge to laugh, muttering to himself, damn fool. If you're going to die like this, don't pretend to be high and mighty. Back to reality, Rain was losing her calm and demanded he explain everything. His tomb, not to mention his remains, not even a relic. You've been by my side and know how much I've suffered, she said. Willem sweated profusely, it's because I missed the opportunity to tell you. She angrily shouted, don't lie. Over the past period, we've been through so much together. You had plenty of time to tell me about it. We even talked about mystery recently. Why? Rain screamed as if betrayed, why didn't you say it then? Were you planning something behind my back? Willem collapsed to the floor in pain, pleading, it's not true, Rennie, please listen to me. I'll explain everything, please believe me. Then make me believe, she said, sitting down and looking straight into his eyes. Make me trust you, please. Tears streaming down her face, Rain softened her gaze, and Willem began his explanation. Back then, after the war ended and we returned to Leden, I remembered how much you suffered. You stopped eating and drinking and became more withdrawn. I thought your sorrow might kill you. If I gave you that piece of fabric while you were sad, I feared you would feel even more pain whenever you remembered the mystery. You were already suffering enough, and I feared you would break down completely. How could I? Rennie interrupted, implying that Willem didn't trust her. Willem, in pain, replied loudly, No. I meant to tell you. You may not believe me, but I've always agonized over when to say it. I kept delaying it until now. Willem, as I said, we've had plenty of opportunities to tell each other things during this time, she yelled. Rennie, I'm scared. You have so many people around you, but I... Willem trembled at the thought of himself. I only have you. If you're serious with me like this, even a little, I'm terrified. I'm afraid of being left alone, I'm afraid you'll leave me. That's why I did what I did. I'm truly, truly sorry. Seeing Willem's fear and remorse, Rennie's anger began to subside, but she still couldn't fully trust him. Willem, are you hiding something else from me? If so, tell me now. I don't want to go through this again. 
Her trembling hand indicated her pain. My chest feels empty now, so please, tell me. Willem's golden eyes, like sunlight, looked at her with long tears. Are you hiding something else from me? Crash. Thunder echoed through the sky. In the pouring rain, Willem widened his eyes, to the fullest extent. In the silence between them, his eyes began to flicker, his eyebrows furrowed, as if struggling. Another thunderous sound erupted just as he was about to answer her question. Actually, I. I mean, I. Willem pursed his lips, trying to organize his thoughts and recount. You, you thought your second life was granted by Duke Reflin, right? But that's not true. Recalling the moment when he was betrayed by Michael's knight, he didn't die then, but survived, and climbed Prime Mountain. There, he met a giant creature that could speak to humans. Emerus's child, kill me, and if you do, I will grant you the remainder of my lifespan in another life, not just yours, but also the person you long for. Willem gently spoke, your second life was granted by me. In vague memories under the cold of the blizzard, Willem thought he had to live. He crawled with his battered body, hoping to meet her one more time. I must live, even if I die in front of her. Let me see rain one more time. After struggling to drag his heavy body, he encountered a dragon. The dragon said it smelled my blood, waking it up. My blood scent? Yes, it said my blood smelled like the woman it longed for. The dragon roared in pain. My love, my amorous Alesh, betrayed me. Before leaving, you promised to return to me after living nine lifetimes. But after all this time, the one who came to me was your descendant. The dragon shed tears as it gazed at him. Kill me, and I might die with you, but you can never return to me. So kill me where your blood falls. Kill me where your scent remains. If you kill me, I will grant you the remainder of my lifespan so that you can live another life, to meet the one you long for again. Willem bowed his head and continued, I slashed the chest scale that the dragon exposed, and in an instant, its skin and organs were burned and disappeared. All that remained was a sparkling golden ring, beckoning to me. After grabbing that ring, I lost consciousness, and when I woke up again, I was back as an orphan boy in the snowy mountains. Rennie, I always touch your face every night, and with a wretch like me inside you, I wonder if this is a dream, if I'm still slowly dying on Prime Mountain and seeing illusions. I always tell myself, here, tears began to flow from his eyes. I would rather not end revenge so quickly. Rain was surprised. Why not? Willem continued, it would have been better to continue seeking revenge, at least if Michael were still alive, I could be more useful to you. Willem clutched his head and cried out, now I have nothing more to give you. I've given you everything I have, even my heart and soul. But now you're telling me to leave, to live my own life? Rain intended to say something but became confused when she saw Willem's pain. This man was so cunning and deceptive. She softened her voice. How can I blame you? This life, this existence, all given to me by you. How can I be angry with you? Seeing her anger subside, Willem continued to kneel and apologize. I was wrong, I truly apologize to you, he whispered, rubbing his head against her leg. I've been too arrogant. Rain spoke softly, Willem, never, ever lie to me again. You know that. If you do it again, I'll truly leave you. Willem leaned into her, pleading, I won't do it again. Please don't leave me. Since when did the rain stop falling? It seemed like Rennie's anger had dissipated by now. So I paid for my revenge by dedicating myself to you, but now, I owe you one more favor. If you want something else from me, then I must give you something in return. Willem, speak whatever you want, and I'll grant it to you. But except for asking for my forgiveness for lying. Willem hesitated, unable to decide, so he saved it for later. That night, like when they were children, he held Rennie's hand all night. The next morning, Rain left him a letter saying, I'll be in Glenna for a while. At the Glenna domain, the young lord of the Glenna clan recounted the story of Willem's first battle to her. Clearly, it was his first military expedition but he acted as if he knew the enemy's every move. Rain unconsciously grasped her hand, recalling what Willem had said. She remembered all the memories, after Dmistry's death, when she bluntly asked, has Willem changed since his first battle? No, Farhan's answer made her hand twitch slightly. During his first battle, I was also there. But he was clumsy, and very frightened at first. But after a few bloodshed, his eyes changed. Looking back, it's really strange. 
Although there were no signs that the Manrock clan would ambush us, he came up with brilliant tactics and plans for the attack. It's hard to explain if we just say he's an excellent tactician, as if he had experienced many battles before. That's why Mystery was also surprised. Rain bit her lip, suppressing the tumultuous emotions in her heart, remembering what he had said then, if only I could help Mystery, if only I knew in advance that we would be ambushed, I could quickly run to support him. More lies, you knew already, that on that day, the Manrock clan would ambush us, but you didn't tell anyone, so Mystery. Thinking about this, Rain's entire body couldn't bear it anymore, and she collapsed. I can't take it anymore. Willem, you deceived me, Willem, you deliberately harmed Mystery, I can't take it. After that shock, Rennie stayed at the Glenna Castle to recuperate. She had fainted yesterday, so Faha took her to rest in the largest room in the castle. Rain felt a bit embarrassed. Thank you, I've been rude. Farhan sighed, who needs to be polite or impolite when they're fainted. Anyway, what are you going to do now? Are you going back to the capital? His Royal Highness is probably waiting for you there. Rain became hesitant. I don't know anymore. First, I'll return to Laden. I've been away from my territory for too long. Farhan continued, so please wait a moment. We have a guest. I'm sure it's the person you most want to meet right now. Sitting in the living room, Rain couldn't help but wonder who this guest could be. At the moment, she didn't want to meet anyone. After a while, the financial manager, Hather, entered. Since you're here in Glenna, I brought a guest for you to meet. He's just arrived, so I told him to come in. Rain sighed, thinking it was probably some minor lord wanting to merge into Laden's territory. She reluctantly said, let him in, then, and prepare a horse carriage for him. But she was very surprised when the person who entered was not some minor lord, but a very familiar figure. Though he was dressed slightly differently, she couldn't forget that face. Rain silently reassured herself that it couldn't just be someone who resembled him. She must be mistaken. Hather introduced him as the Huntress Rioni and Mr. Mystery. Rain's eyes widened in disbelief. What? What did you say? Felix, feeling a bit awkward about his initial greeting, asked for permission to greet again. He knelt down and introduced himself, It's an honor to meet you, Lord. Please forgive my rudeness. The shadow of mystery from that day with this man in front of her, Rain still couldn't believe he was her close friend and urged Hather to explain. Yes, Lord. I will explain everything. While Rioni was hunting in the snowy mountains as usual, she encountered the Manrock clan, dragging a hostage. Without hesitation, she bravely rescued him. The man was severely injured in the head area, so Rioni took great care of him. Unfortunately, he lost his memory. Lord Mystery has forgotten everything before being abducted by the enemy. Now they are living together as husband and wife in a small village called Delmarine. Sitting on the sofa, Rioni kept apologizing to the Lord, I, I didn't know anything. I really didn't know, I didn't intend to seduce the knight. Rain smiled gently, you're Rioni, right? Then she burst into laughter, thank you for saving my precious night. That's right, mystery. Even though you may not remember anything now, you are the proud knight of our clan. You are also my escort. I'm thinking of making you my knight again. Hearing Rain's words, Felix briefly startled, while Rioni thought their relationship might break from this point on because she was just a commoner. But Rain's next words surprised her greatly. As for you, Rioni, I want you to serve me as a lady-in-waiting. If you become a lady-in-waiting, you will move with Demystery and have the opportunity to develop your hunting talents. What do you think? The couple hugged each other in happiness upon hearing this. After meeting with Demystery, Rioni only felt tired and didn't want to meet anyone. Farhan, knowing her mood was very bad, could only leave her alone in silence. How should I describe the emotions at this moment? Betraying happiness, sorrow? The joy of reunion or the agony of loneliness? Suddenly, Rain felt discomfort rolling up from her stomach. She covered her mouth, her face turning pale, her throat as if something was about to come out. When Rain couldn't be sure of anything, her body underwent a transformation. So Rennie had reunited with her childhood friend and had a life partner when he lost his memory. What would happen to her relationship with Willem when he constantly told lies from time to time, 